Welcome. If you can, try to make your way into your seats. We're about to begin the first session this morning, so if you could find your way to your seats. I want to uh, extend a warm welcome to all of you again this morning. Uh, many of you were probably with us yesterday, but uh, welcome again. And then for those of you who are just coming in for today's sessions, uh, we, we extend a special welcome to you. We're grateful to the Lord for all that he's done in bringing together uh, this group of men, this group of speakers, and all of you as well. So this is an answer to our prayers and, uh, and much, uh, much planning. I wanna make a couple of announcements. Most of these things are actually in the program already, but I wanna draw your attention to them. First of all, later this afternoon, there's a Q&A session, a panel uh, Q&A, and the way we're handling that this year uh, I think this was mentioned last night, I think Pat mentioned it last night, but the way we're handling it is you can submit your questions electronically. Now, if you still want to write them down, you can find one of us and we'll try to uh, enter them for you. But um, the easiest way is if you use the QR code, and that's just inside the back cover, and there's an opportunity there for you to just use that QR code to, to submit your questions. And, and as well, there's, conference feed, there's a conference feedback QR code to use at the end. A um, couple other things to mention on today's schedule. There is, um, at uh, around the lunch hour, there are a couple of, of special events happening. Um, there is an optional, uh, there's an optional session at 1 p.m. in here, so that's still during the lunch hour, but um, while lunch is happening there and people are finishing up, we'll come in here and uh, Pat Daly and I will uh, give just a little update about what the Lord's doing at the seminary, particularly with respect to our new library renovation. If you're on the email list, you've seen um, some things about this and we wanna just present it and, and, and give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have. And then at, at the same time, actually a little bit earlier, 12.30, there's a youth fellowship event. This is something that we have every year at the conference and it's always uh, a, a good time. This year it will be meeting down in I believe it's called the cave downstairs. Um, you go through the fellowship hall, there's an exit sign and there's a sign there pointing you downstairs to the cave. So the youth fellowship's at 12.30, the library presentation is at one. Um, one other thing I wanna mention and then two books to highlight before I hand it over to Dr. Pipa. Uh, we have a summer seminar every summer and uh, it functions in really two ways. First of all, it can be uh, utilized as a class, as an elective class by our students, but also we always open it up to uh, other members of the community, members of various presbyteries or, or friends whom we know. And this, this summer seminar this year is on expositional preaching, and we're welcoming David Strain, who's the pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Jackson, Mississippi. He just, he's just written a little book on expositional preaching, which I believe we have in the bookstore that's, uh, that's worth looking at. But if you're interested in that, again, just uh, inside the back of the program, there's a, a place for you to register for that seminar and the details are there and then there'll be even more details when you visit the webpage. One last thing that I wanted to do uh, is just to highlight a couple of books. It's, uh, it, it's been good to see, I walked through the bookstore this morning and a lot of the books that I was planning to highlight are already gone. So if you were hoping to get you know, the, the, the John G. Payton work, gone, you'll have to order that. Uh, but, uh, but, but there are some really good ones that I would commend to your attention. You may not have heard of them. Um, the, the first one I wanna uh, draw your attention to is Compel Them to Come In, which is a book that I, I personally found uh, very beneficial. Uh, it's, the subtitle is Calvinism and the Free Offer of the Gospel. So it's a little book about offering Christ freely uh, within the framework, of course, of our understanding of God's sovereignty. A very moving book, at least I, I was very moved by it, compelled them to come in. And then the other one is, this is a new book, it's biographical. You, we're gonna have some biographical addresses today. Um, this is a book about a, a lesser known figure in Scottish church history, but a, a, a very important one, John Cole Coon. Um, and it's, it, this, this is called Offering and Embracing Christ. And it's really dealing with the fact that Cole Coon is, uh, uh, thought very deeply and clearly and biblically about what it means to offer Jesus Christ to sinners and his ministry was centered around that. It's by a friend of mine, John Beagle. There's a foreword by 
Sinclair Ferguson as well. Well, those are the announcements that I have. Again, if you need anything from us today, uh, come and see anyone with a, there, there are staff lanyards that are orange, and so anyone who has one of those you can talk to. Any students would be glad to help you. I'm glad to help you as well. And again, welcome to day two of our conference, Modern Missions in the Reformed World. Well, it's my privilege to uh, begin this session by introducing uh, to you my dear friend, um, Dr. Ian Hamilton, and you get the basic facts about him in your book. Uh, but really, the most important fact about Ian Hamilton is his wife, Joanne. Um, we're very close friends. They spend a lot of time with us, and he'd never survive without her. So <laughs> he'll tell you that. But. Uh, also, what you don't get in a bio is really the heart of the man, and it's a heart for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a heart for people. I don't know anybody that spends the time keeping up with friends really around the world, uh, and he's just a real friend, and he knows how to be a friend, and it means a lot to us, and it's a privilege to uh, have him uh, here today to give this uh, lecture on William Charles Burns. Well, if you look on the, right on the session four, the right side of the page, how firm a foundation, let's stand and sing that and remain standing for prayer. And let me encourage you, I, this is the first year our corporate amen has been pitiful. All right, so I know the ceiling's there, but let's raise it some, okay?
Let us pray. O holy triune God, we give thanks to you this morning, for you indeed are great and glorious and altogether lovely. Lord, we love you, and we gather this day to worship you in singing and prayer and above all under uh, the lectures and the preaching of your word. For Lord, your word is upright, and all your work is done in faithfulness, and you love righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of your steadfast love. O oh Lord, by that word you made the heavens, and by the breath of your mouth all their host. You've gathered the waters of the sea as a heap, and you put the deeps in storehouses, so that all the earth will fear you, and all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of you. You spoke, Lord, you commanded, it stood fast. And Lord, you declare then that we, your church, are a blessed nation, for you are a people whom you have chosen for your heritage, and you've said to us that you are our God, and we are your sons and your daughters. And we thank you, Lord. As we gather this morning, we ask that you would pardon our iniquities, cause us to delight in you and in holiness. We pray, Lord, that you would grant your angels this day to watch over us, both physically and spiritually. You'll keep the evil ones, Lord, far from us. And we ask now, Lord, as Dr. Hamilton comes to speak about this great saint whom you use so wonderfully well in your church, that the Spirit, Lord, will move mightily in and through him and in us, Lord, and that we will continue to be motivated these days together to look unto the ends of the earth as the harvest of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. I'd like to begin by reading two brief verses from the Word of God, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, and Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And Romans 8, 29, familiar words, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. In the Bible, God himself tells us that he has two great purposes, a proximate purpose and an ultimate purpose purpose. His proximate purpose is to save and reconcile to himself judgment-deserving sinners, bring them into his kingdom, crown them with his blessing, make them his sons and daughters, and ultimately bring them into the glory of his nearer presence. That is God's proximate purpose. His ultimate purpose is the glory, the preeminence of his son, Jesus Christ. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And notice what follows, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. John Murray wonderfully and simply puts it like this, there is a final end that is more ultimate than the glorification of the people of God. It is that which is concerned with the preeminence of Jesus Christ. God's ultimate purpose in sending his son into the world, his ultimate purpose was not to save sinners from hell, but to make his son the firstborn among many brothers, to exalt him, to extol him, 
to give him cosmic preeminence over a multitude that no man can number so that he, the Lamb, would have all the glory in Emmanuel's land. And it was this ultimate gospel purpose that impassioned and motivated William Chalmers Burns to devote his life to evangelize the unreached people groups in Northeast China. I think I was 19 years of age. I'd always been a keen reader. I'd not long come to saving faith in Christ. I'd started to read good Christian books. And I stumbled across a little book published by the Banner of Truth Trust, Five Pioneer Missionaries. I think I'd heard of one of them. I had read by this time the diary of David Brainerd, Jonathan Edwards. The other four names I had never heard of. There was John Eliot, missionary to the Indians in the northern east part of the United States as it is now. John Eliot, there was Henry Martin, pioneer missionary to Persia. There was John Gibson Payton, we heard of him yesterday, missionary to the cannibals in the South Sea Islands, North uh, the New Hebrides. And there was William Chalmers Burns. I read the book avidly, but it was the chapter on Burns that captivated me. Right at the outset of the chapter, the writer tells us this. A missionary from China had come home to Scotland. He had been on the, the coastal plains of China where most of the foreigners resided. He had not ventured into the hinterland. And he spoke at a gospel meeting. And someone asked him at the end, in your travels in China, did you perchance meet a Scottish Presbyterian called William Chalmers Burns. And the man replied, meet him, all China knows him. He's the holiest man alive. I remember the impact those words had on me. All China knows him. He's the holiest man alive. He didn't say he was the greatest preacher he had ever heard. He didn't say he was renowned for his capacities and abilities. He's the holiest man alive. These words from William's diary, I think takes us to the very heart of what he was as a man, he wrote, the longing of my heart is to make known my glorious Redeemer to those who have never heard. So who was William Chalmers Burns? He was born in the year 1815. He was the son of a godly Presbyterian minister. He was born near the small town of Brechin, about 80 or so miles north of Edinburgh, if you know anything of the geography of Scotland, and if you don't, you should be embarrassed. <laughs> he was educated at Aberdeen Grammar School, and in 1829, at the age of 14, he entered Aberdeen University, where my wife studied, who truly is the better part of me. He was raised in a godly home, but in the words of his very close friend, Robert Murray McChain, he was a stranger to God and to grace. He was a good son, but he wasn't as yet a converted son. While he was in Edinburgh, he began to train as a lawyer. His sisters wrote to him, urging him, pleading with him, to seek Christ. 
Not long afterwards, he arrived home unexpectedly. His mother said, Oh, Willie, where have you come from? He had walked 36 miles to tell her, to tell her something. He said, Mama, what would you think if I should be a minister after all? He wrote in his diary, I felt that God in his own sovereignty had touched my heart, had drawn me to himself for his own glory. In one moment, my inmost soul was in one instant pierced as with a dart. God apprehended me. I felt, he said, the conviction of my lost estate rushing through me with resistless power. I retired to a bedroom there to pour out my heart for the first time with many tears in a genuine heart-rending cry for mercy. He was 16 at the time. I simply want to say before we hurry on, how the Lord brings you to himself is of little moment whether he brings you quietly or dramatically, whether he brings you slowly and imperceptibly, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that he brings you, that he apprehends you, that you know, I am my beloved's and he is mine. How we are converted is of little concern in the Word of God and throughout church history, actually. Detailing how the how of conversion is a relatively modern phenomenon. The Reformers and the Puritans were little interested in the how of conversion. They wanted to know two things. Are you converted? And does your life show that you are converted? Does your life show that God has apprehended you. From that moment, everything changed for William. He wrote in his diary, in the same instant almost, I felt that I must leave my present occupation. He was preparing to study law and devote myself to Jesus in the ministry of that glorious gospel by which I had been saved. Now, my friends, this is what genuine conversion produces. Not that you must leave your present occupation. That's not the point. But that you devote yourself unreservedly to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the base reality of conversion. Faith takes you into Christ, not only as justifying righteousness, but as sanctifying righteousness. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is to be unconditional Lord, Lord of all that we are, of all that we possess. And that's what Burns is saying here. He is saying, I had to devote myself to Jesus. And if we are not devoted to Jesus, it is doubtful if we are converted at all. On one occasion in his early life as a believer, he was walking through the streets of Glasgow. I can even picture in my mind the very street he was walking along. And his mother saw him at a little distance and was looking forward to the unexpected pleasure of greeting her son, and suddenly he disappears. And she wonders where he has gone, and, 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 and she walked towards where she last saw him and noticed that he had turned into a little alleyway. I can almost picture the alleyway. And she finds him breaking his heart weeping profusely. And she said, Willie, what ails you? And he said, oh, mama, 
Just now I was so overcome with the sight of the countless crowds of immortal beings eagerly hustling hither and thither, but all posting onwards towards the eternal world, that I could bear it no longer and turned in here to seek relief in quiet thought. I often think of those words, especially when Joan and I were in Cambridge. Cambridge is a mecca for uh, students from all over the world, one of the great university cities, and from about April to September, you go to the center of Cambridge, and it's just teeming, teeming. You can hardly move. And how often I've thought to myself, would you please just move and let me pass? Could you not just make a little a pathway for me to get through to where I want to go and very very often it was as if a voice from heaven said William Chalmers Burns this compassion for the lost was the dominating motif of William Chalmers Burns life. He longed to know God. He, he understood that effective service in the kingdom of God depended on knowing God, knowing God more deeply, more affectionately. It was a consuming passion of his to know God better. He wrote in his diary, O oh Lord, teach me to grow daily and hourly in the apprehension of thy unspeakable and sovereign love to me, a miserable sinner, that I may be constrained out of the abundance of an overflowing heart continually to commend thee to others who need that love as much as I and deserve it just as little. My friends, that is authentic biblical Christianity. That is pristine Calvinism. Deep, profound, affectional love to him who first loved you, and out of the overflow of that, out of the felt awareness of that, you become an aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and amongst those who are perishing. What impacts people is not simply that we speak truth to them, but truth that has been impregnated by the affectional wonder of sovereign grace and love captivating us, not just capturing the mind, but captivating the heart. So that even as we speak stumblingly, there is a certain je ne sais quoi, there's a certain aroma, a certain something that causes people to take note. Well, he graduates as a Master of Arts in 1834 at the age of 19. He starts divinity studies at Glasgow University, a good place to go. A brilliant student. He excelled in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. Well, he'd been studying Latin since the age of six. That's what you did in Scotland. Those were the days. And he was brilliant. He was a brilliant linguist. And he understood from those early days that preparation for ministry and for usefulness to God depended on two things. Number one, the training of heart and mind. Our Lord Jesus Christ was not excused the educative, maturative processes of learning. Remember in the, the, the third servant song in Isaiah, morning by morning he wakens my ear to hear. How did the Lord Jesus Christ know the scriptures so well? He went to the house of God on the day of God 
and he pondered the Word of God. He wasn't excused the maturative educative processes of learning. His humanity was a true humanity. And secondly, Burns understood there had to be experience in life training, not only mental equipping training, but heart and life and experience training, just as our Lord Jesus Christ had to undergo that kind of training. Remember what we read in, in Hebrews 5, isn't it? Verse 8, although he was a son, although he was a son, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. From the very outset of his Christian life, Burns never wavered in the conviction that he should give himself to overseas missionary work. His brother tells us in his massive biography, I thought I'd turn this off, my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. His brother, younger brother, Eileen Burns, tells us in his great biography, he solemnly, that is William solemnly and irrevocably dedicated himself to mission work. It was a conviction that God had ingenerated within him from the very moment he was converted. Now, I think that's somewhat unusual, I think. I believe in, in God's mercy. It was something he did for me, but I think it's relatively unusual. What matters ultimately is not that from the moment of your conversion, you have this definite conviction regarding what God is calling to you, calling you to do with your life. But you've laid your life on the altar and said, I'm not my own. Here am I. Use me. Well, Burns never wavered in his conviction that God had called him to mission work. But in, in two important respects, things turned out differently from what he anticipated. Number one, he originally thought he would go to India and follow Alexander Duff. But God sends him to China. And the other was that it was nine years before he would go to China. Nine years. Now, why was there such a delay? Well, there were several reasons why, but the most important reason was that Burns found himself in the midst of a remarkable spiritual awakening in his own native Scotland at a communion season in his father's own church in Kilsyth, God came down in such power that scores and scores and scores of people came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Meetings were prolonged. The communion season would have lasted till the Monday, but went on to the Tuesday, and I think even beyond the Tuesday, and hundreds wanted to hear the word of God. And everywhere Burns went, and I do mean everywhere he went, there was a touch of heaven on his ministry. I suppose if any of you know anything of William Chalmers Burns, you might know that Robert Murray McChain chose him to fill his pulpit in 1839, when Murray McChain and Andrew Bonner and another went to Palestine to inquire how the Presbyterian Church in Scotland could establish a gospel mission to the Jews. And to people's astonishment, McChain asked Burns if he would fill the pulpit. McChain was actually only two years older than William Chalmers Burns. But his ministry in Dundee had been so singularly owned of God 
that people were amazed that McChane should have asked this, this young, unknown divinity as yet student to come and fill the pulpit. But McChain had a premonition. Have you ever had a reformed premonition? <laughs> never put God in a box. Brothers and sisters, never put the sovereign Lord of the heavens and the earth in a box. McChain had a feeling that the ministry of William Chalmers Burns would be gloriously blessed of God. And it was. And for the next nine years or so, Burns labored as an itinerant evangelist in the north of England, Scotland, of course, in the north of England. He goes to Dublin in Ireland. He spends two years in Canada. And everywhere he goes, although he, ex he experiences um, opposition and hostility uh, in Newcastle, where Westminster Seminary is now, uh, people threw manure at him. People wrote vile graffiti about him on church walls. But wherever he went, the hand of God was upon him. And he felt constrained that as long as God's hand of remarkable blessing remained on him, he was honor bound to fulfill the responsibilities of an evangelist. But throughout those years of itinerant evangelism, his commitment to overseas mission never wavered for one moment. His brother wrote in his biography, he was still as much as ever a missionary at heart and only waited the intimation of the master's will as to the time and the place of his appointed work. And after nine years, the Presbyterian Church of England asked the church in Scotland, do you have anyone who might be willing to go to China? And Burns presented himself to the Presbyterian Church in England and said, here am I, send me. On the day of his ordination, he was asked the question, when might you be willing to go? And he said, tomorrow. Tomorrow. At that time, in Scotland, the middle decades of the 19th century, and in Princeton, middle decades in the United States, one third of seminary students went to the mission field. One in three, let me say that again, one in three went to the mission field. The Presbyterians were at the forefront of pioneer missionary endeavors. Well, he sets out for China. It takes six months for his ship to sail from England to Hong Kong. And on board, Burns begins the formidable task of learning the Chinese language. He understood, he understood this. If I cannot speak Chinese like a Chinese, I won't be taken seriously. He didn't go with a few phrases. He immersed himself. He had an English Bible. He had a Chinese Bible and a Chinese grammar. Now, he was a remarkably gifted linguist. He could communicate easily and fluently in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and he taught himself French and Scots Gaelic so he could preach in those languages. But he immersed himself day after day, hour after hour, throughout the six months voyage. And immediately he lands in China. He hears of three Chinese prisoners under sentence of death. I don't remember how he hears about them, but he goes to them. And almost daily he meets with them, reading with them Chinese Christian books, praying with them. An observer said he spoke Chinese, 
He wrote Chinese, he heard Chinese, he sang in Chinese, he prayed in Chinese. Lack of proficiency in the language to which God sends you is like sailing a boat without a sail. You might think you're being remarkably spiritual and spirit dependent. You're not, you're being foolish and stupid. <laughs> and Burns knew that his effectiveness as an evangelist for the cause of the kingdom of God required him to immerse himself in the Chinese language. And he did that. Now, up till this time in China, there were missionaries, but they were all on the, on the eastern seaboard. You were forbidden to go inland. There, there were state laws, and the British government even had laws that you could only evangelize <clears throat> along a narrow strip of land near the coast. But Burns had set his heart on reaching the as yet unreached places in inland China. And so in 1849, year and a half or so after he arrives in China, he leaves the security of the coastal mission stations to preach the gospel inland. He flouted the law of his own land because he believed he was under orders from a higher king and from a greater law. His early years, first seven years or so, were marked with great difficulty. They didn't see one convert in seven years. But in 1854, he was involved in a remarkable work of God in a place called Pekua, near Amoy, northeast China. A number of native congregations were formed. Now, Burns had this conviction, rightly or wrongly, you can judge yourselves, that God had called him to be an evangelist. He could say with Paul, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now, Paul did spend two decent times, didn't he, in, in Corinth and in Ephesus, but mainly Paul itinerated. And Burns believed that the best work he could do was to preach Christ, disciple men, equip them as best as he was able to do over, over a period of weeks, sometimes months, and see them raised up as leaders in congregations of baptized believers, and he would press on to another unreached area. From 1854 to 1868, Burns gave himself heart and soul to evangelizing the unreached peoples of Northeast India. He returned to Scotland once in 1854. He'd been away seven years. A close colleague in the ministry was seriously unwell and Burns agreed to accompany him back to Scotland. They arrived in Scotland and his friend died and Burns turned around and went back to China. He was home for one month in 21 years. His friends and family noticed that he looked much older and worn than when they had last seen him, but, but his eyes sparkled with joy. He was more loving and companionable, said one, less reserved and austere than before. And his brother Eiley, his younger brother Eiley wrote, he seemed less like John the Baptist and more like Jesus Christ. One of the significant moments in Burns' time in China was when he met Hudson Taylor, who founded the China Inland Mission, later the Overseas Missionary Fellowship. They spent around nine months together, 1855 into 56. Hudson Taylor, quote, found himself 
in the presence of a saint. And Hudson Taylor records that Burns impressed on him three great lessons that he never forgot and that he sought to implement in the work of the China Inland Mission. Number one, God has a glorious, if often mysterious purpose in permitting his, suf his servants to undergo suffering and frustration. He learned from Burns that suffering belongs natively to the Christian life and perhaps supremely to the Christian missionary. There is a costliness that cannot be avoided. Secondly, he learned from Burns that evangelism is the great work of the church, making known Jesus Christ. And thirdly, he learned from Burns the place of lay evangelists as a lost order in the church that scripture requires to be restored. That's how Burns understood those, those words in Ephesians 4. There is an order of evangelists that God equips and, and gifts and enables. And we've lost that. And Hudson Taylor took that to heart from Burns. But it was a two-way intercourse because it was Hudson Taylor's example of wearing Chinese dress and the long Chinese pigtail that, that persuaded Burns that if he was going to effectively be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, he needed not only to be able to communicate fluently and easily and relevantly in Chinese, he needed to, as much as possible without sinning, become all things to all men, that he might by all means save some. When he adopted the Chinese dress and the pigtail, it was a scandal to the whole mission community down the eastern coast. He's gone native. Well, Burns would have said, blessed be God, blessed be God. Hudson Taylor wrote in his diary, William Burns is one of those holy men one seldom meets with, who do possess a single eye to God's glory. The secret is easily learned and told. What do you think is coming next? He was a man of prayer. Sometimes my students will say to me, how do you prepare? I said, oh, you don't want to know that. <laughs> That'll just depress you. They said, no, no, we, we really want to know um, how you prepare. I said, well, we're all, we're all wired differently. So, no, we'd like to know how you prepare. I said, well, I think. What do you do after that? I think some more. What do you do after that? I think some more. <laughs> if you ask Burns, how, how do you account for your usefulness to God? I pray. Well, what do you do after that? I pray more. And what do you do after that? I pray more. Prayer is authentic Calvinism. Hudson Taylor continued, his love for the word was delightful. His holy reverential life and constant communings with God made fellowship with him satisfying to the deep cravings of my heart. Have you ever been with people and you leave them and their time with you has left you with an ache for God? That's what Burns was like. 
In 1858, he responds to invitations to return to the certain part of northeast China, Xiamen. He labors in the Fujian province for the next five years. He travels from village to village, but this time he has a little boat. And his Chinese assistants named it the Gospel Boat. And on the sails were written in large Chinese characters that could be read from a distance, Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And on the prow of the boat, they painted the craft's name, the Good News Boat. 1864, Burns goes to Peking. He translates a number of hymns into Mandarin, completes a translation of Pilgrim's Progress. He begins a translation of the Psalms from the Hebrew into Mandarin. If God ever calls any of you, or even me in my latter days, to go to wherever, Yes, he can use you gloriously and supernaturally. Calvinists are unembarrassed supernaturalists. But God ordinarily works through ordained means. And he expects us not to memorize 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 um, phrases so that we can talk simply about Jesus. We are to give ourselves, apply ourselves to learning that we might thereby communicate in ways that are familiar to our hearers, the truths of the great God who made them, who spared not his only son for them, and who summons them by grace and by royal command to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Burns dies of a fever in 1868 in Nui Chuang, excuse my Mandarin pronunciation. His last words, first words and last words are intriguing, aren't they? And memorable often. His last words were, Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And he dies. Let me make four comments or four lessons that we can take to heart from the life of William Chalmers Burns. Number one, unqualified devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ is not what a Christian aims at. It's where the life of faith begins. There were great crowds following Jesus, Luke tells us, Luke 14, 25. There were great crowds following Jesus. And Jesus said to them, Unless you take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you hate father, mother, wife, brother, sister, children, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Unqualified devotion is where the Christian life begins. You say, well, but does it not begin with faith alone in Christ alone? Absolutely. But what is this faith alone in Christ alone? Faith takes you into Jesus Christ, not only as justifying righteousness, but as sanctifying righteousness. It's the duplex gratia of the gospel. If he's not Lord You cannot yet be one of his. The Bible is very unsettling. I, I, I don't know about you, but 
I at times hate reading the Bible. I, I've got to be honest. I, I, I hope it's not a bad hatred, <laughs> but because it so unsettles me, it convicts me, exposes me. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Can you say, I'm not my own? I'm not my own. You, this is not where you get to in five or ten years. I'm not my own. Here am I. Lord, as you please, use me, send me, do with me as you will. The second lesson we can learn from Burns is that perseverance is vital to Christian life and Christian service. For seven years, William Chalmers Burns saw little, if any, gospel fruit, but he kept going on. He was undaunted. You know, we, we make far too much of gifts, even in the Reformed Church. We're far too impressed with gifted men and women. I think heaven is far more taken up with undaunted men and women who just keep going on, keep going on. One of the great, perhaps greatest influence in my Christian life was Eric Alexander. I had the privilege just over a year ago of taking his funeral in Glasgow. He told me once as a young divinity student, he was in London visiting a friend and they went to hear the doctor, Martin Lloyd-Jones at Westminster Chapel. And Eric's friend knew the doctor somewhat. So after the service, which Eric said was just magnificent, um, I heard the doctor once as a very young Christian and I sat at the edge of my seat for an hour and it was like five minutes. I just was absolutely gripped. And there were a queue of people waiting to talk to the doctor to thank him. And as they got nearer, Eric said to me, he said, you know, Ian, I, I was so disappointed <laughs> because he said the same thing to every person. They thanked him, they'd waited behind, and he said the same thing, go on. That's all he said. Go on. And as we got nearer, Eric said to me, What better thing could he have said? Maybe some of us here today need to hear that. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe there's difficulties and opposition in your ministry and you need to go on. Persevere. Look away to Jesus. It's a great text, Hebrews 12 too. It's not often translated very well looking away, and it's, it's a front is a present participle, looking away from something to something, looking away from yourself, your circumstances, your hostilities, your antagonisms, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and where is he now? Seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Go on. Thirdly, third lesson, we're almost finished. Preparation and training are vital for gospel usefulness. Now, that's true for all of us. We have to be men and women, boys and girls of the word. We, we need to know the word. We need to reflect on the word, meditate on it. I, I think the present generation, we, we don't know our Bibles as well as believers 40, 50 years ago. We need to equip our minds and hearts with the Word of God, blessed by the Spirit of God. And that's true for pastors, and it's true for missionaries. The Lord Jesus Christ spent 30 years being prepared. Read the second and third servant songs in Isaiah. We don't have time. He, he was 30 years being prepared in mind and in heart and in spirit. Preparation can be laborious. 
But God ordinarily uses means, ordinary means. Number four, and I'll finish with this. William Burns had an older brother called James. How many of you knew that? Why mention him? Well, as William was crossing the sea to China, at the same time, his brother was crossing the Tiber to Rome. Tiber is the river in Rome. His brother became a Romanist. His brother had gone to London, uh, I think, to seek his fortune, raised in the same godly home as, as William became attracted to high Anglican Oxford movement piety, early 1840s. And then with John Henry Newman and one or two others hurled through, he did the unthinkable, went to Rome. As William was crossing the sea to China, his brother was crossing the Tiber to Rome. Two sons, raised by the same godly parents. You young folk who are here today, never assume, never assume because you have godly parents that all will be well with you. Bless God for godly parents. It's a huge privilege. Bless God for godly parents. But Never, ever, 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 ever for one moment rest on the piety or the theology of your parents. Rest your hopes alone in the blood and righteousness of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Your parents are not your passport to glory but the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ is. So let me end with the quote with which I began from his diary. The longing of my heart is to make known my glorious Redeemer to those who have never heard. The Lord continues to say, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Will you go? Will you say, Lord, here am I, send me? You know, I, 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 I often wonder if, if the Lord had actually said, uh, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And by the way, um, if you say, here am I, you're going to have a ministry of utter rejection and opposition all the days of your life. But it's only after Isaiah says, here am I, send me, the Lord says, well, okay, well, thank you. Let me tell you now what you're letting yourself in for. But all heaven will look at you, marvel at you, and when the day comes, will welcome you with loud cheers into heaven. He, she, were willing to go. Here am I, said Isaiah, send me. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you adorn the church of our Lord Jesus Christ with men and women whose lives speak powerfully and eloquently to us. But we don't want simply to be admirers of them. We want, Lord, that 
the devotedness that so marked them might be etched in our lives too. We don't want to play at being Christians. We don't want to rest content with our orthodoxy, vital though it be. We want, Lord, to mirror in our lives the devotedness of our Savior because your grand ultimate purpose is to make him the firstborn among many brothers. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, we sing this really magnificent hymn from the Strasbourg Psalter. Um, sang it at my installation in Cambridge, 1999. I greet thee who my sure redeemer art.
on. Oh, there it is. Whoa. If you could make it to your seats, we're about to get started in our next session this morning. So let's come on in, and as you get seated, just a couple quick announcements for you. Um, just a reminder for our schedule, during the lunch period, there's two optional events for you. The first is the Youth Fellowship, which will be meeting in the cave at 1230, and then we'll have a special presentation on the upcoming library renovation, which will be taking place at one o'clock here in the sanctuary. So please just make those available to you in your schedule. And then I'd also like to bring your attention to an upcoming conference, the Biblical Worldview Student Conference, June 3rd to June 8th. Uh, a couple speakers that you'll recognize, friends of ours, uh, Rick Phillips, James Neuheiser, John Escola, Dan Dodds, and Del Bailey. If you'd like to know more about the Biblical Worldview Student Conference, they have a booth out in the hallway, so go check them out. That conference will be June 3rd to June 8th. Thank you. Well, it's our joy to uh, begin another session again as we'll be turning back to the Book of Acts uh, with Dr. Gilbert. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, uh, again, serves as the pastor of Grace Presbyterian Church in Douglasville, Georgia. Uh, we didn't mention last session, he's actually helping us uh, with our preaching courses at the seminary. He's one of the new adjunct professors helping us teach, and we are very grateful uh, for his service at the seminary with us. Well, as we uh, prepare uh, for this next session, let's stand together to sing the hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
let's pray together. O Lord, our God, uh, your name is indeed worthy of all glory and honor and praise. With our great triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, how we do praise you, Lord Jesus, for your marvelous work. Oh, you are, you are the Savior, the King of glory. Oh, how we thank you that you are the one who willingly took the cross, uh, the wormwood and the gall, in our place. And we marvel at your great love, O triune God, to undeserving sinners like us. Uh, you've shown us mercy that is incomparable, love that is vast beyond measure. Now, Lord, we know that, that even as we listen to your word and as we seek to understand, uh, we are just tasting a little of the vastness of your goodness and love to us. And so we thank you. We pray that you would bless your word to us once again. Oh, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would work mightily in our hearts. And you would teach us, each one of us, that you would draw us uh, to yourself, O oh God, that we would worship you, that we would be men and women and children uh, trusting in you and living for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the mic is very hot, and just to mention that to you, there's a little bit of echo up here, and as we uh, adjust to that, everyone can see this little thing, and you can perhaps make sure that now you, you turn it off. Um, I love Ian Hamilton. It's such a delight that he pressed truth to our hearts and evidences uh, a grip on our soul with Christ and just a sweet moment of humanity in the midst of it and then a r right back to riveting uh, truth on, on Christ. But I know, I've noticed throughout our times together that there's something buzzing and dinging and ringing. So just to remind you uh, that we would keep our focus on the things of the Lord together. Brother, we come uh, this morning to a second look at Acts chapter 10. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me there. So yesterday we looked together at verses 1 through 29 of the word of the Lord here in Acts chapter 10. And we're picking up the story in verse 30 and we'll be moving to the end of the chapter. And as we come together to God's word, would you look with me again to the Lord our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do pray that as we come to hear your word proclaimed, that your word, which is great and awesome, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, would pierce our hearts. We pray, Lord, that your word would take us captive. We pray that your word would show us the loveliness of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that by your spirit you would unveil truth to us. And it would all be to the glory of your great name. Lord, we come eager to hear from you, to speak to us and sanctify us by the word of truth. And we pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friends, hear now God's word, Acts 10, verse 30. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, 
preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is God's word, and may he bless his word to our hearts. Well, we come now to this second glimpse of Acts chapter 10, and the gospel is breaching the Gentile regions according to Christ's word at his ascension. So far, we've seen that the Lord has shown Peter the end of the dietary laws and the implications of that end, that namely, the Gentiles are no longer to be regarded as unclean and thereby incapable of fellowship with the Jews. Indeed, the Lord's great plan is to take those of every nation, tongue, and tribe and make them one people in Jesus Christ. All the ends of the earth must turn to Jesus for salvation. Further, we saw last time the patience of God slowly teaching Peter amidst his resistance and kindly rebuking Cornelius when he gave worship inappropriately. When he bowed down to Peter, the Lord is not only showing us that he's the Lord of all, both Jew and Gentile, but that he's patient with all. Additionally, we've seen something of the glorious significance of gospel preaching. While an angel could have told Cornelius the message of salvation, that's not the plan of the Lord. The Lord has chosen to use the ordinariness of a mere man speaking about Jesus, a called and gifted man, but a frail man through whom the Lord speaks to bring to bear his supernatural power on the hearts of his people. And the amazing thing is, as the gospel is faithfully proclaimed, it is the power of God unto salvation. For the Spirit is doing supernatural things in hearts as a mere man, but Christ's man preaches Christ's message to the people. Well, that moment of gospel heralding has now come. Cornelius, his relatives, and his close friends, they are all here assembled to hear what Peter has come to say So Peter will proclaim the gospel. And we're going to note four things in our text together. But we begin first with a listening people in verses 30 to 33. Now Peter mentions with his God-given new perspective as he starts that he obeyed the Lord. He says, verse 29, I came without objection. It's interesting that Peter is finally not objecting. He was objecting to the visions multiple times, but he came without objection. And then Peter asked the natural question, why did you send for me? Now, Peter has already heard this from the men Cornelius sent to him the previous day of the angel who had appeared to Cornelius to go get Peter. But Peter wants to hear the story from Cornelius himself. Thus, Cornelius details it all again. Now, this is interesting because it's the third time in the chapter we've heard about the same thing. Why is the Spirit of God telling us this over and over and over? 
Well, in the 21st century West, we might be those who don't like repetition. We certainly don't have patience with people who tell us the same stories. Again, have you ever gotten that pat on your arm? Honey, you've told me that already. <laughs> Scripture, particularly a narrative, repeats the same stories. Why? Well, there are a multitude of reasons, but three that we should think about. One here is certainty. This really happened. Two, importance. This is a crucial event. Something monumental is happening here, and you should pay attention. And then third, God is definitely at work. There's a surety of firmness that God is directing what is happening. This is not man's work. Man didn't come up in a boardroom with a marketing strategy. How do we get the gospel out there to people beyond the Jews? God is directing the issue. And Cornelius basically says all the same things to Peter. But the point is to relate to Peter that the impression of the angelic vision was so strong, Cornelius is still marking time by it. Note he says it happened four days ago, about this same hour, verse 30. And then Cornelius did what he was told. I sent for you at once, verse 33, and you've been kind enough to come. But then note the conclusion Cornelius draws as Peter has arrived to speak. Verse 33, Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Now friends, there are two things in that statement worth pondering. First, don't miss the declaration of this Gentile that as God's messenger comes to him to preach the word of God as they worship that we are all here in the presence of God. We often hear talk about being in the presence of God when the church gathers, that as, as the church assembles, like a people gathered to hear the gospel, we are there in the presence of the Lord. And sometimes, of course, we hear Matthew 18, 20 quoted, where two or three are gathered in my name, there Jesus says, I am among them. That verse is relevant, though it's striking that that's in the midst of the exercise of church discipline as the church makes its judgment. But this verse in Acts 10 is focused on sitting under the gospel preached specifically. And yes, it's true, we are always in the presence of God. In fact, there's nowhere you can go to get away from the presence of God. Jonah tried. It didn't work. You, you can't separate yourself from the God who inhabits eternity. He is everywhere. But there's a special presence of God, a unique drawing near of the Lord as we draw near to him, as we enter, as it were, into the heavenly Zion and we come to mingle our voices with those angels gathered in festal array and the spirits of just men made perfect. Here is a unique drawing near to God in worship. When we come to hear him, when we come to receive his gospel, to hear his ambassador speak to us of Christ as though God is making his appeal through that man, when we are there to receive the gospel expounded, we are uniquely gathered in the presence of God. And his eye is specially upon us. Doesn't that make worship, where gospel preaching is happening, so significant? Doesn't it thrill your soul that God is near to us like that? It's significant for the preacher. He preaches in the presence of the living God. Better not corrupt the message. But it's significant for us all. God is among us to speak to us. And how is he speaking? Through his mouthpiece. A mere man who yet carries a divine message with authority. Remember how Paul will tell us in Ephesians 2, and he's reflecting on Jew and Gentile coming together as one new man in Christ, that Christ came and preached peace to those who are far off and peace to those who are near. When did Jesus go to Ephesus? He didn't, but he did when Paul went and preached to Jew and Gentile. What a perspective. This should give our worship. That Christ is addressing us. The gathering of the people of God is a sacred assembly. And God has called us into his presence. And he, the great and almighty king, is here. And how do you hear him? Today, if you hear his voice, 
Do not harden your heart. How do you hear him? In the word. That's being emphasized here. Because that's the means that God is going to use to save Cornelius and all these gathered. And it's the means he's still using by which we are being saved. The word of the cross. And then that moves us to a second thing under this first heading. Cornelius and all these others are conscious of being in the presence of God. To hear what? Note the text. To hear all that you, Peter, all that you have been commanded by the Lord. Peter, we are not gathered to listen to you share your opinions. We are not here to reflect on your musings of Jewish and Gentile relation of cultural sensibilities, of political reflections, of traditions associated with Jew-Gentile relationships. This is not story hour. This is not a time for our entertainment. We want to hear chiefly and only what the Lord has commanded you to say, and we want to hear it all. The apostles don't carry a message of their own invention. They don't get to put their own spin on things. They are heralds, and a herald is simply one who makes the king's message known. He has no liberty to alter anything. Isn't that clear here? Say to us, Peter, what the Lord has commanded, exactly that and all of it. Give us all the saving message, everything we are to believe about who God is, about what Christ has done, and what the Lord requires of us. And that will be the very message that Peter will preach. And we'll get to the message in a minute. But again, we're seeing the importance of the word. The gospel that Peter proclaims is not some story made up to inspire people to selfless service. It's a divine message of salvation. It's a word of unbelievable grace. And we hear it as from the Lord. That doesn't eliminate, of course, being a good Berean. Making sure that what is said is what the Lord says. But it does mean we come with a readiness to hear all of it. We, like this assembled group, prepare to hear. We give diligence to hearing that we would welcome the word in our heart and then practice it in our lives. We listen as those ready to receive all that God is saying to us. And all is the stuff that confronts sin. Give me the uncomfortable bits that show me my misery, that you might make much of my Savior. Show me there's no hope in me for salvation, no movement in me towards spiritual good, that I'm a depraved sinner and I need rescue from bondage. I need the power of God to shatter the shackles of my sin. And there is sin is explained in its nature, in its effects, in its deserts. That's all an offense to man. Remember Paul will say as he preaches... He doesn't preach to please men. The Lord commands, his commands include the declaration that we are desperately sick. But I want to hear of my sickness that I might hear of the power of my Savior. I want to see the depths of the lows of sin that I might see the glories of Christ. Is that what we want? Is this the message we want to carry into the world? All the Lord says not a truncated gospel that heals the wound of the people lightly and therefore gives them only a, a truncated Christ and not Christ in his fullness. Do we want the full gospel, the whole counsel of God? Do we want the word of grace, the estates of Christ, the offices of Christ, the benefits of Christ, all the work of Christ, the attributes of Christ, the blessings that Christ gives his people in their obedience to him. Do we want all of it? Do you see the hunger in these people to hear the word? May we hear like this. But then secondly, see with me, pride put off. Verses 34 and 35, this anticipation is in the air as the Gentiles hunger for the pure spiritual milk. But before Peter gets to the gospel, he relates something about God himself and his saving purposes. You see it in verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now this is, I think, a confession from Peter. Peter and his fellow Jews had believed 
had fallen into faulty thinking that their favored status as God's people, those with the scriptures, those brought into the covenant, those redeemed from Egypt and given special laws, they believed that these things showed them their superiority over all people. They were slipping into the error that God was partial to them. And while it's true God gave Israel special privileges, the thought that God is partial runs contrary to what God himself had told Israel. Deuteronomy 10 verse 17, Moses said, The great, the mighty, the awesome God Yahweh, he is not partial. It's pretty clear, right? God doesn't play favorites. He he gives justice to the fatherless and the widow. And then this is particularly crucial in Deuteronomy 10. He loves the sojourner, the alien. On that basis, Moses told Israel, love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You recognize what's being communicated. The the Israelites were outcasts in Egypt. They were strangers in a foreign land, but God had mercy on them. Thus, when the Gentiles are among them, they're not to be disregarded. They're to be loved and cared for. Why? Because God isn't partial. God doesn't look on a Gentile and say he's just an outcast, a reject, someone less than human. No, the Lord values all the sons of Adam, all human beings. He discards none as worthless Didn't we see that powerfully in Jesus' ministry? Where he didn't just speak to the leper to be cleansed. I'm always struck by this passage. He reached out his hand and touched him. Or the Samaritan woman. No one will speak to her. That's why she's at the well in the middle of the day. She's an outcast. And Jesus is willing to address her. To make a point of connection, interestingly, On a shared humanity. Give me a drink. He's thirsty. He puts himself in need before this woman. Because he values her. And yet the Jews were not valuing the Gentiles. And the Jews were trying to find a theological justification for their bigoted views. Jews had come to believe, and Peter is sucked into the cultural blindness of this, That God had chosen them for something in them. We are morally superior. God has made us his own because we stand out. We are strong. We are smart. We are sophisticated. But what did Moses say? You were not chosen because you were righteous. Deuteronomy 9. Further, Deuteronomy 7. You were not chosen because you were more numerous. You were a stronger people. Yahweh loves you because he loves you. The choice of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was not because of anything in them. Go back and read of the lives of these men. And that masterful survey Dr. Morales gave us last night. They're flawed men, but grace snatched them. God's free, unmerited, totally unconditional favor was lavished upon them. Because God isn't partial. This is true for us, isn't it? We are rescued by grace Only because of grace. God isn't partial. Remember how Wesley asked the question in the hymn, And can it be that I should gain? Or how Watts asked it, Why was I made to hear your voice and enter while there's room? Remember he envisions that feast. And there we are with all of our hearts and all of our songs. We're joining to admire the feast. But each of us cries with thankful tongue, Lord, why was I a guest? Grace, only because of God's free grace. God is not partial in saving a people. There's no pride here. Nothing can strain God to act. He did it for his own good pleasure. That's breathtaking. But there had been a corruption of this grace as the Jews were giving themselves credit As though they could claim a hold on the grace of God exclusively. It's one reason the Jews had despised Jesus. How can a Samaritan be the hero of the story? Are you kidding me? How can Jesus offer mercy freely to these despicable people? 
We are the sons of Abraham. But oh, do you remember that to Abram God had said, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Do you remember how the Psalms speak of this blessing of the nations? Psalm 67, the psalmist prays that God would make his face to shine on Israel. For what purpose? That God's saving power would be known among the nations. Listen to these declarations of the Psalms. Psalm twenty two twenty seven. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Psalm forty five seventeen. Nations will praise you forever and ever. Psalm forty six ten. Be still and know that I am God. And please continue in the verse. I will be exalted among the nations. Psalm sixty seven four. Let the nations be glad. Psalm ninety six verse two. Declare his glory among the nations. Psalm one hundred seventeen verse one. Praise the Lord, all nations. Psalm 72, 11, Solomon's song, pointing to Christ, the messianic kingdom. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Seems plain, doesn't it? But here, they missed it. Well, here's a wonderful moment. Peter says, I get it. I lay my pride in the dust. I see that God accepts people of every nation. He accepts anyone who fears him and does what is right. What is the beginning of wisdom? It isn't becoming a Jew. It's fearing the Lord. And all who fear him, regardless of ethnicity, background, or class, all will be blessed by him. What is the motivation to tell the nations of our God and his salvation? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. What a glorious declaration that is of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet what does it lead to as we understand this call of the gospel? It leads to a fear of him. Isn't that how Psalm 130 puts it? There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Brethren, do we understand that? The fear of the Lord. You remember Jesus asked a striking question, and I'm, I'm appreciative of Dr. Hamilton talking about his uncomfortableness with the word of God. This, this verse jumps all up over me. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Is there a fear of the Lord, an attitude of heart that's evidenced in our actions? But the crucial point in this text God will accept anyone of any nation who fears him. Now, repeatedly, we've seen in the Gospels how the Jews thought they were favored on the basis of their bloodlines. And yet Jesus is showing them they're not accepted. Without faith in a saving faith that always looks to Christ and always yield works, without real faith in a real Savior, there's no real fear of God. But then there's people like the Gerizim demoniac and the Syrophoenician woman, Gentiles, who yet have real faith and real fear, and they are accepted by Jesus when everyone else writes them off. The world may treat you as worthless, as unworthy of any thought or any care, but the Lord God, the Almighty, is not partial. He accepts anyone who fears him. And doesn't this give us a compulsion to preach the gospel, to go into the nations? Come, O children, David says in Psalm 34. Come and listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. I've been captivated by his deliverance. Let me tell you the fear of the Lord. There are no people excluded from the saving mercies of Jesus Christ. Peruvian street children. Albanian Muhammadists, African animists, Indian polytheists, British secularists, American hedonists, low class, high class, culturally acceptable, cultural outcasts. God is no respecter of persons. Anyone can have grace teach their heart to fear. Praise God for that truth. But then how does God broadcast this amazing grace? Well, he uses preaching. And we see now Peter's sermon, the good news of peace. Thirdly, the good news of peace. Peter now begins laying out crucial gospel facts. Verse 36. 
He says, as for the word that he, that is God, sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Uh, Peter is saying at the outset of his message that this is a message of peace from God, that you can have peace with God through Jesus Christ, that God is reconciling sinners in Christ. And that reconciling work, resting on Jesus' work, isn't different for Jews than for Gentiles. There aren't two paths to peace. There is one message of peace. There is one proclamation of good, good news, that glorious language of victory, the announcement of the good news. You remember when a, a war was won, a herald of the king was sent to announce the good news of triumph. 2 Samuel 18, Ahimehaz goes to bear the good news. That's what takes place in gospel preaching. What we announce is not what we do to get peace. Do this, do that, and then you can have peace with God. No, we announce the good news of triumph, the tidings of Jesus Christ. We publish his glory, and we call men, women, boys, and girls to look to Christ and live. Hear what he accomplished and cling to him that you may have peace with God. And that peace, that good news, brethren, it rests on a collection of facts. This is a crucial point. Mason made some 100 years ago in Christianity and liberalism that the good news, which begins with a triumphal indicative, what Jesus has done, that it's necessarily historical. We're talking about facts here, real stuff accomplished, not abstract ideas. Jesus did something to secure for us who believe peace with God. And the things that he did are the only path to peace with God. Now, Peter's about to convey the gospel message. And we should note what he's going to tell us is the same stuff preached to the Jews at Pentecost. God has one message for all, Jew and Gentile. And it's an, it's an unchanging message. Don't we see that? Throughout the march of the book of Acts, we hear preaching from Peter and Stephen and Philip and Paul, and they preach to kings and to commoners, to Jerusalem Jews and Hellenist Jews, to Samaritans and Gentiles. We keep getting a record of their sermons, and they all communicate the same stuff, the same facts. What does that mean? The gospel does not change on the basis of culture. The gospel does not change with the march of time. The gospel never changes in view of the audience. We don't recast or reconstruct the gospel. There isn't a Western gospel, in an Eastern gospel. There is a gospel, the good news of peace, explaining the historical work of Jesus Christ. That is unalterable, and it will never accommodate itself to modern ideas. For there's one message about Jesus, and without the facts of what Jesus did proclaimed, no gospel is communicated. Hear me again. Without the facts of what Jesus did proclaimed, no gospel is communicated. This puts to bed the famous saying of Francis Assisi. I'm sure you've heard it. Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. That is total nonsense. Implicit in that statement is that preaching the gospel doesn't require words, verbal proclamation. Indeed, some will argue the most powerful sermons are without words. Just go to the impoverished at the end of the earth, go to those among the nations, and give them food, and give them water, and that itself will preach. Was well, certainly true that we as believers in Christ should have lives that garner attention as we are zealous for good works, that we let our light shine before those in darkness. But friends, you can't preach Christ without words. Jesus didn't come as a mere example. He came sent from the Father with a message. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. And drink. And then Jesus sealed his message with his blood. Jesus then sends his men with a word, with a content of truth, the word of the cross, which is to be 
announced, heralded, spoken. And without that gospel proclaimed, there is no gospel. There has to be gospel content. So what are the facts of the gospel here? Well, Peter conveys at least ten of them. You'll be thankful to know I won't now move into a ten-point sermon. you got to remember, this is not a word-for-word account. Luke is giving us a summary. In fact, scholars have noted in this passage that Peter's summary really summarizes the whole of Luke's gospel. And notice, it's interesting, Peter starts with the preparatory ministry of John, verse 37. And note the public nature of what he conveys. You yourselves, he tells the Gentiles, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. The ministry of John, then followed by Jesus, wasn't hidden in a corner. Droves of people from all over Judea were going out to John. Caesarea, where Cornelius is, is part of the Roman province of Judea. In other words, Cornelius and the people gathered here, they heard a stir several years back of people going out to John. He was preaching, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He was calling people to repent and look for the Messiah. And then, of course, Jesus' ministry begins at Galilee, as Luke recorded. And as Jesus began his ministry of preaching and healing, the word about him went everywhere. Again, Caesarea is some five miles from Galilee, And according to Luke 6, a great multitude from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon came to hear Jesus and to be healed. Cornelius and these others have heard of Jesus' works. They didn't hear Jesus directly. They haven't heard all of Jesus, that is, who he is, what it means, what he's done. That's why Peter is here. But news of great things had reached them. News of factual things. And you could easily think the reports about Jesus were all overblown. Peter insists that they were not. Look at verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. The miracles of Jesus performed after his anointing with the Spirit, they demonstrated that he is the shoot from Jesse's stump. He is the Spirit-filled king. And his kingly power is evidenced as he overthrows the curse. Satan's power is crumbling before Christ. The devil can't resist him. Sickness and death heed his voice. Jesus is clearly empowered by God. And these stories of healing, of demonic exorcisms... They're not fairy tales. They're not exaggerated reports. For Peter adds, and this is striking, verse 39. We are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Do you see how Peter is pointing to historical credibility? We saw Jesus do this. We witnessed it all. Everything communicated about Jesus' power was seen the clear fact that he was equipped with miracles. It was seen. Peter's saying, I'm here to tell you, the kingdom of God has broken in as as Isaiah proclaimed. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the dead are raised. The devil's tyranny is defeated. There's hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet there's the shocking fact Though Jesus was filled with the Spirit, possessed divine power, and he was doing good among the Jews. Verse 39, they, the Jews, put him to death. And not just any death, but death by hanging him on a tree. Now as a God-fearer, Cornelius certainly would have heard about the curse of God falling on one who is hanged on a tree. The Jews looked at these great works of Jesus, the very one with whom God walked, we would say, whom God attended. They regarded him to be accursed. And Jesus really died. It begs a question, doesn't it? How could the God-man die? Why would the anointed one, clothed with the Spirit, go to his death? Luke 
doesn't give us more detail here in this sermon of Peter, but, but certainly we remember earlier sermons in the book. Philip's meeting with the Ethiopian eunuch in particular, that the death of Jesus was in view of our sin. Isaiah 53, God laid the iniquity of us all on him. He is the Lamb of God. He's bearing our crimes. And while these wicked men killed Jesus, wickedness didn't prevail. This was God's great plan. This is what he had purposed, that the stone that the builders rejected would then become the cornerstone. And we see God delight in his son, verse 40, as he, God the Father, raised him on the third day. Jesus, his death was under the judgment of God, and yet God himself vindicated his son. What does it mean? The sacrifice of the Lamb of God for sinners was accepted. That it is finished. That Christ has purchased salvation for his people. He came to save his people from their sins, and he has done it. And to make it clear that the resurrection is not just an idea, not just a, a mystical notion, some type of spiritual thing disconnected from the physical, Peter adds that God made Jesus to appear. Now, Jesus didn't appear, verse 41, to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Do you see how Peter is again stressing eyewitness testimony? We saw these things. He was not an apparition, some kind of ghost. We didn't dream this up. We didn't hallucinate. This is no myth. Jesus was truly raised. He had a real resurrected body. We ate and drank with him after the resurrection. There is true triumph over the grave. It's not as though Jesus' body is still lying somewhere in a tomb in Jerusalem. No, the tomb is empty. The body of Jesus is full of life. He didn't appear to die. He really died taking our judgment, and he really rose. And his resurrection is physical. He's already laying a foundation for that glorious eschatological reality of union with Christ. And that we experience resurrection as Christ is the first fruits, and that's our hope. The day Isaiah anticipated, where death will be swallowed up in victory, it is here. It has arrived. And for the Christian, death has no sting. How do you go as a missionary to reach an unreached people contemplating the thought that you may be laid in the ground there, that it may be full of suffering, that you may be overwhelmed with opposition and even killed. It's a striking thing, isn't it, that the believer can look at the ugliness of death and all of its horror, and it is horrible, and yet say, you hold no sting for me. There is hope because of Christ's resurrection. And then Peter adds another crucial fact to the life, death, resurrection, and appearances of Christ. Verse 42, And he, that is the Lord, the risen Christ, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he, King Jesus, is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. Now, this is crucial for a couple of reasons. Cornelius told Peter, we want to hear all that the Lord commanded you. And now Peter explains the command of the Lord. And what was it specifically? It was the command to preach and to testify. Peter is under compulsion to preach the gospel. Paul himself will say later, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. God had given these men these facts, the thing that, that they witnessed, and they must declare them. And of course, that declared message does not die when these apostles die. For by the Spirit's power, we have the record of apostolic eyewitness testimony in the Scriptures. We've been given the gospel of Christ 
resting on the foundation of the apostles, a gospel with historical veracity. And while we ourselves haven't seen what they saw or received a direct verbal commission by King Jesus to go, we, those gifted and called to preach, we must keep preaching. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Thornwell, when he's writing on the calling to the ministry, there's a lot of debate about the nature of an internal call. But Thornwell says, this is it. If you feel in your soul, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. That's it. You're called. Is that call gripping you? Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I'm captivated by the living Christ and I must announce the glory of his name why must I do that? Because this is the means that God is appointed to save sinners. And then a second vital fact here. Jesus is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. In other words, Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus will judge all, Jew and Gentile. Every soul will reckon with the lordship of Christ and their sins violating the law of God. Do you understand the facts of what Jesus did? His life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. Those facts matter for all people. All people must be told. You have to reckon with the resurrected king, God's appointed judge. You must seek him to be rescued from judgment. All people need this message. Because without that message, they are going to an eternal hell. They need to hear of Christ and his glory. The only provision that their sins would be pardoned. And do you see how Peter brings it something to a grand conclusion in verse 43? To him, to Jesus, reigning as king and judge, all the prophets bear witness. The whole Old Testament pointed to him so that everyone, not just one little ethnic group, but everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter is saying, as he said earlier in the book, there is salvation in no one else save Jesus. He's the only name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Turn to Christ. He is the snake crusher. He is the prophet like Moses. He is David's greater son. He is the lion from the tribe of Judah. He's Emmanuel. He's the prince of peace. Rest on Christ. This is the word that the nations need to hear. Only by his authority and ju as judge and only by his death and resurrection can Gentiles be forgiven. But if we believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior. We believe that our sins, which are due judgment, can be washed away. He is the fountain for sin and uncleanness. Friends, are we banking our souls on these facts? Here we are, all of us, a people on the way to death. Are we ready to stand before the judge of the living and the dead? There is only one way to escape condemnation. One path to life. And it is simply to rest on Jesus' condemnation for you. Are you doing that? Are you looking to Christ? Repent and rest in Jesus alone. And then knowing there's only one way of reconciliation. There's only one escape from judgment. Let us tell sinners there is forgiveness. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the most glorious articles of our faith is that declaration. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Are you overwhelmed at your own forgiveness? That you might tell others of the sweet salvation found in Christ who pardons all your guilty stains. Indeed, should not compassion 
for perishing sinners drive us. John G. Payton has been mentioned, his name has been mentioned a number of times. He seems to be a hero for all of us. He speaks of his calling to the mission field. And one of the aspects that drove him was the wail of the heathen. It's so convicting to read that. To know the, the hardness of my own heart. The lack of compassion in me. The wail of the heathen. That I, I can't push away. I, I must go. Do we feel the wail of perishing sinners? That we would give them the word of life. And brethren, let's give them the facts accurately and clearly call upon them to believe in Jesus, to repent and trust. Because that is God's means to save. Well, finally, and very briefly, see with me, the Spirit poured out. Much time could be spent on what is here. But let me sum up in this last point. We see in verse 44 that the Spirit interrupts Peter's sermon. You probably wish the Spirit would do that to some sermons you've heard before. And just stop. The Spirit falls on all who heard the word. What's that tell us? It says that all of these people believed under the preaching of the gospel. They all turned to Christ. He poured out his Spirit on them. And it's just as he had done to the Jews at Pentecost. This amazes the six Jewish guys there with Peter in verse 45. Because they're still holding on to the prejudicial ideas about the Gentiles. But the Spirit shows them, convinces them, that the Jews and Gentile, that they're fellow heir together, fellow member of the household of God. That what the sinner needs is not a different diet, ceremonially clean food and so forth. What he needs is faith in Christ alone. And the content of the gospel isn't eat this and dress like this and go to this event and get this mark. The gospel is look to what Christ has done. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Cling to him. We don't carry a message of moral transformation to the world. If you only followed these rules, you would have a blessing. No, all of our rule following is rotten. We need to recognize that Christ is our obedience. And we trust him. And God is now here in this age of the spirit, the messianic era. He is turning the nations to seek the root of Jesse. And the Spirit's blessing is demonstrated as the Spirit comes upon them all. In verse 46, they speak in tongues. And this isn't telling us that every believer upon conversion speaks in tongues. We've only heard of tongue speaking at this point in Acts a couple of times. Acts 2 and here, many other people have been converted. Not to mention in Acts 2, it was the apostles speaking in tongues. And now it's the Gentiles speaking in tongues. The, the point is the tongues are a tangible sign of an epochal event. Namely, through Christ's triumph, as he pours out his spirit, Babel, as a curse, is reversed. It's not reversed over and over and over again. It's reversed once in view of the triumph of Christ and the outpouring of the spirit. Judgment came to the nations for their rebellion against God. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. And now the Lord is overthrowing the curse. Grace is conquering the power of sin. And as the gospel is spreading from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the Gentiles at the end of the earth, the Spirit of God is confirming the gospel expansion. The echo of Pentecost here is marking the progress of the gospel. The new age has dawned. As power ripples out to the nations. It's striking the very language of Pentecost that the Spirit fell upon and poured out is used here. It means also that the gospel facts that Peter communicated are true. The Spirit is owning the message, we could say. Jesus is the long-awaited, Spirit-filled Lord and Savior. And there's salvation for all who believe in His name. Salvation isn't a wish. It isn't a vain hope. It isn't something distant from us. It's a real, free gift given to every believer. We bring nothing but our sin to Jesus. We hear of what he has done. We trust. 
And he changes us. And having been changed, we declare. Peter finally gets the fullness of all the Lord has been teaching him. He sees nothing should be held back from these believing Gentiles. They should receive the sign of inclusion into the people of God in a new covenant baptism. That is not a sign of Western imperialism. If you heard Chad Vegas speak earlier, you'll know what I mean. If you didn't, you need to go listen. Here's a guy who is not Western and he's not white saying baptism should be administered. And the Spirit has shown Peter, we welcome these Gentiles in the name of Christ. A people far off, strangers to the covenants of the promise, who were once without hope and without God in the world, they can be brought near and united to Christ. And if that doesn't thrill your soul, you don't understand what it means to be a Gentile. But we've been brought in by the blood of Jesus because his blood breaks down barriers and binds people together and then sets us apart as belonging to him. Baptism, I belong to Christ. And as those who belong to Christ, what do we do? Washed, cleansed by Jesus, sought and saved by the Lord, tasting this deluge of gospel blessing on the soul. We want that message to go to others. There is a way to be washed. There's a way to have peace with God. There's a way to enter into forever communion with the living God through Christ and the power of the Spirit. And that is the most glorious thing in the world that a sinner could know. Well, let us then go. Go and make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that Jesus declared and clinging to that word of Christ. Lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray together. O Lord, our God, we come and we marvel at the power of your gospel. We marvel at the great things you have done for us as those who are but hell-deserving sinners. And Lord, our great sin is our lack of amazement, how we can be so cold to these heartwarming truths. Forgive us. Forgive us for not treasuring the gospel and weeping tears of joy at the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ and longing to see others come to taste and see your goodness. Oh Lord, if we have tasted and seen, would you compel us to speak of our Savior? And Lord, would you raise up those even in our very midst to be sent as laborers into your harvest field, that as the heathen wails, that that wail would come to be a cry of repentance and faith. In Jesus, our glorious King, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, you can take your booklet and you can find opposite the All Hail the Power of Jesus' name that we sang to begin this session, uh, Psalm 72a, O God, your judgments give the King. We're going to stand and sing to the praises of the Lord.
thank you, Dr. Gilbert, for bringing the word to us. Uh, we are all now dismissed for our lunch break. Uh, we convene again at 2 o'clock, so a two-hour lunch break, and there's some other events going on, as mentioned. And we look forward to seeing you back again this afternoon.
No. There, are, there might be Agreed. Some, okay, this is Pat. This looks, this works. Are you on, Pat? I'm talking. I don't think yours is turned on. Oh, my social tip's on. Here. The, okay, this is, it's a little bit hot. I'm on now. Whoa. It's a lot. Do we need to be, does it hurt us being in front of the monitors? Probably. Should we be up on the stage? This is where, I'm back on now. This is where I will be. Right. So, how's that? Yeah, this, this, does this sound good? Maybe, well, how, I'm talking now, does that sound better? Islands in the stream, well, in case we have to like do a duet. Yeah, that possible. is possible, <laughs> possible, could happen. Um, All right. There's Brett. Yeah, we should yeah, be able yeah. to talk, we're both talking. If Pat sounds a little loud to me, is that true? Or is it just, make me, make me half as loud as Jonathan. No, no, that's not it. It's just there's a little <laughs> feedback. There's a, just a tiny little bit of feedback. His, his voice kind of sounds annoying. Is that, is there? <laughs> Can you just keep going down, keep going down? No, no, it's really whiny. No, 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 tune, tune, tune it down. Yeah, I think this, that, that sounds, sounds more natural. Sounds good yeah. to me. As long as you all can hear. Can you hear me, Nate? Okay. All right. Great. Should we good. turn it off?
the slide presentation and kind of walking through the nuts and bolts, uh, Pat will do. And then we'll have a lot of time at the end for questions if you have any. But uh, I wanted to set the stage for what got us to the point of thinking about doing this. Obviously, an undertaking like this is, uh, it creates a lot of disruption in the institution. We're going to have to be moving all the entire library starting next week um, and then moving it back uh, in August. So that's disruptive. And, and then it's costly. Uh, so there are a lot of reasons that uh, a project like this can be difficult. But the reason why we feel compelled to do it and compelled to do it now is largely because of what the Lord's been doing in increasing our student body. Um, one of the things that we, that's pretty obvious, I think, if you look at the landscape of seminary education or if you look at what ev uh, any other seminaries are, are advertising or how it is that they're presenting themselves, the, um, the general impulse is for seminaries to try to make the case that you can do it in a quicker way, in an easier way, with less effort, with less study time, um, and, and, uh, and, and maybe not even have to come onto a camp. Um, what, what's been exciting is this. We've made the case that it's worth it and, and that it's worth it to put in the effort and this is, this is the way in which men need to be trained for gospel ministry both here and overseas. And by God's grace, we've seen a number of men respond to that. So this falls class was our largest incoming MDiv class. We have 16 new students who just started in January. The, it looks as if next year's class is going to be even bigger than this year's class if our, if our prospective student numbers give any indication of that. So God's been blessing it. The other thing we've been making the case for, and you'll know this because it's wrapped up in what we've been doing this week, is we've been making the case that men need to seriously consider the call of God on their lives, not just to serve here, but to serve overseas in some of the most difficult places in the world. And we've done that through partnerships and other means but again, that's something that, is, that has, there's been significant traction for. So we've seen increased enrollment, but with increased enrollment, what that means is we really have to provide the resources that those students need when they come to study. Obviously, the most important resources that they need have to do with the faculty members, and so we're always on the search for really good faculty members, and God's provided us with a great faculty. But also, there are needs for uh, spaces to study, for library facilities and other things. That's just an integral part of what it means to train for gospel ministry. So uh, it's really because of those core commitments combined with what we're seeing, combined with what God's doing, that have led us to the place of saying uh, we, we need to seriously consider uh, a renovation of the library. The other thing is this. We've been in this building that God provided for us so generously um, about 15 years ago, a little over 15 years ago, we've been in this building and we've, we've maximized every space. We've renovated a number of the spaces. If you took the tour, you've seen that. But there is that library section that we think can be utilized even more. So it's a, it's a fairly cost-effective way, using our current footprint, of actually maximizing what the Lord's entrusted us with for the future. So that's what lies in the background. Now I can unpack any of those things and answer specific questions about numbers and, and trajectories and things like that during the Q&A. But I wanted to say that because uh, I, I do want to make it very clear, I want you to hear this from me, uh, that the reason we're doing this is not because uh, we think we exist to 
build buildings or to even renovate the buildings that we have. That's not our mission. The building serves a purpose. Our campus facilities serve a purpose, and the purpose is greater than those. But uh, in order to fulfill that purpose and mission that God's given us, we need to, I think, uh, look seriously at this project. So we've planned to undertake it uh, in the summer, and Pat's going to show you a little bit more about what it will look like uh, and, and uh, what we're aiming to accomplish through it. Okay, well with that as our background, we'll look at some slides together. I want to confess at the beginning that I'm not a very good slide designer. At Greenville Seminary, they did not train me to do PowerPoint, so it's a good thing. So uh, the first picture was just an aspirational model of Trinity Library in Dublin. We're not planning to do that, but just something to dream about. So why redesign library? Dr. Master just covered a lot of this, but the main reason, the main reason, just to highlight it, is that our student body is growing rapidly. Now in terms of numbers of students, uh, that might be too strong of a word to say, but in terms of a percentage on our in-campus student body, it's definitely, it's definitely rapid growth. We're running out of space. And the reality is that even before this increase in enrollment, we were already way behind on study space. So currently we have nine private study areas and one group study table. So with the group study table, you get a couple more chairs around it. So really there's room for 11 to 12 students to get, get a spot in the library to study for a current in-person class size of about 66 people. So 66 on-campus students um, sharing 11 chairs. So we have one sixth of the, sp of the study space that we need. So you can see that as the campus continues to grow, it just becomes worse and worse and worse. And so uh, we really want to address the need for study space. We also need a new large classroom. So as the campus continues to grow, as the student body continues to grow, like Dr. Master pointed out, uh, we're going to get to a point, probably this fall, we feel fairly confident that this fall we're going to be in trouble and we will not be able to fit all of our in-person students in those early first and second year classes. So. I was just talking to Dr. Morales last week at um, one of his biblical theology classes. Every seat in the class is full, so 27 seats in our classes. Every seat was full, and he had 16 students online. So we, thankful th we thank the Lord for that. But there's just a reality that we are going to have to start capping uh, those early classes if we continue in this trajectory. And so when we go to this redesign, we're not only trying to solve the issue of study space, there's other issues that we can solve. You'll see the last point there is we're getting tight on book space. We're going to look to double our library, uh, the ability to double our library. We're going to invest in some high density shelving. But we're also going to put in a new large classroom, which will enable us not only to host uh, special summer intensives where, where we can fit 50 people in one classroom, but also just meet the need of a growing class size. So we can move on to the next slide there, Nate. Um, so that's why we're planning to redesign the library. So what is our plan? Our plan is to create a study space that can fit 60 students and to create a classroom that can fit 50 students and then to create uh, room enough be to be able to double our library. So that's our current plan. And as we seek to address these three goals, there are other benefits that we're going to be able to achieve at the same time. First is just going to be a better first impression. So when you walk into our, our, our seminary in the front entrance, it's a very narrow space. There's no receptionist to greet you. The receptionist, Mrs. Benj, can tell you it's kind of off to the side, and you have to kind of look around to, to find them. So we're going to be able to address some um, just design issues with the space while we're at it, and this will give a better first impression for prospective students, which actually is important to continue to recruit more men to train for gospel ministry. Um, it's also going to be a better student experience. More study space translates to more fellowship time for the students because they don't have to go off campus to study. Uh, some of them, they finish their classes, they go straight home because there's no place for them to study. The more time they're studying together, the more time they're spending together, the better fellowship they're enjoying, the more they're building long-term gospel partnerships that they're going to benefit from for decades and decades as they head into the ministry. So I think that's a great investment. And then it'll also, the third extra benefit we'll get is just space for some of our growing summer intensives, which we'd love to host, but even this past summer, we couldn't fit them all in a classroom. We're taking classroom walls down. We're moving things around. There's just going to be a need for more classroom space. So that's our plan. With that plan, let's look at some of the design. So this is just put up there to stress you out because it's very difficult to see from here, but this is 
just to show you that we're going to look at an existing layout and then we're going to zoom in on what we're proposing. So let's move to the next slide. So here we have our existing uh, library wing layout. And if you've ever been to the seminary, this will make sense to you. If you've never been there, I'll try to walk you through how it works. So make sure my orientation is the same way as yours. So on the bottom right of the page, you would head in the entry. You see that, like, that narrow entry? You would go up there into this big corridor, and then we, you can see that there's a series of rooms on the bottom and the bottom left of the screen, which shows you three, one, two, three, four rooms that we, we currently use for the library. So it's very broken up. And then you have this big, spacious corridor, which is helpful, but it's really unutilized space. So one of the things we're tr trying to do is to make significant improvements as efficiently and as cost effective as possible. And so we're not actually planning to build outside of this building envelope. We're not breaking new ground. We're not buying space in another location. We just brought in an architect and asked the question, how can we reutilize this space and do a better job of, of using every square inch? And so you can see, if you're in that bottom right, you come up that entryway, it's narrow, you don't really know where to go. We have a nursery just to the right of that, you can see in the bottom right corner, which we love having a nursery, we're thankful, we love having kids on campus, but there's just a reality that it's almost never used. It's really only used twice a year, so that's really unutilized space. And then in the very top left of this existing layout, you can see if you really squint, <laughs> and if you're sitting at the front, you can see there's two office spaces there. So one of the, one, another way that we've sought to just prepare to use the space better is we're actually taking all of our staff, minus our librarian, because Mr. Wartman does need to stay in the library. Um, librarians exist in the library. Can't, you can't take them out. But we have taken other staff members that we used to have working downstairs, and we've actually brought them upstairs. So we've reutilized, in, in or almost getting ready for this moment, we've already reutilized space upstairs so that we can na now dedicate this library wing completely to study space, book space, uh, library operation space. So that's our existing layout. Let's move to what we're proposing. So now we've got color. So the new, the new, <laughs> the new library's gonna have color, no. This is just a more helpful way to look at it. But you can see now in that bottom right section when you walk in that entryway, you're actually walking into a larger room. We've moved the receptionist down into the front entrance. Makes sense, a good place to put a receptionist. And then you head left into open study space where it says study. There's casual study space there, some couches, tables. Um, and then now that corridor that's just north of that, or just above that, and called the reading gallery, which was once our uh, corridor is now got four tables, four, eight, 16 uh, people can study in there. And you've seen that we've actually taken out some of the walls. So we've had a construction management company come in, evaluate the walls, and found a very cost-effective way to put in some pillars, remove the walls, and just open that space up. If you've ever been to our campus, and if you haven't, there's um, an opportunity to tour it uh, later this, uh, during the dinner break. You, uh, if you've ever been to our campus, you know that on the common side, on the right side of the building, it's very open. So we're essentially, we're planning to do the same thing open it up, which is gonna save us a ton of space for uh, studying. You've got study space at the bottom along the window, which is gonna be the, the place where I would prefer to study if I, like, if I get there early enough and I wrestle students out of their spots, which I won't do. Um, and then in the bottom left, you can see compact shelving, some carrels there, and up to the top, some more private study space. So just talking about the compact shelving for a minute, you can see that in the bottom left of this screen, um, Movable shelving, it's, a lot of libraries use it. It's just a way to get a lot more books in a very small space. So that's another way that we're gonna be able to open up the space, because you'll see in the top left, we have this now classroom that can fit 50 people. Um, it's really off in the corner, it's really off on its own, so it's ideal for a classroom. We don't want it to disrupt the library, we don't want the library to disrupt the classes, so that's a perfect place for a classroom. And then we've got the library and up at the top, bookstore, and then Log College Press on the top right which if you're not familiar with Log College Press, you received two books from them when you came in. It is a ministry of Greenville Seminary and something that we're thankful to be a part of, reprinting the best of American Presbyterianism, and there's more books coming from them soon. So this is what we're proposing. Now, I'll move on from here, but during the Q&A, we'll bring this slide back up in case you have any specific questions about how we came to this uh, design right here. But we'll move on.
So this is just for those of you who have never been to our campus. And again, if you haven't, I encourage you to visit anytime. We'd love to have you there. So this is a picture of our current library space, um, which we're very thankful to the Lord for. We're very thankful for what we have. But this is, you can go to the next slide, what we're proposing. Just a much more open space, using that corridor, less walls, more breathable, a little more inviting, and will just be a great place to study. Here we have our current front entrance. So you heard me mention before, there's no receptionist. It's a bit narrow. You're not really sure where to go. And then you can move to the next slide. This is what we're proposing. So we'll be taking some of that nursery space that we never used before, putting a receptionist there, which would be great for when we have prospective students visit. Um, we have a lot of people that will show up right now in the front door. They don't know where to go. We find them upstairs wandering the halls. <laughs> and uh, we would love to just be hospitable to them. We're in the South. Um, we've got a president from Philadelphia and a vice president from Canada, but we recognize Southern hospitality is important to Greenville Seminary and we want to we want to greet people well and love on them. Does that, you guys say that? I don't know if that's a thing. Um, that's an example of what we're hoping the front entrance would be. So which brings us to, well, how much is this going to cost? It's a great idea. Well, hopefully you think it's a great idea. And uh, the question is, what is this going to cost? So right now, we're actually currently uh, working towards a GMP with our contract management company. And he's put out bids to sub. So we're going to have some uh, really, like, accurate numbers in the next couple weeks, but this is our proposed budget, which currently carries about a 30% contingency. So we've really tried to bake into this budget um, the maximum amount of money that we need, not the minimum that we need, so that we don't have to come back to raise, it, to raise more money later. And you'll see at the very top, construction costs are about $750,000. There's some design fees, some field contingencies, but then furnishings and equipment is quite expensive as well. There's $200,000 in there for furniture. Imagine what you could do in your house for $200,000 of furniture. But once you start to add up all the chairs and the tables and the carrels and all the things that you need that will last, that are built to last, so not Ikea furniture, which I've, my house is full of Ikea furniture, I love Ikea, but stuff that we can put in and just it's there and it can be there for 10 years. Um, it's not cheap. So this is the current budget that we're planning and we feel very comfortable with. And we'll keep moving on. So next steps, we've already begun construction meetings. We've generally laid out what we want. We're looking into furnishings. We're looking into everything. We're starting to make our purchases now so that we can be ready to install things in the middle to the end of the summer. Right after this conference, Mr. Wartman is going to be busy. He's got an action plan with students, and they're going to be moving things out of the current library into our commons. We usually meet in our commons for chapel, so we're going to be meeting for chapel in our classrooms upstairs, but we have an action plan. In fact, there's a couple churches locally that have volunteered to help, and we will have youth groups, and we'll have a, an army of people helping putting books into boxes and moving things and getting them ready. And then, Lord willing, uh, right after graduation in May, we'll begin a 90-day construction period and then be done with construction before the fall semester. So that is our goal. So what do we need? First of all, we need your prayers. Pray for our staff and all the work that we do and that we would get ready for construction with happy hearts and that the Lord would give us strength and perseverance through all the work that needs to be done. Pray that the Lord would provide for us. We trust in him. We know that without his blessing, this will not take place. Um, we need him to build the house where we labor in vain. So pray that the Lord would provide for us. Uh, pray that we'll, in this process, not get dis so distracted by the needs of the building project that we'll forget what's important and lose our focus as an institution. We really do not want this to be a disruption to our student body or to our faculty, and that's why we're trying to do almost all of the construction during the summer, so it's not a distraction. And then pray that the Lord would use this space for his glory and for the building up of the next generation of pastors. Also, I'd like to bring to your attention our financial needs. Currently, we've raised $375,000 for that project, which leaves us with the need to raise another $725,000. So if you're able to contribute to this, if your church or if you have people that you know that would be interested in this, maybe foundations that you're aware of that are interested in giving to this, we're, we're talking with people. We've continued, uh, we've already made many visits and, and uh, several appeals online, but if, you're, if this is something that you're interested in helping with, I would love to speak with you. Dr. Master would love to speak with you. Matt Moore, Director of Advancement, would be more than happy to talk with you. Um, and then you should also know that we have secured a loan so that if we don't raise the entire amount before the project, we can continue to go ahead. So we're thankful for that, but it's still our goal to raise money before uh, this project commences so that we don't have to go into debt. Although we don't have a 
we're not excited about going into debt, but we, we recognize the need is so great. The reality is that in the fall, the students are coming, but it's every indication that we are gonna run out of space in our classrooms, that we won't have a class that's big enough to take them, and that the student experience, the student studying, the ability to just have a place to, to put your ten books, ten books down and set up for the day and get to work is something that we're not offering, and so we are convicted that we need to press forward, so that's why we have that loan, so we can continue to move forward. Construction costs don't get cheaper over time with inflation and availability of construction management and just the market in Greenville going up and the costs going up everywhere. So those are our needs. We can move on to the next slide, which I think is when we're gonna just open things up to questions. So I'll have some men with microphones, and if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll have a, a student come over with a mic, and they are getting the mics, and that way we can hear you and everyone can hear the questions. Here's Matt, thanks. <coughs> Yeah, Pat, uh, I know you're, you're going to start that work when school's out, but nothing ever goes as planned. What's the contingency if it goes over? Because I, yeah, I've been in construction myself, and I know, you know yeah. you're going to run into problems no matter what. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, so the 90 days is actually more than what they're telling us. So we, we think we've built, just like with the budget where we built in the 30% contingency, we haven't built in 30% contingency on that, but it, this, is, this is what we put up there is actually uh, more time than they're telling us it's going to take. So we hope we're being conservative, but as you say, anything can happen, and, and often whatever can happen will happen. So in that event, what we'd probably have to do is, I mean, I don't know what we'd do with the class because... The challenge would be if we have a class, uh, a first year class that's too big for our existing classrooms, what we, our contingency would have been to put it in the commons, although that's not equipped with all the technology we need, but we'd make it work. Um, the tricky part will be the library will be in the commons too. I'm, my guess is that it will be some combination of, of uh, usage of the commons uh, for if in that eventuality. But we are hoping that doesn't happen, of course. We're not... We're, we're, we're trying to plan super conservatively so that, you know, if they tell us it's going to be uh, 75 days and we put 90 days, we hope that that's enough, but, you know, that's, the, it will probably come down to utilizing the commons. The other thing we can do is upstairs, we have two classrooms that are right next to each other and there's a wall that separates them that's a movable wall. We could open that up. Now, there are limitations there because the way the room is set up, it's set up, um, kind of uh, um, sort of, I don't know, so, so that it's uh, longer from side to side than front to back. So you pretty quickly lose sight lines when you open up the, uh, the, the wall, but, but we can get another 15 students probably in there if we need to in a pinch. They, they should still have sight lines. So that, those, those, are the, those are the plans. And the library would just be, the books and all that stuff would just remain in the commons where they're going to be after next week. One more question. Okay, now you said you're going to want to double the amount of volumes in the library. Well, I don't know if we're going to do that, but what? But we'll have space to do it. But but I'm I'm curious. What titles are you looking for to put mm. in, the, in the new library? <laughs> that's uh, that's really a good question for for Andy Wartman. But um, you know we're, we 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 grow the library every year. He has a a. a, a uh, an acquisitions budget that he uses every year. So it's always growing. So he could probably tell you what's on the list. Some of that is, you know, uh, thought through a few years ahead of time. Some of it is a target of opportunity. If libraries um, become available that we didn't know about, um, we'll, we'll work on that. But, but um, I don't know the answer to that question. And the doubling really just means not that we're going to try to double it in 2025. It just means that we can continue to grow at the current rate or even at a higher rate if, if our acquisitions budget grows uh, for a while into the future. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think the other, the other thing about the uh, ability to double our library is one of the things we're trying to express is that we're not like robbing Peter to pay Paul. So we're not like, well, we're taking away all of our shelving space so that we can get study space, which solves one problem but causes another. So with the high density shelving, it's not cheap, but it enables us have the capacity to still double our library space while at the same time achieving all of our goals. So we, 
in a sense, we can have our cake and eat it too, but you have to pay for the cake. Um, and then well, just one quick comment about the 90 days. So you're absolutely right. Man's best laid plans are plans of best, and the Lord knows. Only the Lord knows how long it will take. However, we have been very strategic in, in what we're moving, what we're not moving. So we're not doing any plumbing. We're not moving any major electrical. We're not engaging civil engineers. And our architect has already engaged the city to make sure that we're not going to, there's certain civil proceed, proceedings we won't have to go through. So it's really moving walls, furnishings, light electric, very minor HVAC. And we've already basically secured all the big purchase items, which are the long lead time, uh, time items so that are ready to go. So at the same time, while I say that, I recognize it could still, we can't make any promises, but we have from the beginning made it a goal that we get it done in the summer. So the, the, there's a sense in which that has really informed our entire plan. Other questions? Anything else? Yes. Um, yes and no. Well, not, yeah, it's a li it's all, I guess you're right. That's actually part of the reception area. Yeah, that's kind of part of the reception yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. maybe. Oh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's just the opposite, Corey. It's, it's actually been a real positive for them. I think they would all, I know they would all say that. Uh, because the way it's set up, have you been, have you been over since we did it? Yeah, yeah. You'll see, they're, they're kind of all, they're all closer together. They're in these kind of glass offices. And um, so I think it's actually enabled greater collaboration and uh, yeah, I think they would all say it's been an improvement both in their working conditions, but also in their ability to kind of work together on things. So it's actually, it's been, I think even if we weren't going to do this, we, w we would have wanted to do it, to do what we did. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It is. Yeah. So if you remember... Um, Brenda Benson, ha she was kind of in, in a corner of the reception area. So in one sense, she had a lot of space, but not really. I mean, her real working space was kind of right around her desk. So, um, yeah, I think they all have plenty of space. They all have all they need. It's a, real, it's a really good setup. It's worked extremely well for us. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would imagine he'll be processing it in the commons. Um, I think it would depend on how large and where exactly, you know, w what all the particulars are. It's possible that something like that would be delayed where we just kind of put it in storage until we moved in. I, I don't know. I mean, it would really depend on the size of it. But we will have space this summer. I mean, the good thing is because of our academic schedule, um, the summer obviously is a lighter time in terms of traffic. So the commons has enough space to do a lot of library stuff during the summer. Um, so I, I don't know for sure how he would decide to use it, but if he wanted to, I think he could process something over the summer. Yeah, that's a good question. Anything else? All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming in. I know this is your lunch time, but we really appreciate it. And if you have other questions that you didn't think about um, or, you know, just ideas that you have that you want to share with us, please um, feel free. Talk to Pat. Talk to me. Um, we, we, would, we would love to get your input. And we really, this is not a throwaway kind of thing. We really do ask you to pray for it. Everything we do at the seminary and all of our funding, our budget, everything is from the Lord. And so we ask you to ask him that he'll continue to supply our needs and, and even this need um, for, for an increased uh, library space. So thanks very much. All right.
Well, if you could grab your seat, it's uh, time to begin our next session. As you're getting seated, uh, just a couple announcements for you. Uh, just a reminder that we have our Q&A coming up at 345, and so we'd appreciate if you have any questions from the previous sessions or any questions about missions in the reform world, please use the QR code on the back of your program. Take a picture, your phone will tell you what to do. Fill in those questions, we'd love to hear from you. Just a reminder that that Q&A is at 345. It's in the schedule in your program. You'll notice that it's not in the schedule on the back of your uh, name tag, just because there's no room for it. So just pay it, the, the schedule in the program's got a little more detail. So just keep that in mind, please. Also, just a reminder of some of the optional sessions coming up during the dinner break. We have uh, tours of the seminary commencing at 545. Just drive over to the seminary. It's about five to six minute drive. Uh, come on by if you haven't seen the school for a while. There's some updates you might be interested to see. Or if you've never seen it for the first time, we'd love to show you around our classrooms, some uh, professor's offices. You can just take different books out of professor's offices, and they wouldn't know because they're all sitting here. <laughs> no, um, and uh, we won't do that, but we would might be tempted. Uh, come from seminary tours at 545. They'll begin at 545. If you don't get over there till 6, it'll probably be another one starting every 15 minutes. So come on by. We'd love to host you in that way. And then also there's a pastoral search and internship meeting at 6 p.m. in the cave. And just a reminder, the cave is underneath the, the dining hall. And that's for pastors looking for a call, pastors looking for potentially a future intern or an associate pastor, or maybe there's a church that's looking to church plant and they're looking to call a new graduate. We're encouraging all of our students who do not have a call to attend as well, and we'll, we'll keep the agenda short and just give you guys lots of, not, lots of time to talk and get to know one another. So that'll also be during the dinner break at 6 p.m. in the cave. That's all the announcements for now. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. We want to welcome you back to this afternoon session of the Greenville Seminary Conference. Uh, this afternoon we'll have the opportunity to be hearing from Reverend Caleb Cangelosi, who will be our speaker, speaking on John Layton Wilson. Uh, Reverend Cangelosi is a teaching elder with the PCA. He serves as the pastor of Pear Orchard PCA, which is just outside of Jackson, Mississippi. He's a graduate of uh, LSU, which those of you from South Carolina, is the other school that happens to have tigers as their mascot. <laughs> I say this is someone who ministers 10 minutes outside of Clemson University. He got his MDiv at Reform Seminary and a THM at Puritan Seminary for years now. He's been a friend of Greenville Seminary, and in particular, he uh, serves us and the broader church well as the founder of Log College Press, and he serves as the general editor uh, for that here at the seminary. He and his wife, Elizabeth, have five children. He'll be speaking on John Layton Wilson. And one of the things I really love about Reverend Cangelosi is he has a love for the 19th century and for the old paths, but showing how much vitality there is for us to read and benefit and apply to us today. And so we're eagerly looking forward uh, to his talk for us this afternoon. As we begin, let us take our programs in hand and turn to 148B, standing as we sing, Hallelujah, praise Jehovah.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we rejoice to be able to pray back to you the promises that you've made to us in Christ and sealed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit in the precious gospel. We thank you, O Lord, that you have told us the fields are white unto harvest and that you have promised you will send forth laborers. And so we pray as we have been thinking and meditating and learning on the great mission of the church and the call to missions. Indeed, O Lord, you would bless each and every one of us who are gathered here today. We pray, O Lord, according to your promises, that you would thrust forward workers into the harvest. We pray that if there's any here who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ savingly, perhaps some of our covenant young children, O Lord, through the preaching and teaching that you might call them savingly to yourself even this day. Lord, we pray that you might raise up even one man to go forth to the call of missions, church planting here or around the world. O oh Lord, we rejoice to hear about the mission that Christ gave to the church and to think about your power to fulfill it. And we pray now, asking with great anticipation that you and your spirit would be with Reverend Cangelosi and that as he speaks to us about John Layton Wilson, we might be encouraged to be faithful in our generation to the call of Christ. Do this and much more, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much. It is a joy and a privilege uh, to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I am uh, thankful, so thankful for Greenville Seminary and uh, particularly its acquiring Law College Press so that uh, the work of, of publishing uh, the writings of and about our 18th and 19th century American Presbyterian forefathers can uh, go forth with even uh, greater zeal and uh, efficiency and uh, a greater uh, reach around the world. And so it's a, a joy uh, to see the first hardback uh, copies of, of some Log College Press titles uh, or the giveaways. Uh, so excited to see those finally uh, in print. Um, I want to talk to you tonight, uh, today, this afternoon, about a man named John Layton Wilson. Uh, Layton Wilson is how uh, he was known during his lifetime, and I'm going to be using uh, that, that name, Leighton, or Dr. Wilson, or Wilson. Uh, but I want us to start on March 4th, 1831. The 53-year-old Dr. John Holt Rice, the first professor of theology at Union Theological Seminary in Virginia, he mailed an envelope on that day uh, to the 34-year-old Professor Charles Hodge at Princeton Theological Seminary. The two men were friends. Uh, inside this envelope, uh, was a draft of an overture regarding foreign missions that John Holt Rice had dictated to his secretary from his sickbed about six months before he passed away. Uh, he wanted the professors at Princeton to look over this draft, this overture, and to submit it to the upcoming General Assembly on his behalf. In this overture, uh, Dr. Rice lamented how little the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America had done directly to that point in its 42-year history uh, regarding foreign missions to spread Christ's gospel to all the world. And, and in this overture, he set forth a series of resolutions, actions that he believed would help to rectify this situation. Specifically, uh, Dr. Rice wanted the Presbyterian Church to set up its own committee of foreign missions and not merely outsource its missions efforts to the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the ABC-FM. Uh, this overture was submitted to the General Assembly, and as good Presbyterians, uh, the Assembly voted to refer it to a committee uh, that would uh, bring back the next year recommendation. Uh, well, unfortunately, the 1832 General Assembly uh, voted not to change the way that it conducted missions, nor to take any opinion on the principles contained in the report, the recommendation of the committee. It wouldn't be until the 1835 and 1836 General Assemblies that the substance of Dr. Rice's resolutions were adopted and foreign missions uh, would finally begin to be conducted directly by the General Assembly. And if you're familiar with your American Presbyterian Church history, you know that the years 1835, 1836, 1837, right, that's the height of the old school, new school controversy. And, and this question of, of how will we do missions and who will do missions uh, was at the, the center of those disagreements. When Dr. Rice mailed 
uh, that envelope, those resolutions to Dr. Hodge, a 22-year-old young man from South Carolina was just beginning uh, his training as a part of the first graduating class at the newly formed Columbia Theological Seminary in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, by the time that the General Assembly uh, approved Dr. Rice's resolutions and, and formed its own uh, Board of Foreign Missions, this young man who had just been married uh, was now a missionary in Africa, having been sent by, ironically enough, the ABC FM. Uh, but in due time, uh, he would become an assistant secretary of the Board of Foreign Missions of the Presbyterian Church in the USA. Uh, he would eventually become the secretary of the Committee of Foreign Missions of the Presbyterian Church in the United States, the Southern Presbyterian Church. And of course, I'm referring, this young man, I'm referring to John Layton Wilson. Uh, I want this morning to introduce, this afternoon, to introduce him to you and then to draw some lessons about missions from his ministry. But let me just say from the outset uh, that it is impossible for me to convey all uh, that, that you uh, could know or need to know uh, about this father of Presbyterian missions in 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, he was a large man in every way. He was large in stature. Uh, he was large in intellectual and vocational capacity. Uh, he was large in spirit. He lived a large life. He was large in stature. He, he stood six feet two inches tall. He was broad-shouldered and full-chested. He was large in intellectual and vocational capacity. He was a pioneer foreign missionary. He was a church planner, an evangelist. He was a pastor, a preacher. He was a linguist, reducing to writing two African languages. He was an ethnologist, writing what David Livingstone uh, said was the best book ever written on everything you could have known and wanted to know about Western Africa. He was a naturalist. He was the, the first Westerner uh, to discover the existence of the gorilla and sent the first gorilla skeleton uh, to a natural history museum, I believe, in England. Uh, he was a local doctor treating malaria and other illnesses. He was a statesman as a missionary. He had dealings with both the British and the French governments. In 1851, as we'll see, his pamphlet on the slave trade was instrumental in ending the slave trade along the, the western coast of Africa. Uh, he was an administrator of foreign and sometimes national missions. He was an author of books and articles and pamphlets and missions magazines and newspapers and letters upon letters upon letters upon letters. Uh, he was a large man in, in all that the Lord gifted him to do. He was large in spirit. He was full of faith, full of love for Jesus, full of love for the lost, love for the poor across all racial lines, full of kindness and humility, endurance and courage, full of conviction and belief. And above all, he was full of wisdom. Charles Hodge told another pastor that Dr. Leighton Wilson was the wisest man in the Presbyterian church and had more of the apostolic spirit than anyone I ever knew. When Leighton Wilson left the north to return home at the beginning of the war between the states, Charles Hodge remarked, the wisest man among us has gone out. Leighton Wilson lived a large life. He lived to the age of 77 he lived a life full of useful service to the Lord, uh, to the world, to the church. Uh, one who served with him in the foreign missions office put it like this. He served the great cause which the master made great and laid upon the hands and hearts of his church under a worldwide commission and a precious promise of his own presence. I think Dr. and Mrs. Wilson had as large and loving interest in this cause as any persons I have ever known. We can divide the life of Leighton Wilson into four seasons. First, his youth and preparation for ministry, 1809 to 1833. A second, his missionary labors on the coast of Western Africa in Liberia and the Gabon, 1834 to 1852. A third, his service as assistant secretary of foreign missions in New York City for the old school Presbyterian Church, 1853 to 1861. And then finally, his service in South Carolina and in Maryland as the Secretary of Foreign Missions for the Southern Presbyterian Church, 1861 to 1884, a year and a half before he died. For over 50 years, he devoted his life to bringing the gospel to the nations. And unfortunately, like the vast majority of our American Presbyterian forefathers and foremothers, uh, he is almost entirely forgotten. 
It's amazing. I don't want to take anything away from John Payton. I've read John Payton to my children. But is it not amazing how probably everyone in this room has heard of John Payton? And yet the exact same century, both foreign pioneer foreign missionaries, and yet raise your hand if you know have ever heard of John Layton Wilson, right? Just a handful, just a handful. A prophet is not without honor except in his own country. That's what it often seems with these American Presbyterian forefathers. And so it is my joy to, to open up his life and his ministry to you. Uh, we're just going to scratch the surface, as I said. Uh, and so if you want more detail, I do encourage you, eventually at some point this year, Log College Press is going to be uh, publishing the memoirs of John Layton Wilson, published by Hampton DeBose, a missionary to China, as well as a volume of his selected writings. You can also find a chapter on Wilson and Henry Alexander White's 1911 volume, Southern Presbyterian Leaders. Uh, you can find a chapter in John Miller Wells's 1936 Southern Presbyterian Worthies, as well as a book that is for sale here, if there are any copies left, David Calhoun's 2020 Swift and Beautiful, a collection of sketches about foreign missionaries. Also, uh, Southern Presbyterian scholar Erskine Clark, about a decade ago, wrote an entire book about uh, Jane and Leighton Wilson and their African mission entitled By the River of Waters, By the Rivers of Waters. And so I commend that to you as well. So let's think first, who was Leighton Wilson and what did he do? Or, or better said, what did God do through him? Wilson's ancestors were godly Scotch-Irish Presbyterians who arrived on the shores of America in 1734, settling in Williamsburg County, South Carolina. Eventually, some of those early families made their way up the Black River to form a community called Salem, uh, northeast of Sumter, South Carolina, in Lee County, uh, just north of what is now the town of Maysville, about 170 miles southeast of Greenville. Uh, if Mel, is Mel Duncan here? If Mel Duncan were here, he would uh, say what uh, Dr. Hamilton said, you should be embarrassed if you don't know uh, where those cities are in, uh, in South Carolina. I, for one, am embarrassed. I don't know exactly where those cities are. I could find them on a map. Uh, they're, they're somewhere in this great state. God sent Leighton uh, into the world uh, on March 25th, 1809, the fifth of eight children born to William and Jane James Wilson. They lived in a house called Pine Grove. Uh, William, Leighton's father, was a planner by trade, a faithful elder in the Mount Zion Presbyterian Church. Leighton grew up a country boy on his father's farm before it became a full-fledged plantation. Uh, he grew up with all the skills and all the strength and joy that a childhood in the field and the forest afford. But his childhood was also marked by grief, as his mother died at the age of 37 when he was eight years old, and William was left a widower with seven children from ages 15 to three. Leighton was educated at a school near his father's plantation, and then in Springville near Florence, and then at the age of 16, he went to Winsboro to Mount Zion High School. The next logical step in his education would have been uh, to attend South Carolina College in Columbia. Uh, but when the time came to make the college decision, uh, the president of that flagship institution was a man named Thomas Cooper. He was a militant Unitarian. Uh, and so in 1827, Leighton's father sent him not to South Carolina College, but to Union College in Schenectady, New York, where he entered the junior class. And God's providence not only was Leighton guarded from heresy, uh, but he also was able to begin a friendship with a young man named John Bailey Adger from Charleston. Uh, Adger eventually went to study at Princeton Seminary. Uh, he was instrumental uh, in Wilson's decision to go to the mission field. Both men would become foreign missionaries. Adger went to Armenia, and both men would become pillars of the Southern Presbyterian Church. Leighton graduated from Union College in 1829. He returned to South Carolina that fall. We don't have a lot of information about how the Lord led him to the ministry, but we do know that, that when he returned from Union College, uh, he spent time studying under his uncle, the Reverend Dr. J Robert Wilson James, uh, who was pastoring the Salem Black River Presbyterian Church. And then he spent some time teaching at a small school in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, uh, while studying theology with Dr. Aaron Leland who eventually became a professor of theology at Columbia Seminary. Adger tells us in a letter that Wilson's religious affections were at a low ebb post-graduation. Uh, he had become a communion member uh, as a youth, 
but at least one of his biographers thinks that, that even after college he was not yet converted. Whatever the case might be, it's clear that God graciously used the preaching of the word to awaken him more deeply to his own sinfulness and to eternity, uh, to give him a feeling sense of the love of God in Jesus Christ. He was particularly impacted by a series of evening revival services at the Circular Church in Charleston, which at the time was pastored by Benjamin Morgan Palmer, the uncle in the namesake of uh, the famous Southern Presbyterian pastor in Columbia and New Orleans. And, and so these, these years immediately post-college uh, became a season of great spiritual growth uh, for the young man as the Lord prepared his heart for the work of ministry by humbling him, uh, by rooting him more deeply in grace and assurance and making the gospel come alive to him. Perhaps you too have had an experience like that. You were converted in early age. Uh, you knew you were a Christian, but at some point, maybe in high school or in college or right after college, uh, the Lord uh, deepened your, your faith, your understanding of the gospel, the doctrines of grace, uh, opened your eyes to things that you perhaps had heard all your life, but now you saw them in a new and a fresh way. And it was through that experience of, of deepening your knowledge of sin, your knowledge of his grace, that he perhaps called you into ministry or called you in some different direction in your life. Well, that's the way it was for, for Leighton Wilson. It was January of 1831 when he entered Columbia Theological Seminary. He was a member of the first graduating class with six students. Uh, there was a, a deep interest in foreign missions from the very beginning of the seminary. And as soon as he arrived on campus, a fellow classmate named James Merrick, who would eventually become a missionary to Muslims in Iran, uh, Persia, uh, they formed a Society of Missionary Inquiry uh, through the influence of Professor George Howe at the seminary, as well as Merrick and Adger up in Princeton. Uh, Wilson's heart was stirred to be a missionary. He wrote his sister in January 1832, I have looked at the subject now for more than a year. And there appears to me stronger reasons for my becoming a missionary than for many who go. And one of considerable importance is that our family, those dearest to me on earth, have been made the subjects of grace already. Are we not laid under infinite obligations to him who has loved us with an everlasting love? And ought I now to hesitate about obeying his command, go teach all nations? I do not think of going away to a foreign country because there is nothing to be done at home but because there is more to be done in those places where the Christian religion is unknown. If I had them at my disposal, he says, I could put more than 100 ministers to work in South Carolina, but I could set 500,000 to work in the missionary field. And so at the end of 1832, the 23-year-old set his face to go to that mission field. He began to communicate with the ABC FM, which, as we said, was the primary sending agency for Presbyterian missionaries in those days, uh, for some time, that board had been wanting to send missionaries to Africa, particularly young men uh, from the South, uh, thought that they would do better in the climate. And so Leighton was a perfect match. Not only had he grown up in the South, he had grown up around the sons and daughters of Africa there in South Carolina. Uh, as well, his uncle, Robert James, uh, had demonstrated a profound interest in the spiritual condition of the slaves of South Carolina, and he played a large role in Leighton's own heart to reach Africans for Christ. In a letter to his future wife, Jane Baird, in December of 1832. He writes, I cannot be induced to turn away my eyes from Africa. My heart is fixed upon that injured, neglected people, and I rejoice that yours is also. If Englishmen can penetrate the heart of the country for wealth, shall we not go for the love of Christ? Now, though Leighton desired to go, his family uh, thought it was not a wise thing, was not the best idea. His father in particular, uh, the thought of seeing his son leave uh, for Africa was difficult. In another letter to Jane in December of 1832, he told her that his father regarded his determination to go to Africa as a judgment upon himself for having loved this boy too much. Egbert Watson Smith, who was the PCUS Secretary of Foreign Missions from 1911 to 1932, tells the great story of, of Leighton returning home that winter break as his father still refused to give his consent. And Smith writes this, Father, said Leighton, would you be willing to go into the room and pray with me? And so they began, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Smith says, The Father could not go beyond that petition. 
Brought face to face with the world embracing affections and purposes of God, he could not hold to any little contrary ambition of his own. Slipping his arm around his son's shoulder, he told him he could go. Following several months in the north in 1833, studying Arabic at Andover Seminary and getting to know the ABCFM leaders, uh, he was ordained in September of 1833 by Harmony Presbytery at his home church. In November of that year, he sailed to Liberia with the Maryland Colonization Society to explore possible sites for a mission. Uh, the society was about to plant a colony at Cape Palmas in the town now known as Harper. Uh, it was 250 miles south of Monrovia, the, uh, the capital of Liberia, uh, and he wanted, uh, the colony wanted to plant a, a mission there as well, along with the colony. Uh, Wilson on this journey concluded that that site was indeed uh, the most suitable spot for a mission, and so he returns to the States and to his beloved Jane in April of 1834. I've mentioned Jane several times. Let's hear a little bit about her. It was toward the end of 1832 uh, that having failed to win the heart of John Bailey Adger's sister, Margaret, who ended up marrying Thomas Smythe, uh, he uh, then began to court Miss El Jane Elizabeth Bayard. Uh, she was from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, she was five years younger than Leighton was, so in 1832 she was uh, 18. Uh, she was the granddaughter of General Lachlan McIntosh, a noted American Revolution uh, hero. Uh, she was also a cousin of Charles Hodge. Uh, Jane and her younger sister Margaret were orphaned uh, when she was 13, and after their conversions, the Lord laid it on their hearts uh, to be missionaries to the Sandwich Islands, now known as the Island of Hawaii. Uh, DeBose, uh, Leighton Wilson's biographer, tells us that when these two young ladies applied to be sent by the American board, uh, they were not accepted because it, at that point it was deemed unwise to send unmarried ladies to the foreign field. So as you can imagine, they uh, quickly caught the eye of men who sensed God's call to be missionaries also. Uh, Margaret ended up marrying James Eckerd. Uh, they went to India. Leighton Wilson pursued Jane. And they were married on May 22nd, 1834. Leighton was 25 and, and Jane was 20. Unfortunately, in God's providence, they were never able to have any children, uh, perhaps the result of the, of the malarial fevers that they experienced upon their arrival in Africa and at multiple times uh, throughout their 18 years there. Uh, but also in God's providence, they had uh, the blessing of having hundreds of students uh, in the, the African schools that they started and planted there in Africa. And, and after returning to the States, uh, they were able to adopt two daughters, one in the 1850s, a seven-year-old whose mother had passed away on the mission field and the father uh, was not able to, to take care of her. And so he sends her back across the ocean to, 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 the, to uh, Leighton and Jane Wilson and asks them to adopt her and to take her in as, as their own. And they did that. And then later in 1870, another orphan pastor's daughter named Alice Johnson uh, was adopted by them and, and she cared for them in their old age. And so the Lord was gracious to them, uh, even though they themselves could not have their own children. Uh, so after they're married in May of 1834, they sail for Liberia that November. Uh, their first six months or so were spent getting uh, acclimated to their new home. Just another way of saying they suffered greatly and regularly from malarial fevers. At one point in March of 1835, Leighton nearly died. In August 1836, he writes this. Since I wrote last, our general health has been good, and we have been subjected to little or no inconvenience on account of sickness. When I say good health, you must not understand me as speaking of what you would call in America good health, but good African health. We have frequent attacks of chills and fevers, but we're not confined to our rooms for more than a few hours and are able the next day to resume our duties. There at Cape Palmas, they spent seven years preaching the gospel to the villages around the mission, planning a church of 30 to 40 members, establishing a school for the native children, learning the Grebo language, reducing it to writing, printing a grammar, a dictionary, and the gospels of Matthew and John. Unfortunately, the conflicts between the native Africans and the African-American colonists who had come with the Maryland Colonization Society uh, had a negative impact on the work of the mission. Uh, and so Wilson and the other missionaries who had uh, joined him uh, by that point ended up relocating their work to the Gabon, uh, south of Liberia, uh, in the summer of 1842, near modern-day Libreville uh, on the Gabon estuary, the northern part of the country. Uh, here he ministered for 10 years. 
So he's got seven years there in uh, Liberia, uh, 10 years in the Gabon. He doesn't take his first furlough uh, until 1847, uh, the first time he returned back home. Uh, there in the Gabon, he preached the gospel. He mastered uh, both the Mpongwe language and the Batanga language. He printed parts of the Bible in Mpongwe. He explored the western African coastlands. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm running over uh, such an important part of his life there uh, in uh, Africa. And so, again, I encourage you to, to spend time looking and reading uh, more about Leighton Wilson and his work in Africa. It was the summer of 1852 uh, when, due to severe liver issues, Leighton and Jane decided to come home for another furlough uh, to rest among family, to see doctors about his medical condition. Uh, the doctors recommended that he spend some time in the mountain air that fall uh, and then in the winter, he traveled back home to South Carolina, where he was able to spend time with John Adger, uh, to see the work that he and John Lafayette Gerardo had started in Charleston for the slaves, uh, the work that would soon become Zion Presbyterian Church. Uh, during that season, he was regaining his strength. He thought that he might be able to go back to Africa, but there was a, a serious setback when his liver illness rose up again, and he realized that, that his time in Africa was, was done. His presbytery sent him as a commissioner to the 1853 General Assembly, and while he was there, uh, he was nominated and elected to be the third secretary of the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions in New York City, along with Walter Lowry and his son, uh, John Lowry. Imagine the culture shock uh, to go from a, a thatched cottage on coastal Africa one year into a large house in Upper Manhattan the next year. Uh, during the eight years that he spent in this role as assistant secretary, he, he served as the recording clerk, as it were. He uh, edited the home and foreign record for the board. He dealt with logistics and budgets. He visited churches and presbyteries and synods and general assemblies. He hosted missionaries on furloughs. He visited seminaries, uh, seeking to recruit men to the foreign field. Uh, he was the primary contact for the missionaries in Africa, as well as for the Indian nations in the United States. Uh, in the late 1850s, when a majority of the, the Board of Foreign Missions was opposed to sending Asheville Green Simonton to Brazil on the grounds that Romanism was already the established religion, it would be a waste of, of time and effort and money, uh, Dr. Wilson advocated strongly for sending Simonton, and the Board changed its mind. Uh, though Simonton died of malaria in 1867, only after, after only eight years on the field, uh, he is still... Uh, considered the father of Presbyterianism uh, in Brazil. The mission continued to prosper even after his death. Uh, and so Wilson's time in New York, that, that, that decade of the 1850s, gave him valuable experience for his life's final chapter in the South. The storms of war were gathering over the nation after the election of Abraham Lincoln in November of 1860, and Wilson was struggling mightily within. On the one hand, he desired and prayed for earnestly the preservation of the entire union, uh, yet to Dr. Dabney's chagrin, uh, he had sympathies for the secession movement in South Carolina. In February 1861, with tears and trembling, he spoke these words to a friend. My brother, we know now what is before us. You see the great power and the tremendous forces of the North, their intense hatred of secession and the fixed determination to crush the South if they do not yield to the federal government. I pray God to avert the storm and save us from the hands of civil war, but if it comes, my mind is made up. I will go and suffer with my people. Now, in some ways, Wilson's choice is understandable. He was a South Carolinian. Uh, most of his family was here in this great state. But when you consider Wilson's previous opinions and actions regarding slavery, you see how complicated, how conflicted that decision must have been. In a letter to Jane during their courtship in the early 1830s, he writes this, I hold that every human being who is capable of self-government and would be happier in a state of freedom ought to be free. I am not, however, a friend of immediate and universal emancipation for the simple reason that all are not ready for freedom and would be worse off in that than in their present condition. And so in line with these views, Wilson did free the slaves that he and Jane inherited from the death of their parents. Now Jane owned 30 slaves after her parents died. And before she and Leighton left for Africa, they made preparations for their eventual emancipation. Uh, South Carolina and Georgia at that time had laws on the books that made it illegal 
for newly freed slaves to remain in the state. And so the Wilsons left it up to the slaves themselves to decide whether they wanted to join the colonization movement to Liberia, remain in America but go to the north, or remain enslaved by choice in order to remain in South Carolina. In the case of Jane's slaves, the vast majority chose to sail to Liberia along with Layton and Jane. By legal inheritance from his deceased mother, Layton himself had become the owner of two slave boys named John and Jesse when he turned 21. When he leaves for Africa, they are 11 and 5 years old, and Wilson did not want to free them, and, and because of the South Carolina laws, forced them to leave South Carolina, forced them to be removed from their mother, uh, who at the time belonged to his father, and so he leaves them enslaved. Several times after he arrives in Africa, uh, he desired to freedom. He desired John the Older to, to move north or to come to Africa, but John refused. He refused to leave South Carolina. Uh, during Wilson's time in Liberia, as abolitionism was on the rise in the United States, uh, his circumstances become an issue uh, with the supporters of the American board, which is, again, is based in the north, in New England. Uh, Layton has to defend what he had done to try to free his slaves. He was denounced as a vile slaveholder in the north, uh, but in the South, he was accused of being an abolitionist. In a letter to Rufus Anderson, the secretary of the American board, he writes this, I desire no profit in any form from their labors. Those who immigrated to Africa were brought here at private cost, involving an expense of several thousand dollars. The only object I have in alluding to this fact, he says, is to show that I am not a slaveholder for the sake of gain, and that so far as I have funds to dispose of in the cause of humanity, they have been appropriated cheaply to promote the happiness and the comfort of those who have been in bondage. I do not see it my duty to use force, he says. John and Jesse have the liberty of choosing for themselves, and I have endeavored to communicate such light and information as will enable them to choose wisely. This seems to me the best liberty that is in my power to confer. If I withdraw my protection from them and allow them to become public property, it seems to be very questionable whether I'm in the line of duty. Eventually, in 1843, he did set the two boys free, but he, he wrote his father, if John and Jesse would go to one of the free states, I would be greatly pleased. But if they prefer to remain on the plantation and work as heretofore, let them do so, but with the understanding that they may leave whenever they choose to do so. They did choose to remain on the Wilson plantation, but they lived quietly as free men, uh, so the authorities would not send them away. While Wilson served in Africa, his opposition to slavery only grew, in particular uh, because of what he saw and witnessed firsthand with regard to the evil of the slave trade. Uh, though illegal since 1807 in Britain and 1808 in America, the slave trade still persisted in large part because of the Western powers who created the market for slaves and also because of the Africans who were eager to sell their enemies or even their friends into slavery for financial gain. In 1836, he described speaking uh, to two African men who had just sold a slave, and he, he said, I asked them if they did not think it wrong to capture and sell their fellow men as slaves. And they said, no, no white man has told us that it's wrong. And Wilson writes, how affecting to trace the footsteps of white men in Africa. I have reference, he says, to slave dealers who form the great majority of those who have visited her shores. Their footsteps are to be traced in wars and bloodshed, and tumults, and distress, and misery, and everything that can degrade and render savage the heart of man. In 1842, he writes his wife Jane from the Gabon, I have visited all the settlements on the river in this immediate vicinity. There was one scene in these excursions which particularly affected my heart. I refer to the interior of an African slave factory on the opposite side of the river. I cannot enter into detail but suffice it to say, my curiosity will never prompt me again to visit a similar scene of human degradation. Think of 430 naked savages of both sexes, of all ages, sizes, and conditions, brought together in one enclosure, chained together in gangs of 20, 30, or 40, and all compelled to sleep on the same platform, eat out of the same tub, and in almost every respect live like so many swine. More than this, on the middle passage, they must have quarters still more circumscribed and live on much scantier fare. God reigns, and this vile traffic in human beings must come to an end. 
Now, certainly many felt as Wilson did in those days, but very few had the opportunity to impact the slave trade like he did. One of the wonderful episodes in his labors as a missionary was how the Lord used him to bring an end to the slave trade. In 1851, the British were planning to withdraw uh, their fleet from the African coast, the the ships that were were seeking to keep slave trading at bay. Wilson heard of this, and he writes a a paper uh, on this topic and and mails it to a wealthy friend in London who then sent it uh, to a British lord. In this paper, Wilson uh, demonstrates that the squadron had accomplished much, uh, and rather than uh, taking it away, it, it should be continued and it should be strengthened. Uh, He advocated for the fastest ships to be sent to the African coast, faster than the slave ships, so that they could not outrun the British ships. Uh, He advocated for more ships to be sent to the African coast. Uh, Eventually, 10,000 copies of his pamphlet uh, were published and distributed, and his recommendations were heeded. And yet, in spite of all his resistance, all his antipathy to slavery over those decades, he still chose to suffer with his people. The 1861 General Assembly meets in Philadelphia in May, just a month after uh, Fort Sumter had been fired upon. The Civil War had already begun. Uh, Dr. Wilson was present, uh, though not as a commissioner, since his South Carolina Presbytery uh, had not sent any commissioners. He was present when Dr. Gardner Spring, who happened to be his and Jane's very own pastor, uh, offered up the fateful resolution uh, that uh, passed by a vote of 154 to 66 and led to the withdrawal the 47 Southern Presbytery. Wilson and Jane make their way south. In August of 1861, we find him in Atlanta at a convention to plan the formation of the Presbyterian Church in the Confederate States of America, eventually the PCUS. Uh, Wilson's desire was to make sure that the new denomination was fully committed to missions, particularly foreign missions. The problem, of course, was that there was a federal blockade preventing any ship from leaving the cities of Savannah or Charleston or Mobile or New Orleans. Fortunately, the nations were in the bounds of the southern states. Wilson already had a history with them, with the Choctaws and the Cherokee and the Creek and the Chickasaw Indian tribes and what would eventually become Oklahoma. Uh, When he had been working with the Old School Church's Board of Missions, he had been the the spokesman, the representative, the contact for these Indian tribes. The board had sent missionaries to those tribes, uh, but with the start of the war, they had gone back north. Now Wilson says, this is our call as a southern church to send missionaries, to be involved in bringing the gospel uh, to the tribes. And so he goes in October 1861, in between that August meeting and the first assembly, he goes to visit these tribes and he pledges the support of the Southern Presbyterian Church. When the first General Assembly meets in Augusta, Georgia on December the 4th, 1861. Uh, Wilson is elected as the secretary of this new foreign missions committee. Uh, It's located in Columbia. Uh, The committee of domestic missions had been placed in New Orleans, but uh, with the capture of that city in 1863, all of a sudden uh, that committee cannot do its work. And so Wilson also becomes the the, the, the secretary, the, the, the coordinator uh, of uh, the national missions, domestic missions as well. Uh, he immediately makes plans to send uh, pastors and chaplains to every brigade in the Confederate Army. After the war is over, uh, with all number of sons and fathers of the Southern Presbyterian Church having died in the war, churches destitute, Wilson steps up. Uh, Hampton DeBose, his biographer, calls him the Southern Chalmers of the Disruption. He writes this, no sooner did the bugle call to battle cease to be heard than he seized the gospel trumpet and with its clarion note summoned the church to action. He was a cheerful, hopeful leader and his presence inspired faith and courage. He breathed upon the church the spirit of consecration. He awoke the slumbering energies of the people to fresh resolve. He gladdened the low-spirited and encouraged the faith. Combining, until 1872, the functions of secretary both of home and foreign missions, his office became the connectional center of the church. As a corresponding agent, he was a chief director of her vast interests. In the southern synods, no one has ever equaled him in the power for good he exerted. And we believe it is impossible in the future for any man to obtain the position of commanding influence that he exercised during the 10 years following our civil struggle. 
For those 24 years that he served the Southern Church from 1861 to 1884, his impact for foreign missions in particular uh, was powerful. At a time when it, it would have seemed that all the effort and all the money and all the focus should have been on rebuilding the church at home, uh, Leighton Wilson insisted and ensured that there would be attention on foreign missions. He led the assembly in bringing the gospel to the lost abroad. The work of the Indian tribes was continued. Uh, he sent a man named Elias Inslee, who had already previously been a missionary to China. He sends him back to China. Two missionaries are sent to Brazil. A female teacher living near Wilson's hometown named Mrs. Christina Ruzzini, a native of Italy, was sent to work as a school teacher with the Waldensian church there. A man named Henry Pratt went as a missionary with his family to Colombia in 1869. Michael Kalapathakis, a native of Greece who had been converted in the 1830s by Presbyterian missionaries and had become a Presbyterian pastor in the state of Virginia, returns to Greece as a missionary in 1873. A man named Anthony Graybill and his wife were sent to Matamoros, Mexico in 1874. And in 1885, as he's laying down the mantle of secretary, a missionary is sent to Japan. Unfortunately, his dream of, of seeing missionaries sent from the southern church to Africa only comes to fruition after he dies when Samuel Lapsley and William Shepard are sent to the Congo in 1890. Through his years as the Secretary of Foreign Missions, he visited all of these various missions. He corresponded with the missionaries. He published the newspaper called The Missionary. He recruited new missionaries at the seminaries. He preached among the churches. He raised money for the work through all the ups and downs of post-war financial depressions and yellow fever pandemics. Uh, one quote especially highlights the heart of Leighton Wilson at this time. He writes to Hampton DeBose, It is a hard thing, my dear DeBose, to fill the office of a foreign secretary, to have to stand between a dying world and an indifferent, hesitating church. After a trip to Brazil in 1875, Wilson realized that he needed to be living in a major port city where steamships from the nations came and went and where he could secure a better financial footing for the work of missions. And so in 1876, he and Jane left home once more, this time for Baltimore. He spent the last eight years of his ministry there in Baltimore. Eventually, his body and his mind declined to the point where he realized it was time to resign. In 1884, he and Jane moved back to South Carolina in May of 1885, he submitted his resignation to the General Assembly that was meeting in Houston, Texas. Jane Bayard Wilson passed away two months after that, on July 16, 1885, at the age of 71. Nearly a year later, on July 13, 1886, at the age of 77, the Lord took John Layton Wilson home as well. Uh, DeBose beautifully summarizes his ministry Though loving the church in every branch of her work, yet to him, the one great cause, we might say the one cause, was foreign missions. And trying to awake the energies of God's people to the lost condition of the heathen, all could see that the Savior's last command was the moving spring of his life and labors. It was this intensity of F entrance and the cause of the world's salvation that made his words a power. The great principle which acted as the lever to his ministry was, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. DeBose says, What the work of the Southern Presbyterian Church and the regions of the unbelievers may become in the generations to come, I now hath not seen. But this we may without fear assert, that the place of the father of her foreign missionary work may be assigned to her first secretary. It was his to awaken, to inspire, to plant, to carry onwards, till she had strengthened her stakes and enlarged her coast. As he remarked to the writer, my little universe is foreign missions. So this is John Layton Wilson. There's so much that we can learn from his life and from his ministry, but as we move into this second part of my talk, I, I want us to highlight four lessons from his life and from his ministry. And the first is this. And if you can stick the slide up on the, the screen, we're about to read a quote that I want you to see with your own eyes. The, the first lesson that I want us to learn is this, the vital importance of a church's commitment to foreign missions, foreign missions in particular. 
It was Wednesday, December 11th, a week into the first General Assembly of the Southern Presbyterian Church, an assembly, uh, you should note, that, that lasted for two weeks. All right, we, we kind of get tired, don't we, after you know, three days, but they went for two weeks. And there in the middle of the first week, uh, the Committee on Foreign Missions that had been appointed by the moderator, Benjamin Morgan Palmer, gave its report. Leighton Wilson was not the one giving the report, but he was on the committee and undoubtedly had a, a large hand in writing the report. And I want you to read along with me, as I read out loud, read with me uh, this last paragraph. He writes this, finally, the General Assembly desires distinctly and deliberately to inscribe on our church's banner as she now first unfurls it to the world in immediate connection with the headship of her Lord, his last command. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Regarding this as the great end, the great telos, the great purpose of her organization and obedience to it as the indispensable condition of her Lord's promised presence. And as one great comprehensive object, a proper conception of whose vast magnitude and grandeur is the only thing which in connection with the love of Christ can ever sufficiently arouse her energies and develop her resources so as to cause her to carry on with a vigor and efficiency which true fealty to her Lord demands those other agencies necessary to her internal growth and home prosperity. The claims of this cause ought therefore to be kept constantly before the minds of our people and pressed upon their consciences. And every minister owes it to his people and to a perishing world to give such instruction on this subject as he is able. And to this end, the monthly concert, the monthly concert of prayer, ought to be devoutly observed by every church on the first Sabbath of each month for the purpose of missionary instruction as well as prayer. And it would be well to accompany their prayers with their offerings. To the same end, the assembly earnestly enjoins upon all our ministers and ruling elders and deacons and Sabbath school teachers, and especially upon parents, particular attention to our precious youth and training them to feel a deep interest in this work and not only to form habits of systematic benevolence, but to feel and respond to the claims of Jesus upon them for personal service in the field. And should a Sabbath school paper be established, I've never seen one of those, I'm assuming that they were established, uh, it should one be established, they recommend that at least one page be exclusively devoted to this subject of missions. What a glorious statement. As the first assembly is unfurling its banner, they're putting a stake in the ground that foreign missions will be at the very heart of its labor, the heart of its ministry. The assembly approves this statement. I'm sure it was held but with varying degrees of enthusiasm across the body. But it, it is remarkable to note that this was on their heart as they are sending their sons off to war. There's no question that Wilson believed this statement with all his heart particularly that last part, or the part in the middle. If you'll go back to the bolded statement, I want you to see uh, this, this statement again. It, it's strangely worded, right? It's worded as 19th century Victorians were once to write. Uh, it, it's lots of complicated sen sentences, but, but this is what it's saying. It's only a proper conception of the vast magnitude and grandeur of Jesus' great commission and love for Jesus that can ever sufficiently arouse the church's energies and develop her resources to cause her to carry on all the other ministries that are necessary to internal growth with vigor and efficiency, which fealty to the Lord Jesus demands. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? Do you believe that a passion for foreign missions is the motive force for all the church's other ministry? Do you believe that if you want to see how a church, whether a local church or a denomination, is doing, or what its future prospects hold, you ought to look at their foreign missions budget. You ought to look at their foreign missions program and activity. Who are they supporting? How are they supporting them? How many missionaries are they sending forth? To what degree does foreign missions have a hold on the heart of that church? Pastor, are you keeping the claims of missions before your people and your preaching and your praying? Do you have a prayer meeting? a concert of prayer, a monthly concert for missions. We've started this recently in our church, and what a blessing it is before evening worship on the first Sunday of every month to gather together and to pray through our missionaries, the ministers, 
that we support uh, both foreign, national, local, and the General Assembly uh, committees as the PCA. I would commend that to you. I would love if all the churches that you represent would go home and that we would know that on the first Sunday of every month, right, before the evening worship service, we are gathering together to pray for the spread of the gospel. We're praying for revival. We're praying for the, the gospel to work not only in our own hearts, right, but in our nation, in the world. We're praying for the Lord to send out laborers into the harvest field. The monthly concert was something that the 19th century Presbyterian church was committed to. It began in the 18th century. Jonathan Edwards' work on uh, the, the, the importance of prayer. The church, both in Scotland and in America, was committed to this monthly concert. I would love to see the Lord revive that again in our churches. What about your children? As this statement mentioned at the end, are we seeking to see our children grow in a, a heart and a love for foreign missions? What about our new members? Listen to this quote, this statement from one of those uh, recommendations that John Holt Rice gave to the GA back in 1831. He said this, that it be earnestly recommended to all church sessions and hereafter admitting new members to the churches distinctly to state to candidates for admission that if they join the church, they join a community, the object of which is the conversion of the heathen world and to impress on their minds a deep sense of their obligation as redeemed sinners to cooperate in the accomplishment of this great object of Christ's mission to the world. When we receive new members into our churches, do we tell them that? Welcome. You have joined an organization whose goal is to convert the world. And you, whether you go or whether you stay and pray and give and send, every member has a role to play in this grand and glorious work. The point that this General Assembly statement was making was that if this is the case, if we have this vision of what God is doing through us around the world, then all the other ministries, all the internal ministries, are going to be strong, are going to be vigorous. Right? They will be growing because the Lord blesses the labor at home as we send forth the labors around the world. So that's the first lesson I think we draw, the vital importance of a church's commitment to foreign missions in particular. Second, the nations are here in America. At that first assembly, Wilson did give a report. He gave a report about his journey that summer out to the Native American Indian tribes. In his 1881 memorial address on the history of Columbia Presbyterian Seminary uh, and uh, missions, uh, he notes in that article that uh, during the war and immediately after the war, uh, the Indian missions were all that the church could do. But they did it. They did what they could do. They realized that in God's providence, they didn't have to travel over the oceans to bring the gospel to four nations. The nations were here in their very bounds. This has always been known and seen by Presbyterians and even Congregationalists going back to the 1600s. John Eliot, the Congregationalist Puritan, David Brainerd in the 1700s. To whom did they minister? To the Native Americans here in America. Gideon Blackburn was a pioneer Presbyterian missionary among the Cherokees at Chickamauga in Tennessee in the early 1800s. Cyrus Kingsbury went both to the Cherokees and then to the Choctaw in Mississippi. He went with them as they were forced to migrate out to Oklahoma in the 1830s. When Wilson writes that article in 1881, he tells us that among the Choctaws and the Chickasaws at that time, there were 27 churches, 1,200 members, three ministers from the United States, 10 native ministers, and young men training for the ministry. I've been convicted even working on this presentation that in Mississippi, we have the Choctaw Indian tribe. There's a reservation. Our church has taken mission trips to the Yakima Indian Reservation, but we've never taken a trip to the Choctaw Reservation, about two hours away. The nations are here. And whether you have Indian tribes in your own backyard like we do or not, right, the nations have come to America, brothers and sisters. We know this. We see it every day. Right? International college student outreaches, ESL ministries. If you're in the PCA, RUF International, right, Spanish-speaking Sunday school classes and services, these ought to be viewed as a part of our foreign missions 
efforts. Look around you, wherever you live. See that the nations have come here. See the opportunities you have to minister the gospel to the lost, to those who've never heard the name of Jesus, who've never visited a Christian church. You don't have to go across the world. You can do it even here in your own backyard. Third, Leighton Wilson teaches us how to do missions on the ground. Now, I'll be the first to say I've never been a foreign missionary. I have not reflected as deeply as some of you who are on how missions ought to be done, how missionaries ought to be doing their work. And so I, I give these comments less as, less as authoritative prescription, more as uh, exemplary description based on Leighton Wilson's life and ministry. But I believe that, that what we see in Leighton's ministry is uh, it comports with what the Bible teaches about how to do ministry in general. Uh, so here's what Leighton Wilson would say to us about how we should do missions. First, he would say, preach the word and plant churches, especially and eventually with native pastors. On November 25th, 1843, he writes this from the Gabon. Preaching the gospel, we make our leading business. We maintain, we maintain stated preaching at six different places and occasional services at a still greater number. By 1847, he can write this. Besides the villages nearer to the principal station, where the word of God has been dispensed steadily, there are 15 or 20 settlements more remote where there has been occasional preaching, so that the people over a considerable extent of country have been initiated into the first principles of Christianity, and thus the way has been prepared for more vigorous, systematic, and extended operations hereafter. Wilson's ministry was word-centered. It was gospel-centered, Christ-centered. He saw the mission in Cape Palmas and in the Gabon as the eventual hub and the center of a wheel, a headquarters from which a line of mission stations could extend far into the interior of Africa, converting the lost, educating native preachers to go forth with the word of life in all directions. And so Wilson spent much of his time exploring, traveling into the wilds of Africa, preaching the gospel, looking for strategic locations to plant future churches. Second, Wilson would say, educate the children. Education wasn't just for those that he wanted to train up for ministry. A key part of his mission was a school for the native children. Not only was this highly valued by the native population, it was also a way to preach the gospel uh, to the youngsters, to the youngest, the most malleable of the village. And, and as we see even today, when you win uh, children to Christ, you often end up winning their parents to Christ. Leighton and Jane loved children. The Bose even devotes an entire chapter of his memoirs of Wilson to this fact. Do we see the importance of children on the missions field bringing the gospel to the lost, to boys and girls? Third, as we've already heard this morning from Dr. Hamilton, missionaries must learn, must learn the language, must preach in it, must translate the Bible into it. Wilson, as we've said, has learned, he learned multiple languages and dialects in Africa. In the Gabon, he writes this, besides various elementary books, they have prepared a small hymn book of 48 pages, a volume of simple sermons of 72 pages, a volume of extracts from the New Testament of 82 pages, a volume of Old Testament history. All these are in the Mpongwe language, printed in tol tolerably good style, he says, by a native boy of our own training who's not more than 16 years of age. We prepared for the press a grammar, an extended vocabulary of the Mpongwe, also a small vocabulary and a few familiar sentences in the Batonga language. His linguistic skill, just like Dr. Burns, as we heard this, this morning, was amazing. It goes without saying, as Dr. Hamilton said, right, that the most effective missionaries are going to preach the gospel in the vernacular of those to whom they seek to reach. Wilson would also tell us this, learn the culture. Learn the culture. Right? Not just the language of those who are lost, but learn all you can about them. Right? Wilson's travels up and down the coast of Africa right, into the interior of Africa uh, led him eventually to publish that book lauded by David Livingstone entitled Western Africa. It covered geography and climate and flora and fauna, culture and ethnography, languages, history, religion, the slave trade, Christian missions, the, the Western church's duty to continue to bring the gospel to Africa. And he wasn't learning these things just to, to gather information, but so that he could use it for the sake of, of gaining a hearing for Jesus Christ among the lost. James Merrick, who was Wilson's classmate, who so greatly influenced his decision to become a, a missionary, 
writes this in his farewell address when he goes off to Persia. He writes, It is said of Alexander the Great that when a youth he made himself acquainted with the roads and the whole topography of the Persian Empire so that in his intended invasion he might occupy the most commanding ground and have all the advantages of situation in his favor. He who regards the map of the world with a missionary eye, who studies geography with a view of subduing all nations unto Christ, marks every vantage position with an interest which the ambitious warrior and the curious traveler never felt. We study geography for the glory of King Jesus. Whether the animal, vegetable, or mineral kingdom, whether the manners and customs or the arts and the sciences and the politics and the religions, missionaries must seek to know as much as possible to reach as many as possible. This is part and parcel of the missionary spirit, to know those to whom we minister. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, becoming all things to all men, so that by all means we might save some. And then last, how do we do missions? Leighton Wilson would tell us, do good to all men. His ministry was a, a, a life of service to those in need, the sick, the suffering, the needy, the destitute, the, the, the traveler, the sailor, the widow, the orphan. They all found refuge under the roof of Leighton and Jane Wilson. Right? Ministries of mercy were part and parcel with his mission work, caring for the body as well as the soul, whether as a doctor, showing hospitality, providing financially for the poor, or even as a mediator between warring individuals, warring tribes, warring groups, colonists and natives, uh, natives and countries like Britain and France. He worked for, he exhorted to justice among even those who did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, the fourth lesson we can learn from Leighton Wilson, a theme of which we've already heard much already, uh, missionaries and all in ministry, every Christian, you will suffer. You will suffer. Leighton writes Jane during their courtship, our lives in that country must be laborious indeed. We must be subject to many trials and deprivations, but Jane, this is food for the children of God. Later he writes, our lives may and probably will be shortened, but such is the transcendent importance of that mission that it seems to me our duty to commence it, even though there be no possibility of our living more than 10 years. Obviously, in God's providence, they lived more than 10 years. They lived a full life, but they suffered. They suffered the scorn and skepticism of their family. They suffered uh, the, all the travails of the African climate, the mosquitoes that caused malaria. They suffered the the water that led to dysentery. Uh, they had conflicts with the colonial leaders. They had conflicts with the, the, the native population. They had conflicts with the, the countries that, that owned and the, the, the you know, that, that had possession of those territories there in Africa. Uh, he writes in Western Africa that in all of his travels, he never thought it was necessary to actually arm himself. He never was in a situation where he needed to have a weapon. And yet there were times where he encountered cannibals in the inland parts of Africa. There were situations where the, the, the tension between the natives and the African-American colonists or the natives and the French armies were such that he was caught in the middle, was in danger. There was the emotional suffering of watching missionary after missionary after missionary die because of the fevers of malaria. Half of those who joined them in Africa ended up dying of illness. He suffered. And if you are called to serve the Lord, particularly overseas, you will, you must suffer. The work of missions cannot proceed without suffering and sacrifice. And why is this? Well, because we follow a suffering servant. We are united. We are priests in Jesus Christ, the priest who laid down his life as a sacrifice. And if Jesus, as Dr. Thornwell put it, if Jesus by his sacrifice purchased redemption, so we by our sacrifices must make that redemption known. Just as there are difficulties to accomplish the salvation of sinners, there are difficulties that we will, that we must encounter in spreading the salvation abroad. Dr. Thornwell again, he says, let us gird ourselves for the sacrifices. Let us follow in Jesus' tracks. We shall know them by the blood. So this is John Leighton Wilson and his wife Jane. I'm thankful that none of you in this room None of you watching online can say that he's no longer known to you or unknown to you. You know him, you've heard about him. I hope that, that you continue to get to know him 
continue to read about him and all the other 19th century missionary pioneers, both in Africa, in America, Scotland, England, all the other countries that were sending missionaries out in the 19th century. Brothers and sisters, it is incumbent upon us as the people of God today uh, that we learn and get to know the forefathers, the foremothers in the faith. Let me close with a quote by Hampton DeBose, again, uh, Wilson's biographer. He writes this, It is fitting that we study the lives and characters of these great men and women in order that we may be incited to greater activity and to more earnest consecration in the master's service. It is also due to the generations yet to come that we tell of the ardent piety the heroic deeds, the manifold toils and trials of, of these early missionaries so that they too, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, might have a strong faith in the power of the gospel to convert the world. Amen. Let's pray together. Well, Lord God, we thank you for the power of your gospel. We thank you, Lord, for those who have gone before us, who are now a part of that great cloud of witnesses who cheer us on as we fix our eyes upon Jesus and run this race with endurance. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help us, O oh Lord, to walk in, in the tracks of you, Lord Jesus, but also in the tracks of, of our fathers and mothers who have gone before us. Oh Lord, we thank you for the call that you've laid upon their lives, the call that you've laid upon our lives. We ask, O oh Lord Jesus, that you would continue to send forth men and women, boys and girls, give them a heart of, of missionary zeal. Oh Lord, we pray uh, that you would help us, O oh Lord, to love you, with all of our heart, to love you and to love the lost. We pray, O oh Father, that you would give to us a great gratitude for men like Leighton Wilson, women like Jane Wilson. Lord, we ask that you would give to us a knowledge of those who have gone before us, that we might walk in their footsteps, so we might follow their example, Lord, so that we might give you, gratitude, give you thanks and praise for what you have done in the past, what you can do now, what you will do in the future. Lord, this entire work, this entire missionary endeavor, it is all of grace. It is all of your power. Lord, that's our hope. That's our confidence. And we ask that you would continue to glorify your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, through us. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together, take our bulletins, or take our, our pamphlets, and turn to number 67. O oh God, to us show mercy. Let's sing this glorious hymn, Psalm 67, to the Lord.
Thank you so much, Pastor Cangelosi, for a wonderful address that was informative and experimental. Uh, before we stand at recess, just two brief reminders. We'll be having a Q&A in here at 345, and we strongly encourage everybody to be here, but also a second reminder that on the inside back cover, you'll find on the top of the inside page a QR code uh, for you to submit questions. And uh, we've had wonderful presentations, and we hope you'll give uh, wonderful questions so that we can help further the conversation. Thank you, everyone, and we'll hope to see you back here at 345.
we'll, I guess we'll just have conversation with the mic. Number three, number three is worth number three work. Number two. Testing, now I'm on. Are you here? Time. Email. Hello. One, two, three. One, two, three. Hello. Hello. One, two, three. Hello. Nope. There we go. There we go. Uh, I might try. One, two, three, one, two, three. Hello, hello, hello. so I can level them out. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Want to talk, testing, one, two, three. Talk to testing, normal, one, two, that's three. okay. Test, People one, two, can three. hear that. Hello, testing, okay. hello, hello. Can you hear me? One, two, three. If you can hear it, that's good. Just kind of keep it. Just keep testing, going. one, two, three. Can you hear this? Can you hello, hear this? Hello. Brad, what is that picture? <laughs> Am I ready to go? Oh, are you? Oh, right. You should be good. Around. I 
Yeah. Yeah. That. That. There it is. Okay. That's it. Uh, Thank you. That's okay. No. Good to go. Welcome, everyone. We're going to have our uh, time with our panel here. We have Pastors Hamilton, Gilbert, and Ken Gelosi. And uh, a lot of you have submitted questions online through the QR code in the back of the um, program. You still can. We'll try to get them. They should come to me on my phone. So if you have one along the way or a follow up, you can try and send that in live. I'm not sure I can get them all, but we'll try. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Van Dudewart. I serve as the pastor of uh, Covenant Community Presbyterian Church here in Taylor's, a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. I am thankful to be a graduate of Greenville Seminary, and uh, I have uh, pastored at Covenant for 16 years and also have the very great privilege of seeing what the Lord has done through the school um, even since I've graduated and Delighted to be here and talking together about the mission of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're just going to dive right into questions here. And uh, we will start with the following for Pastor Hamilton. And it is uh, this. How should or could a single woman prepare uh, to help in the mission of the church? How can they support the church in foreign countries when they are unable to teach? Pass. <laughs> I want to say, <laughs> find a good husband. Um, that's, that's a little trite. I don't mean that. Um, that, that is a, actually a very profound question. Um, and it's an important question for... Uh, congregations for sessions in particular and beyond them presbyteries to seriously engage with. I've, I've never really known, to, if, if I'm honest, this is a strange thing to say if I'm honest, but I, I've never really known how well to answer that very important question. The one thing I would say is that when uh, a woman younger or older um, believes that the Lord has called her to commit her life to the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ, she needs to pursue that conviction and that sense of call step by step with her local session and with the congregation. That, that, that's where I would begin. She needs the absolute commitment and support of the under-shepherds in the flock of Christ. Greenville uh, has of late, as you will know, been partnering with Radius International. And one of the things that has deeply, and I do mean deeply, impressed me and affected me about Radius International is its commitment to help train uh, young men and women, helping to prepare them in terms of the call that God has laid upon them for mission. So, the little I can say, I think, boils down to this, and others, I'm sure, will have more to add. Um, walk that sense of calling um, step by step with your elders in the hope that they will be godly men committed to your good before God and who will seek to shepherd you along the way, who will seek to help you navigate the, the difficulties um, think seriously about uh, Radius International uh, going for a year or perhaps two years um, 
to equip yourself and to be in an environment where the kind of ministry that you will be able to have in a way that's honoring to God and faithful to the Word of God will be helpfully set before you. Um, I, I've, I've been at the Radius campus a number of times in Tijuana. Um, I know a number, I, I know three single girls, um, two from England, one from uh, USA. At present, who are there, we, my wife and I have regular contact with them. Um, and they, they have found it profoundly helpful. That there are teaching, I mean, women can teach. There are other women to teach. There are spheres of ministry for women. Teaching is not the exclusive preserve of men. It is within the church of God. But there are women who are to teach women. And I think to be equipped for that, we, my own seminary in England, we, we have just um, approved. I had a wonderful interview with a young woman, young girl. I'm never quite sure what's the appropriate thing to say, a female. Um, uh, I know what gender she is, so that's good. Um, from Australia, who's going to come to our seminary for two years. Um, she'll, she'll do the MAR program. She won't do Hebrew, Greek, or homiletics. Um, and she wants to be equipped to serve the Lord in whatever sphere it pleases him to send her to. So I'm sure you other, other brothers have got more to add than that. Well, maybe one thing to add, and it would be perhaps stealing what Caleb's already thinking. In light of the, the concert of prayer in particular to which we were just exhorted, one powerful way that a young single woman could be involved in the work of mission is stirring up a concern for prayer, whether it be a prayer for a particular missionary in connection with them uh, to foster a deeper interest and, and heart connection to a work, that would be a glorious thing to see unfold in the local church. So that would be w one thing perhaps to add. Uh, I would echo uh, the, the sentiment that <clears throat> the role of uh, our women in the church, while not called to uh, proclaim the word of God, to, to preach, there are other opportunities to teach. And we have seen the Lord use that in the history of the church uh, I think we just heard some in, in this last session. Um, wouldn't it be interesting to hear of all that Jane did uh, in, in Africa in, in ministry? Um, so such a great opportunity there. Yeah, I was, I was going to definitely say what you both said. I mean, the Bible doesn't say women can't teach. It says women can't teach a man. And so women certainly need to be teaching other women, need to be teaching children, um, Jane, uh, as well as the, the the Italian lady, as an Italian, I appreciate uh, uh, Leighton sending that Italian uh, back to Italy. Christina Ruzzini, I, we don't know anything about her. I don't, I couldn't find anything about her, but she was teaching with the Waldensian Church. Um, I'm sure teaching children. Uh, what a great opportunity uh, to go to the mission field and uh, to bring the gospel uh, to the littlest hearts. And um, women's ministry is such a, a needed thing. Uh, counseling ministry for for ladies, particularly you think. Uh, of all the sex trafficking, of all the uh, the different um, areas where where ladies are are struggling, uh, we have a, a missionary that we supported our church who works in Ukraine with orphans. Um, she was, she is, was, and is a single lady and is connected uh, to a mission team and, and to churches there. Uh, and so, but it's it's a mercy ministry, and, and so there's lots of different opportunities uh, outside of uh, planning churches. Um, per se, and preaching uh, in, in the church setting. So I would uh, certainly want to encourage a single lady who has a heart and feels like the Lord is calling her to, to the mission field. Um, uh, it is interesting, right, just as times have changed, as we saw the ABCFM told Jane, her, her sister, we, we don't want to send single ladies at all. That's not the case, it seems, in our, our mission sending agencies today. And yet we do want to make sure that we're protecting uh, those ladies. Uh, and I think it's great to go with a team, um, I know as in the PCA, MTW, there's a, a single lady we sent to a team in Japan, and so she was not by herself. I mean, she was laboring with other uh, missionaries there. And, and so, but it was, it was difficult. There was certainly some struggle with loneliness that she, she had. And, um, and, and so, but it's a, 
uh, it's something that we w- should want to be encouraging our, our ladies uh, in, in the church, uh, whatever ways to use the gifts the Lord has, has given them. Uh, another question here for Pastor Gilbert. Um, uh, many missionaries founded hospitals. We recognize that preaching the gospel is the leading edge of missions, but what is the place of the alleviation of physical suffering in the mission of the church? Pass. Such a significant question in understanding the role of mission. I think maybe I'll speak on the the danger first. Uh, There's always been a danger, and we particularly see that climax in the late 19th century, early 20th century, of the confusion of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, the greatest commandment, so that the gospel itself and the proclamation of the gospel and the mission of the church to proclaim the gospel and to see churches planted. Uh, The work of evangelism isn't complete until there's an incorporation into the church. So that has to remain uh, the church's focus. And when the church begins to do other things, it loses sight of what her mission is. And I think that that's very dangerous. And we've seen historically the gospel be lost because of a pursuit of different priorities. However, when there has been powerful preaching, uh, the winds of reviving mercies under the blessing of God, we have always seen a connection with good works. And we should. Believers uh, with hearts swelling in love to the Lord Jesus Christ are those zealous unto good works. And therefore, we should see a connection with ministry to People in need, uh, you'll, many of you will hear, have heard phrases like this, that we preach the, the whole Christ to the whole man. We, <clears throat> while there's something worse than poverty and something worse than a, a physical ailment, and that would be spending eternity in hell, Jesus still cares for those who are impoverished and those who are in need, and therefore it, it behooves us as Christians to care about those situations. What what we don't want to do, however, is call uh, the establishment of a hospital the mission of the church, um, and then focus our attention solely on that as the mission of the church. So I think that would be maybe a helpful way to bring those ties together. May we always care about the, the needs of the people and ministering to them out of the love of Christ but let's keep our mission central and focused. Could I add one thing? One, one of my favorite texts in the whole Bible is Acts 10, verse 38. You will have heard it earlier today when Peter is evangelizing Cornelius. He begins very strikingly, you've, you've heard of Jesus of Nazareth, how he went about doing good. And while doing good does not belong to the essence of the church's mission and commission, it's not tangential to it. It's not something that's ancillary. Um, We understand that the gospel comes to people in their wholeness And the point that David's making is absolutely paramount and principial. Um, But it's very striking, you know, when, when, when you look at the history of the last 300 years, almost every, almost every alleviation of social need and deprivation was initiated by Bible believing evangelical Christians. And we should always keep that in mind. Uh, one thing I would just add that this is where I think our Presbyterian polity really comes into play. We have elders and we have deacons. And just as Jesus was a prophet mighty in word and deed, right, the church is to have a word and a deed ministry. And 
uh, Nick Wilburn and his article on the diaconate in one of the early issues of the Confessional Presbyterian. 2009. Yeah, uh, I give it to my deacons to read for officer training because he does such a good job of laying out uh, you know, the, the, the role, the work of the diacon. And one of the things he talks about is how um, you know, the diacon is not, not only to be ministering to our own people, certainly that's the focus, the, pri the primary uh, emphasis, but um, to minister to those outside the church as well. And, and so, you know, on the mission field, particularly pioneer missions, particularly, um, uh, how to say, just cultures that are uh, less developed than our own, I think there's going to be more of a need for a, a diversity of ministries uh, and, and so, but you have to be careful, like David's saying, um, but I think that's where, uh, if, what if every mission that was planted, every missionary that was sent had both a, a teaching elder, uh, you know, ruling elder and deacon, right? You know, the elder and the deacon went co together hand in hand, um, and I've not been involved in enough missions conversations to know if that actually is happening, but uh, it seems like that's where that uh, might come into play on the mission field. Uh, and then just, you mentioned Acts 10, but, you know, Acts 6 as well, the institution of the office of deacon leads to the spreading of the gospel. Um, and, and so just the way that word ministry accompanies, uh, deed ministry accompanies word ministry, not only does it uh, show forth the, the glorious heart of Christ uh, to minister body and soul, but also it frees up the uh, teachers so that uh, the word can go forth with more power. Pastor Cangelosi. Can you speak in more detail concerning the Sabbath mission concerts? Did this practice uh, find root in the churches? So as I've looked into this a little bit, uh, there was a, it, it started in Scotland, uh, but Jonathan Edwards wrote a, a book, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it was a book that he wrote uh, to, to call the churches to this concert of prayer um, and I had the word extraordinary in the title of this book. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm. Yeah. He wrote to John Erskine. Mm. Humble attempt. Yeah. yeah, humble attempt to promote explicit agreement in prayer. So, so it was um, it was started. You know, kind of the impetus was there in the 1700s, Scotland and and, and America. Uh, it seems in the 1800s, um, it was certainly something you see. If, when you read General Assembly Minutes, or when, if you read General Assembly Minutes, um, <laughs> uh, there will always be a, uh, a pastoral letter uh, and, and at the end of those minutes. And one of the things you often see is this encouragement to the churches and to the presbyteries, you know, to be faithful to the concert of prayer. So you read that, and it always makes me think, well, the reason they're having to encourage the churches to do it is because they weren't doing it. Um, and, and yet they... It, it clearly was on the, the hearts of, of the General Assemblies year after year after year. Uh, John Lowry, uh, who was the second secretary when Leighton Wilson became the third, his dad, Walt, uh, Walter Lowry, uh, was the first. And then Walter Lowry Jr. was a missionary to China who, who was murdered, uh, martyred uh, while he was serving. But, but John Lowry, um, uh, who, let me, another plug for Log College Press, we're about to Lord willing, publish the memoirs of his wife, Louisa, who dies like immediately upon them landing in India. Uh, and so be on the lookout for that book because it's an amazing, talk about missionary women. I mean, she was married, but just an amazing book. But John Lowry and his sort of collected writings on missions has an article on the concert of prayer and he talks about it. Samuel Miller has a book about the concert of prayer. So it clearly was something uh, that was, was important in the 1800s. It started, I think, the first Monday, and then eventually it moved to the first Sunday. Um, as you see from that note in the, the General Assembly, you know, they were talking about not just um, uh, praying, but, but instruction on missionaries, uh, and sort of the mission vision of the, of the church, as well as contributions toward missions. I guess that would be sort of when people would give their missions giving. Um, and so it, it, it definitely fell away at some point in the practice of the church. I don't know when. Uh, I'd love to know if it's still something in the Scottish church history or culture. No, um, sadly no. Um, but if, if you wanted stimulating reading and you had access to the Yale edition of the works of Jonathan Edwards, volume 16, I think, has a series of 
initial letters from Jonathan Edwards to John Erskine, um, William McCulloch, who were involved in the revival in 1742 in Kilsai. Um, and the letters are really stirring, moving this transatlantic concert of prayer um, that really took hold in Scotland uh, as much as it took hold in basically New England. So volume 16 of the Yale edition of um, Edward's works. So uh, the QR code uh, seems to be heating up and I'm getting all sorts of live questions like, where is Pastor Vegas? <laughs> and, um, he's, we'll and a few he's questions for me. He, he will be in the Q&A tomorrow. So we're not gonna skip your questions that come in for Pastor Vegas, just so you know, but Lord willing, we'll talk with him tomorrow. I did have a question come in for Pastor Hamilton and it does appear to arise from his lecture, but perhaps all of you could answer it to make things more exciting. Is it true that a man should be ashamed if he does not know the geography of Scotland? <laughs> C'est vrai. It is true. <laughs> no, uh, um, it's an offhand comment, but So much to say, so little time to say it. And <laughs> Scotland is a very small country on the periphery of continental Europe, but its significance historically and theologically and spiritually is way beyond the five and a half million people who live in Scotland today. Uh, Scotland's main export has been people, godly people. And I think if you want rightly to understand not just American Presbyterianism, uh, 1706, 1729, and you, you know those dates. Hopefully you know those dates. Um, but to understand the, the, the landscape of the United States, you, you really need to have a sense of the intellectual, theological influence that this little country uh, on the top of England where we always will be <laughs> um, and you know I, I say it a little casually but um, in the 18th century in the middle of the, the enlightenment or the Aufklärung the Germans called it when, when Europe was ablaze with um, intellectual ferment um, uh, the works of Immanuel Kant and all the rest of it, um, you would be hard pressed to think of more than one or two significant English contributors involved in the European Enlightenment. But Scotland had them by the droves. It was considered the intellectual powerhouse of Europe at that time, actually. Um, so, yeah, it's a little country, and it, you should know the geography, because geography, as much as psychology, influences theology. Anyone else well, like to weigh I, in on whether or not we should know the geography of well, Scotland? Well, I want to make a case to not, know, not just know geography, but to know geography plus chronology. And you heard this in Dr. Hamilton's talk. Like, if you don't know that Burns and McShane overlapped right, physically, geographically, and chronologically, like you, you're missing out um, as you read their works individually. So I, I think about when I was an intern in seminary, Ligon Duncan was the senior pastor, Derek Thomas was, the, he, he preached the evening service. So it was a, a, a rich time. But to know that those two men have overlapped, right, mean, means you understand something about their theological connectiveness. And so when you're reading history, um, I think about this a lot, reading about the American Presbyterians in the 19th century. You know, South Carolina in itself is sort of like Scotland, a small state, but incredibly outsized influence in American Presbyterianism. And so to know who was, you know, in Charleston, who was in Columbia at the same time is really, really important uh, to understand the connectiveness of, of the things that you read. And so, um, 
so know the geography, but also put the geography together with a chronology uh, so that you, you can see who's influencing whom, who are the buddies, who are the friends uh, in, in America, who's related to whom, um, because we're all related. Mississippi, you know, it's two degrees of separation, maybe it's that way in, in South Carolina. Uh, you can't talk about anybody because you're talking about their cousin. Um, and so, uh, but, but to know that, that, you know, who is pastored with whom and what presbytery uh, is just, it's, it's, it's not just fun to know, it's important to know when you're reading. Maybe, maybe just to add, <clears throat> uh, it was, a, in a sense, a joking question, but a seriousness to it. Uh, you can't read the letters of Samuel Rutherford, and if you haven't read the letters of Samuel Rutherford, you need to read them, but you can't read them um, intelligibly without having some understanding of the country. So for that reason alone, it's worth knowing. Yes, and surely the whole matter of the mission of the church is about the geography of the world, the spread of the gospel. Uh, another question uh, for Pastor Gilbert. Uh, can you explain what the reversal of Babel means? Yes. Um, that's, a, that's a huge uh, concept, but in, in simple terms, in Genesis 11, when we see the rebellion of man against God's command, uh, we'll have this repeated refrain in Genesis about filling the earth and subduing it. Uh, of course, we see that in Genesis 1. We see uh, a, a restatement of sorts uh, after the flood to Noah, and then a rebellion against God, and then not only a rebellion not to continue to fill the earth, but to, to build this city to make a name for themselves. Of course, crucial contrast with Genesis 12, where the Lord is going to take a servant to himself by his grace, Abram, and the Lord says that I will make your name great. So greatness is, is brought about by the Lord's sovereign purpose. So very significant connection there. But in, in Genesis 11, uh, we have the Lord coming down in judgment and, and confusing the language. Uh, so we have man's rebellion uh, leading to the peril of peoples as language is confused and therefore an inability to communicate the truth of God. Dr. Morales should be answering this question. Uh, I see him out there. Uh, but then when we see it in Acts chapter 2 uh, with the glorious overturning of Babel with the people hearing as the, the Spirit comes in power upon the apostles as witnesses, we see that overturning that they hear in their own language. So there's a sense of the, the power of the redemptive work of Christ and poured out and applied by the Spirit that everything that sin has ruined is being overturned. Of course, there's an already not yet concept to that. We're still longing for the fullness of it. But we see the beauty of that epochal significance that the kingdom of God has come in power, not yet in its glorified fullness, but in power. Uh, so there's an overturning of curse. And of course, in this way, we could say every miracle that Jesus has performed is eschatological. Uh, we're, we're recognizing that the, the, the things of the end are here. The kingdom of God has come and it's come in power. And we're tasting the, the fullness of of the power of King Jesus to overthrow the curse. If it were our plan, we would immediately be transitioned to glory upon conversion. Uh, but we heard last night in that wonderful exposition that the pattern of the Lord as he, we see it in Joseph's life, is suffering and then glory or humiliation and then exaltation. And that's going to be seen in the life of the church with this display of power coming, but yet in a state of humiliation until we learn obedience through what we suffer in conformity to Christ who learned obedience to what he suffered in the fullness to come. Uh, Pastor Cangelosi here. Leighton Wilson and the assembly you referenced seem to indicate that a, a lack of foreign mission activity is a plain symptom of a lack of love for Christ. Um, does this mean that our love has grown cold? Mm -hmm. 
I definitely think that if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to want the world to know about it. And you're going to want the world to know uh, the saving truth of the gospel, as David was unpacking that just a little while ago in uh, Acts 10. Um, and so, yes, where you see a church that isn't focusing any time, effort, resources, financial or otherwise, on the nations, um, there is a deficit of love for Christ um, and a deficit of love for the lost. Uh, and so I think we, we would want to challenge that church. Now, I would imagine most of our churches, it's never zero, right? There, there's, there's probably going to be some even residual missionary interest. Uh, but, but the question is, is that missionary interest and missionary zeal, has it, has it flagged or is it, is it being revived year after year, um, whether through the preaching of the word, missions festivals, concerts of prayer for missions. Um, and so I think we do want to connect the love of Christ uh, with uh, our, our zeal for missions. It's possible to have a zeal for missions without having a love for Christ, and that's probably just as harmful, um, because that, and that's probably what ends up becoming a social justice sort of missions effort. I was in the Rotary Club at both my previous calls, and we can do lots of good things around the world, but there's no love for Jesus, right? Um, and so we want to have a, uh, we want that, our love for Christ, our love for the gospel, our love for the lost uh, to be that which stimulates us to, to bring the gospel uh, to the nations, particularly, as we heard yesterday, to the unreached people groups, those who've never heard. I've always found it deeply moving that when the Lord Jesus restored Peter, he didn't say to him, you know, Peter had collapsed. And I think if you ask most Christians, why did Peter collapse so dramatically? I think the answers would be things like, well, there was a, a failure of courage. Um, he became intimidated by his circumstances. You could go on and on. But when the Lord restores him, he, he says three times, Peter, do you love me? And I think he's saying there that every sin that I commit and every failure that the church commits is ultimately traced to this place. We do not love the Savior as we ought to love the Savior. And that's why if we're preaching about uh, obedience or the need for people to go to the ends of the earth, you don't preach about them going to the ends of the earth. Well, you do, but actually you don't. You preach Jesus Christ. You preach the grace of God and His Son. You preach the glory of Him who came and laid aside all the outward insignia of His glory to be the sent one of the Father. Um, I was talking to a friend earlier. John Owen has a, a, a stunning passage, and I, I, I do mean stunning, in volume one, um, page 460 to 461, I think, um, where, where he says, you know, when, when Christians are struggling with obedience and we are called to go make disciples of all the nations, when Christians are struggling with obedience or temptation, or whatever, what do you do? It says Owen, you preach to them the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not all you're going to do, but it's actually where you're going to begin because that's where the Word of God begins. You know, there's a, there's a theological grammar to the Bible. There's a theological grammar to the gospel. And that's why, you know, in, in, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, there's one imperative verb one imperative verb in the next three chapters there are 42. The same in Romans, the first imperative verb in Romans I think is 6.11. Um, there's a theological grammar that the, the call to obedience, the, the call to self-denial, the call to give up our small ambitions and go out east and preach the gospel of Christ. If I I'm allowed to quote um, the founder of the um, Jesuit movement. Um, starts with, behold, Jesus Christ. 
And I, I know from my own heart, my manifold failures as a man, a husband, a father, a pastor, and a friend can all be traced to this. I do not love my Savior as I ought to love him. Yeah, echoing, echoing such a, a beautiful reflection, 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ controls us. And <clears throat> we see this glorious Savior who has died. We recognize his, his mercies have captivated our heart and that we live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised. And you repeatedly see, whether it be where we've mentioned Rutherford and Owen uh, as two people already, but the loveliness of Christ in Rutherford, uh, the glory of Christ in Owen. And if you continue to read, you know, one of my um, heroes of sorts is J.C. Ryle, and he, he continues talking about how the love of Christ constrains me, the love of Christ moves me, the love of Christ grips me, it, it compels me forward. That is a driving motive for the believer. So I think it can be traced to this issue. Well, I think about if we love something, we want other people to love it with us. We're like, man, you got to watch this video. You got to listen to this song. You got to, you know, read this book. And so if we're not wanting other people to love Jesus with us, then what does that say about our love for him? Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Yes. Well, there's a few questions that have come in on a, on a similar theme, and I'll, I'm going to read two of them and just open it up to all of you. Um, Help me understand double predestination in its relation to missions. And then another one is, I've heard the emotional appeal to evangelize the lost. That a Calvinist position is that those who go to damnation are receiving God's justice. How should the church properly handle the tension between these two views or ideas? I guess we're saving the easy questions to the end. Would you repeat the second of the two questions? I've heard the emotional appeal to evangelize the lost, yet a Calvinist position is that those who go to damnation are receiving God's justice. How should the church properly handle the tension between these two? So there's, of course, great mystery in, in the decree of God there's our understanding, there's his, his revelation, but I think our focus and tied to the theme that we were just talking about, the love of Christ, there should be a prevailing motive in the soul of the love of Christ to sinners, recognizing that as we proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are this aroma of Christ that Dr. Hamilton mentioned earlier, that that aroma will necessarily bring about others who smell its sweetness and some who reject it as the smell of death. That underneath the gospel preaching, uh, the Lord is softening hearts and hardening hearts. And our, our responsibility as ministers of the gospel, as the church, is to proclaim the word and let the word under the power of the spirit do its work. So we, we're, we're gripped by this love of the Lord in the proclamation of the gospel. And yet we do recognize that those who remain obstinate to the gospel will die in their sin under the judgment of God. But that's a, a thing that we leave to the Lord and, and our our call is the means he's appointed to see his people gathered, and which is to proclaim Christ. And I'm sure there are many things that could be said in addition to that. Yeah, there are very many things. Um, <clears throat> the Westminster Confession of Faith is very wise in the way it speaks about predestination. Um, election to salvation is gracious, divine grace. Uh, reprobation is judicial. They're not symmetrical, they're asymmetrical. 
the confession is very clear about that, and that's simply reflecting the polarity. You know, we're, we're, our first calling is not to preach, I don't think, synthetically. We're, we're to preach the word. Um, we're, we're to preach the word as we find it. Now, we need to preach the word wisely, uh, coherently, uh, systematically. But, you know, I, I, I think sometimes, you know, people, I've, I've heard folk uh, preach in John 3.16. It's a precious text to me. I was converted through it. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And they spend the bulk of the time telling you what the world isn't. And I sit there bewildered. Um, tell me about the love of God. Uh, don't, don't try and show me that you're a, uh, a five-point Calvinist, which is a nonsense statement anyway, if you, if you rightly understand the history of the, of the phrase. Was the word you used um, emotional? Was that? That's not God making his appeal through us. We beseech you, be reconciled to God. Benjamin Warfield says in that text, it's as if Paul is standing on the street corner of Corinth, and yet he's writing to a church. Um, I think we, we at times try too hard to um, smooth out the polarities of Holy Scripture rather than let the text speak to us of the incomprehensibility of God whose ways are past finding out. So when Paul comes to the end of his exposition of the gospel in all its magnificence, and especially 9 through 11, although I think he's going back, he, how does he end? Oh, the depths. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable. Paul is saying, I'm out of my depth. Brothers, this is as far as I can go. Don't don't ask me to um, tie up all the loose ends. It's, it's beyond me. Oh, the depth. And that's why preaching should always leave our people marveling at God, not at our capacity to tie up all the loose ends. I avoid, I avoid people who've got answers for everything especially within the Reformed tradition, because, because they've got God in a box. You can't put God in a box. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Preach the text as you find it. Preach the polarities. I just want to say, I, um, I grew up in an Arminian home and church and came to Reformed theology later in life, and so I wrestled with this question of, how do we preach the gospel if predestination is true, if, you know, um, if God has passed by some and has chosen others? And, and the, the simplicity of the text is one of the things that has been my, that has been, has most helped me. I'm thinking particularly of Matthew 11, where Jesus clearly declares that the Father has hidden some things and has revealed some things. And then in the very next breath, he's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So the, clearly Jesus didn't have a problem holding together, um, you know, double predestination and the free offer of the gospel. Uh, and then Matt, or Romans, you know, 9, the clearest statement of Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, in the very next chapter, uh, Paul is, is speaking of the, the necessity of the offer of the gospel. How will they believe in whom they have not heard? So. Yeah, and uh, Ephesians chapter 1, of course, the, the text that often grips us and we get excited about, and I also was in an Arminian home and didn't to embrace um, biblical teaching until later, but Ephesians 1 has always struck me, just had the students at Greenfield that I'm teaching look at this text to try to outline it, how would you preach this, and I asked them the question, what is the mood of this text? It is not polemics, <clears throat> it is exaltation to the praise of the glory of his grace, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of the glory of his grace. It's an overwhelming awe and captivation with God's great plan. And that ought to be the way we approach the issue.
Uh, new question. Uh, someone who's relatively new to American Presbyterianism. Could you give me some recommendations? I think the, tech, the question says book recommendations on reading more on Presbyterian missions. Maybe each of you could give, you, give a top book. Where would you start to learn more about Presbyterian missions? I'll start first so I can hurry up and get mine in. Uh, <laughs> David Calhoun's uh, two-volume Banner of Truth publication on Princeton Seminary would be the wonderful place, I think, to start uh, where you have I exposure to so much history, but also that ideal of Princeton, the goal to see, you know, these men go out to the field and there are sections in there where there's this long list of men who went out to the mission field, something 33%, I think with, we've heard repeatedly, a third of the men. So that would be the place, I think, to start. Uh, there's also a book William Childs Robinson uh, wrote, I think it was his doctoral dissertation on Columbia Theological Seminary and the Southern Presbyterian Church, and he has a large section in there uh, about missions, and you can find that book on the Bald College Press website uh, under the William Childs Robinson page. Um, I, I think there are, there are a lot of missionary biographies uh, that are out there, um, and I, I, mean, I mentioned one this morning that, uh, that's not just missionary, but uh, the Henry Alexander White, Southern Presbyterian Leaders, really walks through uh, the, um, just going all the way back to the beginning. I mean, South Carolina Presbyterianism was, was very, very early, uh, you know, pre-colonial, um, and so you, you get a good sort of overview of Southern Presbyterianism from Henry, Henry Alexander White, which you can also find on the Log College Press website, you know, free PDF. More modern book, uh, you know, Hart and Meather's book, uh, Seeking a Better Country, does a great job of taking you through American Presbyterian history. Uh, and, and so you'll, you'll get um, some of the, the missions uh, emphasis there as well. Did I mention a couple? I was going to mention the Hart and Luther one. Um, the Life of Charles Hodge by A.A. A. Hodge. Um, Charles Hodge was the dominant theological, biblical figure probably throughout the 19th century in America. And reading his life, you get a sense of what Presbyterianism at its best is, and Princeton is unsettlingly Catholic-spirited in its Presbyterianism. They were divine right Presbyterians, but they were profoundly Catholic-spirited. Um, if you've got the time, reading General Assembly minutes can be a little wearisome. I did postgraduate research on it, and oh, um, but in 1863, I think, um, Hodge makes an address to the General Assembly, and Bishop McElwain is in the assembly, uh, the Episcopal Bishop of, I can't remember, might be Philadelphia, and Hodge, the spirit, and this is what we, we, we must never lose sight of, that Presbyterianism has a DNA that should influence its polity. It did for the Princetonians. And that's why, along with that, I would recommend reading Archibald Alexander's Thoughts on Religious Experience, because Presbyterianism is first and foremost not about polity. Go, just think about that. It's not first about polity. And you think, well, what is it about? Read Archibald Alexander and Charles Hodge and find out. I could tell you, but I'd have to shoot you. <laughs> but I wouldn't have to shoot. And I read another question here. A question for all of the gentlemen. What would you all suppose, is the reason for the difference in proportion of missionaries graduating from seminaries in the 1800s compared to now? 
How do you hope to encourage more men to go? What can the church do? Why more missionaries in the previous century than now? Uh, I think that I, I mentioned this the first in my first address to you in Acts 10, and I just was quoting a comment that Chad Vegas made about the love of our comfort more than Christ. And I think that as we increasingly get comfortable, that there's a, a captivation with the world. Uh, and I think it, it might be really that simple, uh, a, a worldliness. There's a, a loss that's faced in among 19th century and previous centuries uh, a faith, not that it <clears throat> minimizes the sorrow, but facing death, facing disease, facing trouble that is so outside the realm of our experience right now. So I think that that's a huge obstacle in the present. I think if the 19th century Presbyterians were here, though, they would challenge the premise of the question in the sense that they would say, our, our century didn't do a very good job of sending people either. Um, but we do have to remember that that century... Uh, I saw in the in the the bag we got handed um, was the the inquiry. Uh, help me out here. Um, William Carey's uh, little little sermon that he wrote, you know, inquiry of bringing the gospel to the nations, right? And so this century, nineteenth century, was very much uh, the missionary movement was just starting, um, and there was a zeal, there was a, an excitement. Um, you know, every uh, nation was unreached in a sense, right? All, all the non-Western nations, there was a lot of newness. Uh, and so there was, it maybe it was a little bit easier. Uh, obviously, Chad encouraged us with the 3,100 unreached language groups and people groups that are still out there. Uh, that kind of, kind of goes along with what David is saying about how things have changed in, in our own uh, uh, reluctance and, and slowness. But um, I do think that probably played a role, even though it was a lot harder to go forth as a missionary, you know, back then there was greater, greater challenges. But I'm encouraged uh, when I see, um, I'm just thinking about the PCA, I mean, it seems like there's, I'm sure we could send more missionaries, uh, but it seems like there is, there are a lot of folks who are, are going out now, um, are seminaries perhaps loosening their uh, emphasis, lessening their emphasis upon it, perhaps, uh, it seems like Greenville's not, thankful for that, but um, it, it, that's, so that's part of the second part of the question of if we've got to continue to put this before young men uh, who are wanting to be uh, pastors say, go plant churches across over, overseas. I think it's not a coincidence that the high watermark <clears throat> of Presbyterians in Scotland and America sending uh, men uh, to the ends of the earth coincided with the increasing infection, beginning with Germany, of higher criticism. When the higher critical, liberal, rationalistic, unbelieving scholarship began to take root in seminaries, in Scotland, mission all but died. And the Free Church of Scotland that Charles Hodge said was the purest church in Christendom in 1843 when 474 ministers left the Church of Scotland to form the Church of Scotland Free. Within 30 years was more liberal than the Church of Scotland that left. One of the Achilles heels in Presbyterianism is one of its strengths. We believe in an educated ministry. But from the middle decades of the 19th century, the Presbyterians wanted to show that they were upsides, the scholarship coming in from Germany, whether it was higher criticism in the Old Testament, the Redaxionis Geschichte in the New Testament, or a historical criticism of history. They wanted to show that they were people to be reckoned with. And we were far too conscious of looking over our shoulders, wanting uh, the approval of the academy. And when that happens, concern for the kingdom of God, the glory of Jesus Christ, the salvation of the lost begins to die. Liberalism is simply one of Satan's devices 
to kill the mission that the Lord Jesus Christ has entrusted to his church. And that's why we have to be vigilant. I don't mean we're not to be, we, we, we shouldn't seek to be academically excellent. Of course we should. But if we have a choice between, you know, uh, we were looking in, in my seminary, you know, an Old Testament professor, someone who has excellent Hebrew, you, 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 you need that, and it's theologically aware. If you've got two candidates, who are you going to choose? Choose the one, perhaps, who will most win the approval of the academy because of their brilliance, or someone who is able, but maybe not quite as able, but who is godly, and who has a passion for Jesus Christ. And I think there's an absolute connection between the death of foreign missions in Scotland and the embracing of higher critical German rationalism in the church. Perhaps we have time for one more, and this will be a sort of a conflation of a few that have come in. We started by with a question from perhaps a young woman, how um, she might think about how she could participate in the mission of the church. I also have a number of questions from some men, young men. I'll, I'll read some excerpts. I've sensed a call to go to the mission field for quite some time. I've received confirmation in this. I'm currently studying at seminary, but I can only study part-time as I provide for my family. And the basis, basic question is, how do I know when to go? What is the balance of worldly provision and wholehearted decision to follow Christ and participate in the mission of God to glorify his son in every nation, tribe, and tongue? Or uh, another one, William Burns was a holy man. How can I, as a young man, pursue that holiness in the pursuit of, mi of this mission? Perhaps maybe a word from each of you to encourage anyone here who on account of this um, conference may be praying about uh, serving Christ in this way. As we think about this glorious call to serve, <clears throat> I mean, the, the first thing I had was to, to quote Dr. Hamilton about a reformed feeling. How do you know when to go? Um, we, we, we do recognize the, the impression upon the soul that's very significant, and we should take it seriously, uh, of the burden in the soul. The, the danger, of course, would be to do that as an individualist without connection to the church. So the question of when to go is, is weighed with godly, faithful elders who are helping you work through uh, the when, when are you ready? Um, there's a sense in which you're never ready. Um, but you want to have the support of men encouraging you to the field and knowing that you're not just doing this on your own. So be one response. In terms of the, the holiness, what a convicting thing it is to even consider that, that, you know, that is the holiest man alive. Um, we all feel the lack of holiness that we possess, and I think increasingly so, so the older that we get. Uh, but the, the way to pursue holiness, not to bring all things back to the love of Christ, but I think it does come back to the love of Christ. The way to pursue holiness is to cultivate a deeper love for Jesus. And how do you do that? You spend your time more with, with Christ in prayer, communing with him, reading those who direct you to the, to the love of Christ. Uh, and who better to do that than, again, men I've already mentioned, uh, whether it be Rutherford or, or Owen or Calvin himself and, or Augustine even uh, stirring you up in, with the love of Christ. That's the path to holiness and not regimenting yourself with rules. It's a captivation with Jesus that will grip the soul and lead to holiness. I would just add the importance of missionary biographies um, and, and particularly men like David Brainerd uh, mentioned the memoir remains of Robert Murray McShane. Um, that'll both push us to holiness 
but I think it also for someone who's seeking to discern, am I called to the gospel ministry, am I called to ministry as a missionary in a foreign field? Um, reading of missionaries in foreign fields will either s- stir you uh, and, and cause the, the, the flame of that desire to increase or uh, the Lord will use it to lead you, you know, away from that. And so I think um, that would just be one practical uh, tip. The, the question about um, worldly provision, I maybe understood, misunderstood it, but uh, I think if you make a choice to be a foreign missionary, like you're not signing up for great wealth and riches. So don't let that keep you from um, from going now, right? I mean, obviously, if it's a question of, uh, you know, I'm not finished seminary yet, that's that's another issue. But uh, but if you're trying to, you know, like a, the young man wants to save up enough money to get married, it's like, well, you're going to be poor after you get married anyway. Just go ahead and get married. Um, uh, you know, so, so just you're going to be raising support as a missionary. You know, whatever agency is going to be sending you probably has some budget that's sort of put upon you. You're not just out there raising whatever you want to raise. So I would just encourage you, um, if, 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 there, if the church is confirming, if your session, your elders are confirming we believe you're called to ministry. If you're getting that feedback, um, that confirmation from uh, the congregation, uh, then don't let um, your financial situation hold you back. Let me just say something in a word. I make a plea for family worship. You think, well, what's that got to do with this? Well, it's got everything to do with it. I think if when the Lord calls someone to give themselves heart and soul, body and soul, um, to the work of his kingdom, um, preparing them to go into pastoral ministry or gospel ministry to the ends of the earth. Uh, And that person is married with a family, young children. Nothing is more vital than embedding your family life in meaningful, consistent, thoughtful, relevant, Uh, godly, ordinary family worship, allowing the Lord through his word to shape the mindset of the family, Uh, and especially preparing wives uh, and children to realize that he is worthy of our best, and of our utmost, understanding that there will be a cost to that. But I do think family worship is not just where you tick boxes, you know, we, we, we do family worship. It's where outside the Lord's day, the Lord takes his truth and molds it and shapes it and styles it into a family unit. And that developing mindset is what prepares us familially, covenantally, corporately um, for whatever the Lord is going to call us to. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming to participate. I've been asked to let you know that dinner is at 5, so just a few minutes. And we're going to return thanks to the Lord for all his kind provisions, and then we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we are humbled to be reminded of the truths of your word. We remember that we were lost in sins and trespasses, and that you, by your grace and mercy, found us. That you brought to us the preaching of the gospel of a Savior who is Christ the Lord, who died and rose again for us, and who is now ascended and at your right hand, O Father, in his name we come to you. We pray again that as we consider the mission of your church, that we with new love to you, for your love first to us, would consider your call on our lives that we might use the time you have given us to offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices. Lord, we pray for those who ask questions about that particular call, and we pray that you would make it clear to them. Lord, for all of us, we pray that you would increase our zeal for this mission, that your name would be glorified in all the earth. Lord, we thank you that you 
give us now a time of fellowship, we pray that you would help us to spur each other on to love and good works as we receive your gifts of food and drink and that the energy you provide for us, we would offer again back to you. And Lord, we pray as sinners in Jesus' name, amen.
You were meant for something higher and better than this. You were placed here to train for eternity.
Well, if you could please grab your seats, we'll begin our evening session. I just have a couple housekeeping items before our evening session begins. Just like to remind you that we do have nursery available in the children's area. And uh, there's a, also a training room for those kids who you want to have listening to the preaching, but they maybe have some wiggles that they need to work out, need a place where they can make a little bit more noise, but you parents can still enjoy and listen to the preaching. There's a training room just right on the other side of this wall. So please use those if that's a help to you. I received a couple questions about recordings throughout the conference, and you can find our recordings on our YouTube page, so please go on YouTube, type in Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary, and you'll find the recordings there. Our men's fellowship will meet after this evening session at Boda's on South Pleasantburg Drive, so if you'd be interested in some fellowship after this event for the men, please join us at Boda's. And then lastly, just something I'd like to bring to your attention, over the past year we've been working on a new website, and just this past week we've launched it. So you can go to gpts.edu to check out some of the work we've been doing to communicate the vision of the seminary. Don't check it now on your phones. In fact, please silent your phone, silence your phones or turn them off. But we do have a video that we'd like to show you this evening that highlights the sacred calling of gospel ministry, and we hope it will be a blessing to you. for a moment of what you were sent into the world for. Not merely to work and sleep and laugh and talk and enjoy yourself. No, you were meant for something higher and better than this. You were placed here to train for eternity. Resist the devil when he whispers that it is impossible. Try and the Lord God of the promises will give you strength in the trying. He loves to meet those who struggle to come to him, and he will meet you and give you the power that you feel you need. Difficulties which seem like mountains shall melt away like snow in spring. Obstacles which seem like giants in the mist of distance shall dwindle into nothing when you fairly face them. If men believed the promises more, they would never be afraid of the duties. The line in the way which you fear shall prove to be chain. Remember the significance of the work. The lost sheep must be gathered from the east to the west and the north and the south. But when the inquiry is made, who will go for us? We do not hear a sufficient number promptly saying, Here am I, send me. We are bound to serve Christ with the very best faculties and attainments that we possess or can possibly acquire. He who does not lay a good foundation in the beginning will never be likely to supply the deficiency afterward. Do not say that you can pursue an adequate course of study without the expense of many sacrifices. The service of God daily calls for labor and sacrifice. Dear brother, let us remember that the time of our exertion will soon be over. The day of reckoning will soon come. Care only for the things of Christ and nothing for your own things. If you make it your first and great business to seek the kingdom of God, all other things shall be added unto you. To study and prepare, to pray and seek the Lord's help, to be used as an instrument in his hand as a minister of the gospel. This is undoubtedly the most important and glorious work about which the minds of men can be occupied. It is a sacred calling. This has eternal significance. The implantation of spiritual life in a soul which is dead in sin is an event the consequences of which will never end. What may you and others of like character affect for the building up of the waste places of Zion?
We enter into session seven of our conference together. It's a great joy for me to, he doesn't need an introduction, but to welcome shortly to our pulpit, uh, Dr. Jonathan Master, our beloved president at Greenville Seminary. He's married to Elizabeth, they have two daughters. His most recent book is Reformed Theology, which we heartily commend to you. Uh, Jonathan uh, has been a blessing, a uh, respected friend. And among the many things I could say, I'll just say this, that uh, Jonathan's presence at Greenville Seminary is proof that God is able to answer prayer abundantly beyond what we can ask or think. We're so thankful and know that you'll be blessed by his ministry tonight. Well, let us uh, take our booklets and stand and sing together Psalm 119X, Psalm 119X. great and glorious and blessed God, our gracious Heavenly Father, be merciful to us and bless us, cause your face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on the earth and your salvation among the nations. Send your spirit, O Father, and cause us to glory in your Son. May Jesus Christ be preeminent in all things. Bless our time in your word. Bless your servant Jonathan as he preaches. May your servant, O oh God, do a great work among us, that even years later we might still rejoice in the spiritual harvest reaped from these days. Lord, we long to hear of conversions of pastors and missionaries raised up by the power of your spirit through your word. And so help us and be with us tonight, we pray, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And now we will turn to our second hymn while a collection is taken tonight. That'll be selection 59, I Sing the Mighty Power of God.
Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, I'll be reading the first three verses of that chapter. Acts 13, 1 through 3. Remember, as I read this text and as you follow along in your Bibles and listen carefully, this is the word of God. Acts 13, 1 through 3. Now, there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Let's pray once more. Father, we would ask you that tonight you would give us open ears to hear your word, that our hearts would be soft and responsive. We know that your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It is the sword of your spirit. And we ask you tonight to wield that sword By your spirit in our midst, we need to be convicted of our sin. We need to have our path illumined. We need to be trained up and thoroughly equipped for every good work. All these things that your word does for us. So, Father, we, we plead with you now that you might attend the reading and the preaching of your word with great power from on high. And in so doing we would ask that you would especially glorify your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in Christ's name that we ask these things. Amen. The Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments, is full of uh, commands and of declarations from God. These, These almost mission statements that God gives to his people. And we could enumerate any, uh, a, l- a large number of these kinds of things. Uh, we could even start in the garden where God gives this command to Adam. Adam, you have every tree for food, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Or we could move a little further into the history of Israel as God's people and see these kinds of statements that serve almost as as, as mission statements for the people, as these, as these governing words to guide everything else. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. When we come to the New Testament, we see much the same thing. And in fact, there's one particular charter, one particular mission statement that we have had mentioned to us throughout this conference, and rightly so, and that's the Great Commission that Jesus gives to his disciples recorded for us in Matthew 28. You remember Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And one of the features of all of these, all of these key commands for God's people is that they are preceded, undergirded by God's own provision, by God's own blessing. In other words, when we go back to the garden, God doesn't say to Adam, Adam, you need to stay away from this one tree and not eat from it. And if you do that for a a few years, maybe I'll give you a few more to eat for food. No, no, that's not at all how it's presented. I've given you everything here. and, And here's the command, in the midst of my provision. The Shema is the same way. The Lord has just rehearsed for the people what he has done in redeeming them. And it's in that context. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And the Great Commission, in fact, is is hemmed in, is is bookended uh, with these kinds of statements of provision. Because before saying, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he, at, he ends with this great promise. Behold, I am with you always 
to the end of the age. There is a command, there is a mission statement, but it is undergirded, it is bookended by God's abundant provision. And that's important to note because, of course, that's one of the features that is rehearsed about who God is. God is a giver. God is a, a God who blesses. God is a God who provides for his people. God is not commanding something in the absence of any provision. No, he's provided abundantly. You see this same kind of sequence play out in the commands that were given later on in the New Testament. So, for instance, at the beginning of 2 Peter, Peter says he's given you everything you need for life and godliness and the knowledge of his son. Therefore, add to your faith godliness, etc. And this is again and again the pattern that we see. It's, it, it's describing for us something of who God is. Now that book-ended provision in the Great Commission is amplified even further when you get to the book of Acts. Because when we get to the book of Acts, we see recorded for us in Acts 1.8, Jesus' words to his disciples, to whom he has given this commission, and it's a promise. And this has been recited as well throughout the week. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth. The Lord is promising that this work will be done when he pours out his spirit on his people. What a great provision that the Lord gives. He's not giving commands without also reminding us of his blessing, reminding us of all that he's provided for us, reminding us of his promises. Now, as the book of Acts progresses, and you know this from your reading of the book of Acts, the Lord fulfills this promise in Acts 1.8 in a remarkable way. It begins in Jerusalem. We see the Spirit poured out and Christ begins to, to build up his church and to cause the gospel to go forth in ever-expanding circles, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. We see many challenges in the midst of this. We see the challenge of hypocrisy within the church recorded for us in Acts 5, and the Lord judges those. There's the challenge of disunity when we see these Hellenist widows and the Hebrew widows at odds with one another because at least there has been a report that the Hellenist widows are being ignored in the distribution of food, and, and this is addressed by the institution of deacons who are ordained to contribute to these physical needs and build up the unity of Christ's church and perhaps most importantly allow the apostles to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And right after that, there is a key phrase that Luke introduces into the book of Acts and it's, it goes something like this in Acts 6, and the word of God continued to increase. And so we see this promise that God made being fulfilled. We see it being fulfilled in the stoning of Stephen with Saul of Tarsus watching and helping. And then in Acts 8, we have recorded for us what is called a great persecution of the church. And here's how Luke records it. There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And then a little later on, he records for us, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. The word of God continues to move forward. And there is this remarkable section after the great persecution where we see three conversion narratives. And one of them has been uh, masterfully opened up for us in Acts chapter 10. But there are really three major conversion narratives. You see the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember how that happens. An angel appears to Philip and tells him to go to a, a certain road, the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. And, and, and in a series of miraculous circumstances, this, uh, this deacon, Philip, is standing in front of the Ethiopian eunuch 
And the Ethiopian eunuch, of all things, is reading Isaiah 53. Imagine sitting down on, a, on your next flight and the person sitting next to you is reading Isaiah 53. And, and he says to you, I, I, I'm not sure I understand this. Who, who is this describing? That's what happens to Philip. It's a, it's a miraculous thing. And then you see, of course, this vision that we've had explained to us. Peter's vision and an appearance of an angel to Cornelius. Again, another miraculous way in which God works supernaturally to bring the gospel to Gentiles, in this case Cornelius and his family and those whom he gathers. And then sandwiched in between those two, the Cornelius conversion and the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, we have this, uh, this uh, account of the conversion of, of Saul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, this great Jewish teacher who was instrumental in the great persecution of the church. And once again, God dramatically converts him by having the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ appear to him directly and speak to him. And all of this underscores something that Acts 1.8 makes clear and that the Great Commission makes clear, which is that there is... There's no spot, no, no type of person, no, no area that is off limits to the work of the Holy Spirit. And there was a time in my life where I uh, worked in, uh, in Israel, and at that time there were some uprisings there, and so we'd get these reports every now and then, th this is an area that you're not supposed to go to. You, you don't go into this neighborhood, don't go into this city, don't travel down this road. They were called no-go zones. And, 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 and we could look at these first chapters of Acts and say what Luke is telling us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is there's no such thing as a no-go zone for, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, this is reinforcing what we see in the Great Commission. All authority, I will be with you always. And then we come to the end of Acts 12. And we read this same phrase that we read after the institution of the diaconate. In Acts 12, 24, we have this significant phrase, but the word of God increased and magnified. The Lord had, in a series of miraculous interventions, made it clear that this was a gospel for all the nations. And even for the most hardened sinner, within the Pharisaic community of the Jewish people. Now, every commentary that I'm familiar with sees a break between that account, that series of accounts that takes us through Acts 12 and Acts 13. A number of reasons why this break is observed. Uh, among them, what I just read to you that that phrase, the word of God increased and multiplied, is a, is a phrase that appears at various pivotal moments. But, but there's something else here. We begin to see the gospel now spread primarily into the Gentile world. But it also happens a bit differently than what we've seen in these first 12 chapters. In these first 12 chapters, God has intervened to demonstrate certain things about the spread of the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he's, he's still doing that in Acts 13, but in, there is a sense in which he is moving from doing it in these extraordinary ways, angels appearing, people being transported to evangelistic situations, Saul having Jesus himself appear before him, that kind of thing. And now what we see, beginning in Acts chapter 13, is the pattern of the spreading of the gospel by means of the church of Jesus Christ. Acts 13 begins really a, a new period in the history of the church. It represents, here in this little paragraph, these three verses, the first record that we have of an organized effort by the church 
to fulfill the Great Commission. And to see that great promise that Jesus gave, both in the Great Commission and in Acts 1, fulfilled to all nations, including the Gentiles. And because it is the first recorded instance of an organized effort towards what we would think of as missions, it serves as a, as a kind of template for what global missions is supposed to be like. This is a kind of model for us. It's intended by the Holy Spirit as a kind of model for us of how missions is supposed to work. It's a bit like the templates we have earlier in the book of Acts. We see in Acts 2, after the outpouring of the Spirit in Jerusalem, in Peter's sermon, we see that Luke records for us what these early Christians were doing. We, they were devoting oursel- themselves to the writings of the apostles and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And we see that and we say, that's a model for us. Or we've mentioned already the ordination of deacons, which we rightly see as a template that the church is to follow for all the same kinds of reasons that these deacons were first instituted. A little bit later on in the book, we'll see Paul appoint elders, and that constitutes the, constitutes the particularization of various congregations. And now we have to add to that list in Acts 13. The church sends missionaries. We see that here in Acts 13. This is one of the patterns of Acts to which we must conform today. That's how it's intended by God. Now, what's striking about this, first of all, and really this is the focus of the three verses, is that this missionary sending enterprise this organized effort at fulfilling Christ's great commission is a, a work of the church. Now, that's, that seems obvious, but I think in the time in which we live, it has to be said over and over again. This isn't something that was outsourced. This isn't something that was avoided. This was something that the church here recorded for us, the church in Antioch, recognized, was precisely part of her mission given by the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we see here is a model of how the church is supposed to be doing this. So what do we see about this church? What does Luke record for us about this church? Well, first, the first thing we note is that this church was an established church. Now, I say church, and oftentimes what immediately pops into our mind is a single congregation. And it's possible that what, that's what we're dealing with here, but it's probably unlikely. It's probably a, a description of a kind of regional church with several congregations, what we might call today a presbytery. But regardless, whether this is an individual congregation or whether it is something more like a regional church or a presbytery, the fact of the matter is Luke makes it very clear that it is an established church. We actually get this in the language used in verse 1. In our English translation, I'm reading from the ESV, it just says there were in the church at Antioch. But there's an emphatic participle that's used here in verse 1. So if we were to translate it woodenly, it would almost be something like at Antioch in the existing church, dot, dot, dot. It's as if What Luke is trying to uh, remind us of is that this is an established church. You'll remember, of course, it's in Acts 11 in Antioch that the word Christian is first used. And here Luke wants to remind us, wants to uh, make it clear to us that this is a work of the church of Jesus Christ. But it's more than just the grammar that he uses. He makes it clear that this church actually had uh, officers, this church had what he calls prophets and teachers. Now we need to pause and spend a little time on this because this is an unusual kind of title. The first thing to note about this is it's not describing two offices. It appears to be describing one office, these prophet teachers, as Luke would have it. Now, it is possible 
because we know that the Lord did uh, give some the gift of prophecy in this apostolic era. It is possible that these prophet teachers were something like the prophets of the Old Testament, giving direct revelation from God. But I think that's unlikely as well. In fact, I don't think that's what Acts is describing. That's what Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is describing. I think, in fact, what's being described here is the fact that these are men who are teachers. That's their role. And what they are teaching is the prophecy of God. And so Luke refers to them in, in that way. These are prophets and teachers. That is to say, these are men who are proclaiming. But what are they proclaiming? Well, they're proclaiming the word of God. It's, it's, it's similar to the way in which we see this used elsewhere. Paul uses this term uh, similarly in Thessalonians. And, and, and we see it used elsewhere by Peter. I think what's happening is they are, they are proclaiming, they are teaching that more sure word, the prophecy of of scripture, as Peter says. And what a gift this is to the church, to the church at Antioch and to the church today. These are men who are ordained and who are teaching, and what they're teaching is, is God's inspired word. They have the authority of Christ as ministers of the word of God. How do they do this? Well, we know from other accounts in Acts, how they did this. We know from Paul's description of his own ministry, the pattern that he followed uh, week by week, proclaiming God's word from house to house, opening the word of God. This is, this is the great work that the leaders in Christ's church, both then and now, were given to do. And why is it such a great work? Well, it's such a great work because, of course, this prophecy of Scripture, this more sure word, the Bible, has great power. It's what God uses to build his church. It's what God uses to train us. It's what God uses to convict us of our sin. It's sufficient for all the needs that we have, for the spiritual questions that we ask. It's sufficient for teaching. It's sufficient for our instruction. It's sufficient in giving us the, the regular food and drink that we need as Christians. This is why Paul, when he is writing his final letter to Timothy, and he describes to Timothy all the difficulties that will come in the future. He says, but you, Timothy, you need to continue in the things that you've learned. He talks about the sacred writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation. And then Paul says, all scriptures, God-breathed and profitable. And then he says to Timothy in a pointed way, Timothy, because all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable, what you need to do is you need to preach the word. And that's what these men were doing in the church at Antioch. It's another indication of the fact that this is an established church by God, a functioning and a healthy church. But we should also notice, because the text gives attention to this, the makeup of these gospel ministers, these teaching elders, these prophet teachers. He gives us a list of these men, and he begins first with Barnabas. Now, Barnabas is probably listed first because he may well have been the oldest of these teachers. Whether or not he was, strictly speaking, the oldest, he was no doubt the most experienced of all of them. Uh, we first read about Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. We read that he sold a piece of land and gave it to the apostles that they might use it for the work of the church. In fact, Barnabas, of course, as you know, is not the name that was on his birth certificate. His name was Joseph, but he was called Barnabas by the apostles and other believers because of it means son of encouragement. And that's what Barnabas was. That's how he functioned within the church. We know that he was from the tribe of Levi, but he was originally from Cyprus. He would have been part of the Jewish diaspora. Uh, we know that he was greatly used by God in the life of Saul. He, he, he took Saul under his wing and introduced him 
to the church and, and vouched for him. Barnabas was a great and experienced man of God, a great teacher of the early church. Now, what about this next man, Simeon, who was called Niger? Now, we know less about him. In fact, his name is fairly common, which is probably one of the reasons why it says was called Niger. The fact that he was called Niger, this just means black. It probably refers to the color of his skin or perhaps something about his national origin. We, we can't say for sure, but in any case, it's a reminder that there was something about him that was striking, that, 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 that was remarkable, that was notable, perhaps likely with his appearance. And yet, this was no barrier to serve in leadership in the early church, in this church at Antioch. In fact, he's mentioned right along this great man, right alongside this great man, Barnabas, as one of the ministers of the church at Antioch. We know little about him, but he's recorded for us in Scripture, no doubt was mightily used by God. The third man who's listed is Lucius of Cyrene. Now again, we don't know too much about Lucius. We know it's a Roman name, so his background and culture probably would have been Roman. A little bit different, of course, than Barnabas's. We also know from Acts 11 that the church in Antioch began because there were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, who went to Antioch and began preaching the gospel to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. And we don't know that Lucius was among those first proclaimers of the gospel in Antioch, but it's likely that he was. He certainly would have been affiliated with that group uh, in some way. So Lucius of Cyrene. The fourth man mentioned, of course, <clears throat> is Menaean, a lifelong friend, the text tells us, of Herod the, tex the Tetrarch. Now his name is a Greek form of a Hebrew name, so again, somewhat conjectural, but I think we're standing on fairly solid ground by saying he's probably a Hellenistic Jew. But the most significant detail about him is not so much his ethnic origin, but rather his lifelong friendship, it says, with Herod the Tetrarch. Now, you can get a little mixed up with your Herods in the Gospels and Acts. This is the Herod Antipas, who, who, who killed John the Baptist. Th this is the Herod Antipas who had a peripheral role, but nonetheless a significant role in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And, and from a cultural perspective, of course, Herod the Tetrarch would have been from the very highest levels of society. He, he was a great ruler in his day. And here's Menaean. And he's known Herod his whole life. They grew up together. Which tells us something about his own social standing. No doubt he must have been of a similar uh, social class as that wicked king Herod. Isn't it striking to think about the two divergent paths of these men? They grew up together, they still knew each other, and God, in his grace, chose Menaean and transformed him, equipped him, made him a leader in the church at Antioch. And Herod the Tetrarch, what guilt, what blood is on his hands, killing John the Baptist. It's interesting, too, because there's no hint in the text that this put him in a special place in this company of pastors. He had a, a respected place because he was one of these prophet teachers. But there's no sense in which because he grew up with Herod, because he was of a high and noble birth, very likely, that that gave him any special standing, any additional credibility, any, any greater measure of respect in the church of Jesus Christ. He was a sinner 
saved by grace. Uh, uh, as Paul says, uh, uh, a servant of the word of God. And then finally, we come to Saul. Saul is mentioned here. Uh, this man who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a persecutor of the church, had been present at the stoning of Stephen and, and gloriously, miraculously, astonishingly saved by God. So let's just pause on these names in verse 1 for a moment. What a remarkably diverse group of men who served together. These men came from all walks of life, all backgrounds, Jew and Gentile, and they were given leadership in the church of Jesus Christ, together given leadership in the church of Jesus Christ. It, it, it's, a, it's a little window into what the Holy Spirit has already been showing us in the book of Acts. All authority, all nations, and it's, and it's on display in these teachers at the church at Antioch. You know, there's a lesson here for us, even if we never serve in leadership in Christ's church. You cannot say that because of your birth or your upbringing, bringing your background that you are beyond the scope of Jesus authority you can't say that about yourself you can't say that about others and, and when it comes to yourself you can't assume that Christ would not have you serve his church look at these men it's hard to imagine any other circumstance in which they would have even eaten a meal together in the ancient world. And yet they're not only eating a meal together, they're coming to the Lord's table together, they're serving together, they're preaching and teaching together, they're leading the church. Now it's not just that attention is given to the leadership of this church in Antioch. We're also told what this church was about what its priorities were. And if we were to put it simply based on verse 2 and what is described for us in this verse, we could say this is a, this is a church that was characterized by worshiping the Lord and seeking after him earnestly. Now we've already seen this pattern with Peter and Cornelius. Y y you remember that? That Cornelius is, is praying and the Lord listens and, and miraculously brings him this angelic visitation. And, 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 and Peter is meditating and, and, and the Lord works in his life and teaches him what he needs to know. This is a church, though, that recognized that their primary obligation was to worship their creator. This is the point of life. Everyone was created to give honor to God. That's, that's what God is due from all of his creatures. We're creatures. He's our creator. In him we live and move and have our being. And, and, and this is particularly what should mark the church of Jesus Christ. You probably know this, but when John Calvin was asked to write an explanation for the Reformation, why is it that the Reformation was necessary? On the necessity of the Reformation. He, he, he says that it really comes down to two things. A, a knowledge first of the mode in which God is duly worshipped. And then secondly, the source from which salvation is to be obtained. The right worship of God was what this church in Antioch was giving itself to. Now, this is the, uh, one of those dividing lines throughout the scriptures. 
It's what first divided Cain and Abel. It's what divides those later sons of Seth from all the other sons of men. It's what divides the northern kingdom from the southern kingdom and the believing people of God from the nations around them. It's it's why the Lord had to strike down Nadab and Abihu and say that no, no one should even mourn their death because they didn't, they didn't pay attention to his commands when it comes to worship. It's why Joshua commands the people, or pleads with them to remove the idols from their tents because he says, God is a, is a jealous God. You have to worship him alone. And that's what this church is doing. Just a week ago, I heard from someone who has just finished some training for church planting. And they were told in the process of this training, uh, when you have a core group of people, believers gathered around, uh, don't uh, wait as long as you can. Put off for as long as you can the public worship of God. And they, they were told, they were told, because the minute you start worshiping, you'll stop growing. You'll, you'll stop being zealous about the gospel of Jesus. Sure, this is what they were told. Well, this is precisely the opposite of the biblical pattern. What was this church in Antioch devoting itself to? They were devoting themselves, it says, to worshiping the Lord. And then, of course, he goes further and says they were devoting themselves to fasting. This is important. We see this throughout the book of Acts. But, you know, I think one way to understand this, to, to grasp why it was that they were fasting... Uh, uh, ignoring and doing without things that were lawful and good and even necessary, like food, it's because what we see is that this church was, was earnestly seeking after the Lord and seeking after His will. This was the role of fasting in the early church, seeking the Lord earnestly, exclusively, doggedly pursuing what God would have them to do in obedience to His will. Commands. They had the command of God. They had the great commission. They understood Christ's promises. And they are, they are intent on determining how they as a church would carry out those commands. You know, there is this wonderful promise that we're given in the scriptures. I think someone mentioned it this week. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. You know that that's, that's Levitical language. That's a command that's repeated over and over again in the Levitical laws. The, the priests at certain times are to draw near. And, and the people at certain times are to draw near. And, 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 and you know what the writer to Hebrews says. Draw near to the throne of grace that you might find grace to help in your time of need. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you and that's precisely what this church is doing. Now, we need to stop at this point. This is a template. This is a model. This is meant to be our example, instructive for us today. And so we have to ask ourselves, a few questions. Is this the focus in your life? Is this the focus in your church? Would it be said of your church? Would it be said of you? That there is a priority given to the right worship of God. And that there is a, an earnest seeking after God. Remember, this is... The first instance recorded that we have of an organized effort for churches to send out missionaries fulfilling the Great Commission. And yet it begins with prioritizing the public worship of God. 
and prioritizing prayer. Are you coming to the throne of grace to seek God's help, not only in your own life individually, but does your intercession regularly include, include the needs of the world and the fulfillment of the very clear command that Jesus Christ has given? Are you actively seeking Him in this matter, even at the expense of other good things, to see how He might use you and your family and your church for this great end? We have to assume, because He begins by speaking of their pastors, we have to assume that these Pastors, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Menaean, Saul, must have been teaching them well. And so that's another question we could ask ourselves, particularly if you're in a position of leadership, if you're a pastor or an elder. Does your teaching of God's word press home the, the truths of scripture about these great priorities such that it it, it guides those under your care to earnestly seek after God's will in the matter of missions. Now look at the result of this prioritizing of worship and this seeking after the Lord earnestly. While they were worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The result of all this is that God, by his spirit, set apart two of this team of teachers. And, and not just any two. Set apart Barnabas, the most experienced man there. The, the, one, the one who no doubt had great gifts from the Lord, was a man that was eminently useful, known as a son of encouragement, the last person you'd want to have leave. The, the, the most valuable in this church at Antioch from a human perspective, and they send him off. And then they send off Saul. Now, now, Saul at this point was no novice, although he may have been the least experienced of all the men listed. Saul had spent three years in Arabia at this point, And perhaps, we don't know precisely, the chronology is difficult to pin down, perhaps a dozen or so years in Asia Minor at Tarsus, and then two years at Antioch. Saul, make no mistake, all of these men, but Saul in particular, even though he was the least experienced, had a long record of training. He had put in his years to prepare for this work. And so they send their most experienced man and probably their most promising, the most glorious convert in the church at Antioch. They did not. They did not send people who were unprepared or untrained. They did not send people who had no role here and so they could be, we could afford to send them over there. They, they didn't send people who they wanted to shuffle off to some insignificant location or insignificant vocation. They really did send their very best under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now there are several applications here for us. The most obvious one is the one that I just remarked on. They sent, they sent their best. They didn't send the leftovers. Typically when we evaluate men and particularly men who have served in the church, we have this implicit attitude. We, we, we probably wouldn't want to say it out loud. But it's something like, because he's so gifted, he needs to stay here. 
And, and if he moves, he, he should just move to a, a, a bigger church. But that's not what happened with Barnabas and Saul. Oh, I wonder what the church at Antioch would think if they saw how we view men, how we view ourselves today. Sent out the very best. But there, there's a second application. And again, I've mentioned this as well, but they, they did not send out men who were unready for this task. We've heard it already this week. One of the significant problems, which, mark my words, will have disastrous consequences for generations to come, is there are men being sent out by the church whom we would not put in a pulpit here, whom we would not trust with our family's spiritual care, men who are untrained, who are unqualified, who lack the requisite pastoral gifts, who haven't put in the time necessary to train for this great work. Well, the church at Antioch, of course, did nothing like that. Of course, men must be open to go. J.W. Alexander, one of those 19th century men who has largely been forgotten, addressed uh, seminary students, really, or recent graduates, candidates for the sacred office. And he said, candidates for the sacred office are much too accustomed to think thus, I will prepare myself to serve God as a preacher in my native land. And if I should be especially moved and loudly called, I may become a foreign missionary. And he says this, here there is altogether an error, and an error so great that we need not be surprised to find him who harbors it as really unfitted for the ministry at home as he supposes himself to be for the ministry abroad. And he goes on to say this, every candidate for this momentous work, that is the work of a gospel minister, should consider himself dedicated to Christ without reserve or exception. In other words, you're, you're not saying, well, I'll, I'll serve Christ under these conditions, within these parameters. He goes on to list a number of things that can distract a man from this kind of calling, from this kind of commitment. Some of them good things. But every candidate should consider himself dedicated to Christ without reserve or exception. We also note in verse 3 that these men were ordained by this task by the church. We see this already in verse 1. It's the elders of the church who laid hands on them and sent them off. This is a spiritual work. It's not done by any para-church organization. The fulfillment of the Great Commission in the way that the Bible tells us to fulfill it is a work done by the church of Jesus Christ. There's one more thing to notice within this paragraph, and it is perhaps the most important thing. We see what they prioritized. We see the kind of leadership they had. But this is the most important thing. It's really woven throughout each of these three verses. This work, this work of missions, of men sent by the church, ordained by the church, trained, valuable men sent out, is a supernatural work. It is a work of God from beginning to end. The description in these verses does give us God's method for missions. But it, it, it's not simply methodology. It's really theology. Notice in verse 1, the teachers, what are they proclaiming? Well, it's explicit. They're proclaiming the word of God, the prophecy. 
It's God's word that gives us the command to go. It's God's word that gives us the promise that as we go, Christ will be with us, that you will be my witnesses. In verse 2, they're worshiping the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is at work in their midst. This is not a natural thing. This is not a human invention. It's not something that's happening horizontally. It's God at work calling some of them to missions. In verse 3, the setting apart is in the church of Jesus Christ. Men who have spiritual authority lay hands on others in the midst of fasting and prayer. That's why if you look at verse 4 and and a summary of what we see in verse 3, it says they were being sent out by the Holy Spirit because this is a work of God from beginning to end. If we go on in the chapter, we see that they understood that it was a spiritual calling, that missions wasn't simply about orchestrating the right methods. It was about God being at work through his church to send out good men, godly men, faithful men, trained men. In verse 5, it says they're proclaiming the word of God. They just did what they were doing in Antioch, but now they were doing it to those who had never heard the name of Christ. And if you Look at how their encounter unfolds when they land on Cyprus. It was a magician, a bearer of false satanic power who opposed them. It was as if the question of the church's role in sending out missionaries was being put to the test by this opposing power. And notice what happens in verse 12. When the proconsul in Cyprus believed, remarkably believed as they proclaimed Christ, preached the word. It says in verse 12, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. If we get everything right in our understanding of the methodology of missions, and and we forget that this is ultimately a work of God, a supernatural work of God, then we really miss what this text is teaching us. We are unashamed, totally convinced supernaturalists. And we have to remember that when it comes to missions. These are men who had a real knowledge of the true and living God. And a real commitment because they had a true knowledge of the living God to obeying his word without exceptions. Now, because of that, I want to say this as as clearly as I can as a minister of the gospel. Could this be said of you? I mean, do you have a real knowledge of the true and living God? Do you see your life and and your commitments and your obedience as something that is dependent on the work of God and and it's based upon a God whom you know in and through Jesus Christ? could Could you say with Saul, who is later in this chapter referred to as Paul, I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What we are seeing in this description of the church sending out missionaries is a description of people who were genuinely transformed because they had come to know God through Jesus Christ. Diverse backgrounds, diverse experiences, very little in common, humanly speaking, but all under the authority of God, transformed by His Spirit. They banked their lives 
on the reality of Christ's death and resurrection. They banked their lives on the fact that he would, as he had promised when he ascended, return in glory one day. If you're, if you're not a Christian, if you don't know this God for yourself in a saving way, then when we're speaking about missions, I want to plead with you to, to flee to Christ in repentance and faith today. That, that's, the, that, that's the only way. There's, there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. He gave himself as a ransom for us all. Jesus Christ offers himself to sinners. Whoever will come to me, I will not cast out and I will raise him up on the last day. Be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Don't live another day apart from this knowledge of God. The knowledge of God that transformed these men and fueled their pouring out of their lives in service to the gospel. And if you are a Christian, if, you, if you're someone who, who, who knows something of this, who, who understands that these things are, are supernatural things, you know God, then, then if you do, consider his commands and his promises in this regard. quote that I've used before in other settings I think is appropriate at this point because it so infuses what we have recorded for us. David Wells talked about the view within the church of God. And he says, it is this God, this God on the pages of scripture, this God whom they know, who has changed them. He says, this God Majestic and holy in his being has disappeared from the modern evangelical world. He has been replaced in many quarters by a God who is slick and slack, whose moral purposes turn out to be avuncular advice that we can disregard or negotiate as we see fit. We want to be fulfilled, not filled. We're interested in satisfaction not a holy dissatisfaction with all that is wrong and with all those who are lost. He goes on to say, God rests lightly upon us. And I would submit that nowhere in our contemporary church context does this light view of God, this Implicit anti-supernaturalism show itself more clearly than in the area of missions. It's why we think that power is centered in, in other agencies rather than in the church. It's why we have this idea that resources or the lack of resources are our greatest obstacle. It's why we will devote ourselves to almost anything other than worship and seeking the Lord in prayer. It's why we assume that what God is asking of men who go is somehow lower or different. It's as if when you get on a plane, the biblical qualifications somehow have changed. Ultimately, it's why we don't consider ourselves to be ones who might be sent. God rests lightly upon us. You know how powerful this God is? This God who's revealed to us in these three verses and then in the remainder of the book of Acts as the church sends out missionaries and they, they appoint elders and plant churches. The gospel went to Cyprus in Acts 13 then to Pisidian Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Macedonia, to places like Galatia and Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, eventually to Rome. And 
it, it would have been unimaginable to these men, even these great men of God. But the gospel of Jesus Christ didn't just reach Rome. It reached places like Greenville, South Carolina, the, the ends of the earth. The template for fulfilling Christ's commission ultimately rests on the work of God. He's given us clarity. And we need to trust his power and his sovereignty. It's a work of God through the church of Jesus Christ. And this is why when we stand in heaven and and we stand in heaven with men like Barnabas and Simeon and Lucius and Menaean and Saul and all the many, many souls who were brought to saving faith through the bold proclamation of these men and others like them. And, and, and you know, we ourselves are beneficiaries of that bold proclamation. And so when we stand in heaven with these men. And we see people from every tribe and tongue and nation gathered together, worshiping Jesus. We'll have to say, to God be the glory. Hallelujah, what a savior. That this God who's given us such clear commands has accompanied those commands with provision and promises and the power of his Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for your word. We need its instruction and its clear teaching. Please let it sink deeply in our hearts as we consider our own lives and our own churches. May you be honored in our midst. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. going to stand and sing, I sing the mighty power of God. Oh, it's, that would have been a good one. <laughs> I wish we were singing that, but we've sung it already, haven't we? Well... The church is one foundation, brothers and sisters. Let's lift our voice.
recommend the Lord bless you, and we'll see you tomorrow for our next session in the morning.